Hello, good morning. And welcome to the second day of our conference. I hope you had a very nice um, conference day yesterday with inspiring conversations and inspiring talks, maybe workshops as well. And hopefully you had a nice um, evening. I heard many groups were meeting. We also had a um, very competitive um, pub quiz. <laughs> that was fun. The EXA and MFN team came second. Yes, <laughs> we were not that bad. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and first of all, I would like to um, hand over to Silke for some um, administrative stuff and um, some remarks on how to behave in these rooms. <laughs> Thank you. So good morning, everybody. So again, some kind reminders, no drinking and no food in all lecture halls. Please just drink and eat in the designated um, areas here in the building um, and uh, adhere to the rules. Thanks so much. And um, also, again, I would like to remind you um, to sign out uh, in the excursions if you are not planning to come. We have posters down in the foyer where you can cross out your names uh, and please be so kind to do so if you won't be able to come so that other people can fill in your place. And uh, I think that's it for me. If you haven't brought your um, presentation by now to the registration, please take it with you to the room where your talk is going to take place and hand it over to the room support. And otherwise, I think uh, I'm fine with all my administrative <laughs> reminders and would like to hand over to Dorte, who comes to a bit more exciting news. Okay, so um, I have the pleasure now um, to announce uh, Julia Fritzner from the WHO Hub, and um, she will talk about a bit what the WHO Hub is and um, what they are doing. So. Yeah, thanks so much, Dorte, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, so, yes, I'm from the World Health Organization, from the Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, which is now started to be built here in Berlin. It's an HQ, so from the WHO Geneva site, an HQ satellite thinking about public health uh, and pandemic and epidemic intelligence. What that means is that we, we try to manage health threats through collaborative intelligence so that we actually do the things a bit more modern and new, which actually is obviously comes out of the pandemic this time and before. And we don't want to look back as we did everything before, but move forward. And it's bringing, it's trying to use access to data, bringing information better together, using multidisciplinary sources so that it is not always coming from the old traditional one, but that we join more sources and hence get more information out of it, which means that we really want to build tools and give access to more information that will then result in better decisions. And also there, we need to sort of make the linkage more to those that need these insights so that we don't only use data and, and insight for academic purposes, but actually that we link to it. And there we address citizen science as well, because first of all, we think that there's a lot of data and information out there that we can learn and gain from you. There are a lot of tools that are built with citizen science that we can also use and amplify. And <clears throat> Also, the decisions that need to be taken, we think, come out of citizens, and hence, we really want to engage, we want to learn from you, and we want to be here and welcome everybody as in that sense, and hopefully start a journey together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, and now I have a very exciting announcement to make. Maybe you have heard of it. Um, the Citizen Science Global Partnership has become a legal entity um, recently. And um, we have the chair of the Citizen Science Global Partnership with us uh, today. And um, 
I'm very excited that this has um, become reality now because that means for the citizen science community that we now have an entity to act on a global level, which is very important. Um, and I'm very happy for EXA as well to have this partner now that um, I hope we can collaborate with a lot in the next coming months and years. And I would like to hand over to the chair, Martin Brocklehurst, now to tell us a bit more about the plans and the future of the Citizen Science Global Partnership. Uh, thank you, Dorte. Um, 2017, uh, Professor, jo uh, Professor Johannes Vogel stood in the UN Science Policy Business Forum in Nairobi, Kenya, to announce the coming together of the regional associations to work together at global level. Um, since that date, we've worked long and hard to establish the Global Citizen Science Partnership um, as a new entity in its own right uh, that will have legal status within the UN family. Um, the new organization was established on the 3rd of October. The new board was voted in. Um, it seeks to promote and advance citizen science for a sustainable world at the global level. And never has it been more important. Stockholm Plus 50, that was held recently uh, to celebrate UNEP's birthday, um, illustrated why we need a new approach to implementing global agreements. Um, the, many of the multilateral agreements that have been put in place have not delivered. So we need to find new ways to encourage them to be able to deliver. And that's what the Citizen Science Global Partnership is seeking to do with the support of the six regional citizen science associations, all listed on the bottom here. So this is the Australian Citizen Science Association, the European Citizen Science Association, CSA from America, the RECAP or the Ibero-American Network, the Participatory Science, Citizen Science Asia, and Citizen Science Africa, who are at the core of the new organization. We're going to be hosted at the International Institute for, the Applied, for Applied Systems Thinking, or IASA, uh, on the outskirts of Vienna. Um, we are supported in communications by the University of Zurich. And we have our founding partners, who are the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, or Boku, and the University of Geneva. Our launch was supported by three UN agencies, UNESCO, UNICEF, and the United Nations Environment Programme, um, including the Science Policy Business Forum. So now the work begins, or continues from what we've already started, to seek to embed citizen science into global agreements. It's, they're not there yet. Um, we have to make, we've made a good start, however, on a couple of agreements. The Aarhus Convention now incorporates citizen science. The UNESCO Open Science Agreement now incorporates citizen science. So the next target is to get citizen science embedded into UNEP multilateral agreements. We're looking forward to welcoming new business members, uh, new members from NGO organizations, and individual members who want to work with us. Above all, we're looking for volunteers who want to come and join our teams uh, to, as we put in place our international programs. And we are looking to encourage the very best of the regional citizen science programs onto the global stage. We're working with UNEP to develop a global citizen science portal on what's known as the World Environment Situation Room. We're working with the Global Environmental Outlook, or GO7, to build citizen science data into their global assessments of the health of the planet. So if you want to help, um, contact either myself, Rosie Mondardino from Communications, or Dilek Frazel, who is the new director of the organizer, acting director of the organization. And so I'm going to look forward over the next three years to working with the regional associations, my vice chair, Libby Hepburn, who is also in the audience. Libby, put, if you want to stand up, and there's Libby and there's Rosie. There are two other people who are helping. Um, and if you want to volunteer to embed citizen science into global agreements, come and talk to us. We need everybody's help to make this work. Thank you very much.
thanks Martin. That was uh, indeed an exciting announcement and I hope many of you are going to follow Martin's call and are going to support this newly, um, newly started endeavor and um, support citizen science on a global level. And talking of a global level, um, EXA and MFN is really proud that Peter Elias uh, is joining us today as keynote speaker. And uh, he's going to broaden our perspective to give insights into citizen science in the global south. So Peter is, has come all the way from Lagos and um, has a long way here uh, to Berlin. He is senior lecturer at the Department of Geography and team lead of the Lagos Urban Studies Group at the University of Lagos. He's also the co-chair of uh, CODATA WDS, the task group um, and West African coordinator of the Citizen Science Association in Africa. And his interest focus on urbanization, environment and sustainability in, in citizen science data, in particular in Africa. And I'm really happy uh, to hand over to you, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Africa particularly our new baby, the Student Science Africa Association, which was inaugurated November last year. Unfortunately, our interim chair could not make it here to Berlin, but he sent his warm greetings. Um, talking uh, specifically on Africa, of course, I know that what I'm going to talk about has applications to other uh, uh, parts of the Global South. So the topic I've uh, chosen to talk about is citizen science approaches for advancing planetary health in Africa. Uh, for my presentation, I have these uh, seven segments. First is uh, some key messages in the introduction that I will delve into citizen science in Africa. What are the motivations, the growth, as well as practices? And then I'll be talking about planetary health challenges in Africa. And I'll move on to talk about citizen science approaches and planetary health in Africa. And I'll draw some lessons from those approaches and enumerate some challenges and conclude with some suggestions. A uh, large population of Africans depends mainly on the provisioning services of fast degrading and delicate biodiversity for lives and uh, livelihoods. And uh, currently, Africa region remains the fastest growing region and um, still the least urbanized, with an estimated 4.4 billion by 2,100 and uh, with a very small environmental footprint. It therefore becomes imperative to embrace sustainable approaches to addressing planetary challenges. One issue that is confronting us in Africa, and I think most of the global south, is data apartheid, which is leading to poor decision making and unsustainable approaches for addressing planetary health challenges. Citizen scientists have been recognized as key uh, players in a wide range of ecological projects especially because of their contributions, which have enabled scientists to collect large amounts of data at a minimal cost. Since as a methodology have been promoted for interdisciplinary research, which is an area that have uh, developed uh, capacity in the last couple of years, and this helps to uh, foster collective reflections. Therefore, my talk this morning will be focusing on citizen approaches for advancing planetary health with respect to safeguarding biodiversity and ecosystem health for improved lives and livelihoods in Africa. So, what is the history of sea science in Africa in terms of its growth, motivation, and practices? When I joined Code Data about uh, three or four years ago, I was saddled with the responsibility of mapping the landscape of sea science across Africa. That was in uh, uh, early 2020. 
So I got an intern who, through online surveys, conducted an inventory of uh, citizen science that helped us to understand the, its growth and the motivation as well as practices across Africa. Uh, but the question is, why citizen science data? Across Africa and many other re uh, regions in the global south, data are housed at the national statistical offices. Whether you are talking about censuses, surveys, or vital statistics. And these are usually supported from uh, data coming from different ministries, dependent on agencies. And of course, uh, we also uh, have data coming from international uh, partners like the World Bank, the uh, United Nations organizations, ILO, and the rest of them. But the challenge with all this type of data is the fact that they are highly aggregated at the national levels. So they mask the realities on ground in terms of uh, small areas, marginal groups, and uh, places. And that's why increasingly we recognize the importance of non-traditional sources, including earth observations, commercial data, spatial data infrastructure, and official sensor uh, networks. And more importantly, the citizen science generated data, which include big data, social media uh, data, and other uh, sources. And that has been an area that has attracted my attention and interest, trying to um, work with community groups to generate city-level data, data that capture uh, issues, challenges of marginal groups, marginal places, and uh, uh, to talk about the social and economic uh, conditions. In the literature, we have typologies of citizen science uh, approaches, which, as you can see on the screen, a number of authors have proposed some uh, 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 ways by which citizen science can be conducted. And I try to look at these various approaches that have been suggested by these authors and map areas or the aspect where African citizen science uh, projects have been playing active role. For example, uh, as you can see, uh, from the work of Simo and Regalado, in 2014, they identified four, approach, or four approaches, crowdsourcing, distributed intelligence, participatory science, extreme science, uh, citizen science. And of these four, African science, uh, uh, citizen science approaches can be uh, found in the participatory science as well as the uh, extreme science. Uh, I mean, extreme, extreme citizen science. For in the works of Wiggins and Croston, who identify five approaches, uh, and I, I need to say from my experience and perspective, African citizen science approaches uh, uh, can be found in all these five uh, areas. Uh, in 2009, Bonnie and, and others identified three approaches, contributory citizen science, collaboratory citizen science, and creative citizen science, and uh, from a perspective, African citizen science can be located within the collaborative and co-created uh, approaches. And um, uh, Frances Gray, 2009, also listed three approaches, volunteer computing, volunteer thinking, and participation sensing. Again, uh, African citizen science approaches can be found to be uh, predominant in the area of participatory uh, sensing. Uh, Dito, uh, Copa et al, who also listed three. Now, um, in our survey in 2020 to 2021, we're able to reach out to over 100 citizen science projects across Africa. Of course, because of the pandemic, it was pretty difficult for us to uh, capture uh, a number of these projects. So, uh, the survey revealed the growth pattern in terms of the year these citizen science uh, projects were established. You will notice that we have very, uh, very uh, uh, unsteady kind of uh, growth in terms of the number of registered citizen science projects. And of course, those that are uh, 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 recorded high numbers may have been triggered by a number of either global or national or local factors. 
I also want to point attention to the fact that in 2019, we had a very high number of uh, established CSIN CS projects. But of course, from 2020, which is the year of the pandemic, that uh, 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 increase declined. And I'm sure in the last two years, if we have record, it's uh, maybe the, the, the situation is just uh, changing because of the fact that we are moving away from the pandemic. And uh, in terms of uh, sub-regional analysis, uh, our survey showed that West Africa, of course that's where I come from, uh, has the highest number, uh, followed by Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. Uh, the list is a uh, number of projects came from Central Africa. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't get any projects from the Horn of Africa uh, for, I don't know, <laughs> We uh, tried all the, all the uh, means we could, but none uh, was uh, registered in a survey from the Northern Africa. Now, what are the common tools that citizen science in Africa adopt in their uh, practices? So we have the primary tools to include smartphone, computer, sensors, data visualization, guidebooks, and test kit. Why the secondary tools used include audio, visual, and also material, GPS devices, field map, uh, paper maps, GIS software, open street map, tracking and monitoring tools, and their web-based web uh, platform. As for the motivation for their projects, uh, the three key motivations include improving public enlightenment, promoting research, and enhancing policy implementation. While the other purposes include empowerment of citizens in marginal com communities, provision of palliatives, improving biodiversity and livelihoods, and developing the observatory and the uh, uh, critical uh, skills. So now to the issue of the theme of this year's ESA conference, which is Planetary Health Challenges. I now want to talk on that with respect to Africa. What are the drivers of the changes we have in the environment in Africa. Three main factors have been identified, which is, uh, include rapid population growth, land use change, and climate change. There are other additional factors which have also been alluded to contributing to the uh, changes we have in the, in the environment. Poverty, inequality, and poor governance, which embraces challenges around finance, technical skills and uh, managerial skills. Uh, the chart to my left shows us the top African countries by population. Of course, my country, <laughs> Nigeria, tops the list with over 200 million inhabitants as of 2020. And uh, let me also remark that the last time we conducted a census in Nigeria was in 20, 2006. That's about 14 years ago. So what you're having is actually estimated, and that means that it can be more, like some uh, statistics have shown, and you can see for other countries. What this tells you is that, just like I mentioned in the earlier remarks, Africa is uh, moving towards a huge uh, a, a population uh, concentration. And of course, with this comes the various issues of uh, poverty, inequality, and the, how this, all of this affects uh, land degradation and uh, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, uh, natural habitat fragmentation, and the rest of them. And of course, in terms of cities, of, uh, 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 we also have the, the list of top African cities. Again, my home city topped the list with over 15 million uh, inhabitants. Of course, again, this is an estimate. Some statistics tell us that we have over 20 million people in, uh, in Lagos. Another th point of attention for me is the fact that we also have two other cities in Nigeria, Kano in the north and Ibadan in the south, meaning that Nigeria indeed um, is going to be the epicenter of population explosion in the coming decades. Uh, in terms of land use change, um, we can see the Okay, the, the chart here, the, the dark shows the, uh, the, the rate of change, why the gray is the uh, 
average for three years. And again, you can see that um, it, it shows the fact that the various human activities are intensifying the loss, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, they are, they are intensifying the rapid uh, changes we're having in our um, environment. And some of the drivers that have been identified include agricultural intensification, because most agricultural activities are moving away from subsistence to commodity crops, which will entail a large uh, expanse of uh, land area. There's also the challenge of uh, transboundary land acquisitions by international um, uh, organizations who are interested in farming, and of course, uh, climate change. Uh, talking about climate change, uh, which is a major issue for us in Africa, we are having serious cases of extreme weather events, including droughts and uh, uh, flooding. Uh, as you can see from uh, this uh, picture, this is um, Zambia to my upper side and Zimbabwe. In between the two countries, we have this lake which has been experiencing uh, uh, you know, decline in, in size over the years. We also have a similar case in um, my own state, I mean, my whole country, where you have Lake Chad, which have been shrinking over the years. And this particular lake also serves three countries, Nigeria, and, uh, uh, Chad, and uh, Cameroon. And most of the habitat of these areas depend on this water resource for their livelihoods, including farming, fishing, irrigation, and the rest of that. And of course, when this natural resource is uh, shrinking in size and disappearing, it means the livelihoods of these uh, populations will be highly affected. And of course, this um, is a uh, flood uh, uh, record showing number of uh, uh, losses in terms of human population uh, uh, in, in, uh, across Africa. Just yesterday, I was uh, following a report from Nigeria showing that um, we have been witnessing serious uh, flood around the northeastern part of the country with loss of lives, uh, farmlands, houses, and of course, that has created a lot of stress for the, the people and the government. In, uh, across Africa, we have a number of practices that are threatening biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, you can see here, one major uh, practice is wood harvesting, which of course is due to lack of uh, uh, access to um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, sustainable energy, because the people depend on uh, uh, wood, which sometimes they transform into charcoal to power their houses and uh, uh, other uh, uh, energy uh, uh, needs. We also have um, the encroachment, I mean, the, the dumping of waste, rather, on wetlands. As you can see, this animal waste near a, an abattoir. Abattoir is a place where they um, slaughter cows for um, preparation from the commercial uh, consumption. So this, the waste from that process is usually dumped on wetland. And you can imagine this uh, decomposing and, of course, uh, percolating to the soil or being uh, washed into the water bodies and the various uh, complex implications for human health and environment. And, of course, we also have um, dredging activities. Uh, I met a UNEP official yesterday talking about their interest in sand mining and dredging and all that. That is happening in different parts of Africa, particularly in, in uh, the coastal areas where uh, we have shortage of land and you need more land to be able to, uh, uh, for construction activities. So when you are undertaking dredging or sand mining, it, it involves land clearing, removal of vegetation, and, and so on, as of course, disturbance of, uh, of the soil and uh, uh, habitat fragmentation, and of course, the closer impact on uh, uh, flora and fauna. Here is a road construction amidst 
a, a, a very dense vegetation, which means you, uh, all these areas have lost its original uh, vegetation due to human activities. All these have uh, serious implications for biodiversity and ecosystem services across uh, Africa. I like this chart by UNEP, which is a simplified interaction between climate change, ecosystem degradation, and disaster and risk. And the, the, the most um, uh, at risk group are the vulnerable communities and the, place and the people who uh, bear the greatest uh, impact or brunt of uh, the changes in the uh, uh, environmental system uh, due to uh, climate change increases, the frequency and intensity of climate related disasters, and uh, of course, exacerbating ecosystem degradation. And uh, all of this, like I mentioned, has impact on the lives of the populations, the population in these areas, as well as their livelihood system, which depend uh, heavily on natural uh, systems. So, uh, having given that uh, picture, of the planning health challenge in Africa, what are the various things and approaches that are con currently being conducted to address some of these challenges? Um, I, I, I try to zero in on three themes, rapid population growth and urbanization, land use change, deforestation, desertification and land degradation, and climate change, and to see some of the activities of the city science in responding to these various uh, challenges. For our population growth and urbanization, which of course uh, put pressure on available resources, since science uh, groups are conducting community profiling and mapping, trying to understand urban nature, basic service and service gap, and of course recording disaster events and uh, vulnerability in the various communities. We have an example of uh, such organizations as Africa for SDGs, Map Kibera, Federation of Storm and Human Settlements in different cities across. Uh, the global south. In terms of uh, uh, land use change, we have activities such as biodiversity identification, recording and monitoring, landscape analysis and mapping, investigating ecological systems, creating new garden uh, practices, education of actors and actions, promoting alternative livelihood systems, and of course, health monitoring and education. And I've listed uh, a number of uh, 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 projects in Af across Africa that are involved in all of this. I want to uh, underline the uh, steel science in Uganda. Uh, I have colleagues here who are working in that space and uh, have a number of programs such as ATRAP, which is working on uh, 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 detecting systematics among uh, 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 the population and also educating them on how to uh, handle such health challenge. Of course, we have a number of other uh, citizen science projects across Africa addressing land use change issues, deforestation, uh, desertification, and land degradation. For climate change, uh, citizen science respond in a number of ways, including understanding the impacts, either in terms of losses or damages, vulnerability, resilience action plan, climate action advocacy, clean and affordable energy campaigns, and I've listed a number of uh, uh, projects here. I was involved in a project by the Sustainable Cities uh, Learning and Learning Centre, where we brought together a group of people called, who called and go by the name uh, Climate Warriors. I'm going to show you a picture of some of their activities, how they are using their in, in, in ingenious uh, ways within their communities to address uh, the impact of climate change in their uh, neighbourhood. Here are some of the activities. The, the picture to my left is where this group, uh, in conjunction with the Lagos State, uh, uh, Lagos State Pass and Gardens uh, Agency, are conducting rigorous tree planting to address a uh, biodiversity challenge in, uh, in their communities. We also have, to my right, they bring together fishermen and train them on sustainable fishing practices. Um, again, uh, here is one solution they are deploying to solving sanitation challenge. We have a lot of uh, 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 waste materials being harvested from different sources, from poultry, green waste, wood waste, 
fruit and kitchen waste, green waste, coconut waste, all that. And through aer aerobic composting, they produce uh, uh, compost manure, which they now use to improve their uh, farming uh, practices, which is very, very uh, uh, creative uh, approach. We also have a, a huge uh, waste uh, burning across uh, Lagos. These uh, people also transform, uh, collect this waste and use them as a medium for growing mushroom. In, in, my, in our last, uh, uh, present, uh, their last presentation in one of my meetings, they were already thinking of commercializing mushroom production. We also have uh, their activities around trying to uh, solve the energy solution by training community members on how to uh, assemble solar energy panels to lighten their community. You can see women, everybody involved. And of course, that is a, a more sustainable approach to addressing uh, the issue facing our planet. In Accra, uh, at, at, at Dilek is here. She has uh, been part of this project, which I have to uh, record here, where uh, uh, student groups are working on measuring plastic debris from uh, beach cleanup in Accra. And this particular project from the report by uh, UNEP, as led by uh, Dilek uh, Fresil, have contributed to SDG 14.11. And I think this is um, one great uh, a contribution of seeing science in uh, measuring plastic debris and also monitoring uh, uh, the environment. We also have the, uh, the project I mentioned earlier in Uganda, where the citizen group is creating awareness about systematics and uh, uh, helping the community to uh, stay uh, healthy. From all this, I want to uh, summarize the key lessons from the various things and approaches in Africa and, of course, by extension to other global, part of the global south. One is the fact that partnership with local organizations with complementary skills is one key feature of their operations. They identify organizations at the local level. They have harnessed as skills which can help them in addressing some of these challenges. Number two, they recognize and utilize expertise and experience of the internal members. And uh, some of them also have been exposed to training either from academic groups or international agencies on use of uh, modern tools and the rest. We also have uh, deploying, uh, deployment of toolkits for identifying and monitoring the state of the planetary health. However, these citizen science groups need modern ways of um, analyzing, visualizing, and disseminating their their, their output in terms of digital lab, which will enable them to engage with participants, contribute data, upload photos and videos, and uh, archive their information. Sorry, it's not good. Sorry. Yeah, okay, work. okay. Again, we identified the need for databases and for us for collection, processing, and analysis and dissemination of uh, data on the planetary health, and of course, use of traditional and social media platform for dissemination of information. Some of these are, are, are being deployed, but they need to be escalated, and, uh, and also promoting knowledge co-generation to understand the environment and how to adjust. So, in the course of our survey and other uh, activities, there are a number of challenges that have been identified that are inhibiting the implementation of citizen science projects in the global south. First is data apartheid. And here we're talking about a situation whereby we have serious and uh, large information being collected by citizen science groups. But in most cases, these data do not uh, get accepted by the national science offices or other allied agencies. And so, either because of lack of trust or they feel this uh, 
uh, data, the process of collecting them is not standardized, and so on and so forth. So they don't inform decisions and planning, either to manage the environment or uh, other components of um, other aspects of life. The other problem is institutional bureaucracy, which affects uh, access to funding, training, and other opportunities that can help to grow the senior science groups. We also have the challenge of power relations, with either within themselves or while trying to work with other groups. There's also the challenge of different stakeholder interests. When we come together through participatory approaches, uh, we have uh, different uh, individuals uh, or groups coming with a different mandate, different interests, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, that is also because of diverse ideologies of partners, whether local partners, national partners, or global partners, and of course, lack of funding to support their uh, operations. In conclusion, let me make this uh, three statements. Number one, that CS projects or CSI projects are sustainable options for advancing planetary health in Africa if we can improve their validation and credibility, which is the problem that national scientific offices and other agencies have with the, with the data collected by citizen science. The second is that the priority of citizen science projects shows their alignment with our aspirations for planetary health. With rigorous standardization, mapping and documentation, we may be able to improve the integration and adoption into conventional uh, approaches. One of the things we notice is that there's very poor awareness about citizen science projects in Africa. And that calls for proper documentation, which is what we have done. And currently, we are working on uh, 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 translating the output from that our survey into uh, a scientific article which can be accessible and also with intent to uh, develop policy uh, or uh, uh, white paper which can be widely circulated to create awareness about the activities of the citizen science across Africa and how they can contribute to improving and uh, safeguarding our planet health. And lastly, more support is needed. And at this juncture, I want to mention that the Citizen Science Africa Association, which was inaugurated in the last year, uh, uh, is very happy to be, to, to be uh, recognized by ESA. And of course, for giving me the opportunity to be here to talk about what we are doing in Africa. And we are here to learn. I've learned a lot since the, uh, the, my arrival from a number of projects across Europe. And we as a hope for more collaboration, more support, to be able to help us to identify, document, and uh, publish a number of practices in societies in Africa, which are doing a great work in advancing planetary health and safeguarding our environment. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, I think learning was really the key word. I learned a lot, so thanks so much for your insightful talk and your African perspective on citizen science. I'm sure everybody um, learned as much as I did, and I'm also sure that many of you have questions, and we do have time, and Peter is here for you to answer your questions. Luigi. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, uh, fantastic talk. My name is Luigi. I am from Earthwatch in, uh, in the UK. And I was uh, especially interested in, uh, in what you were saying because uh, we are trying to open an office in Africa and uh, we are um, actually going through the analysis of all these challenges uh, and also opportunities. So um, I just wanted to expand actually on what is on this slide about the lack of funding. Because if we compare uh, the situation in Africa, I mean, Africa is a big world, but so if we compare it with, uh, with EXA and with the European situation, we see that in EXA a lot of funding uh, that uh, was used to launch old initiatives coming from uh, public sources, especially the European Commission. So I was wondering uh, if, you, if you can uh, maybe say a few words about what is the situation in Africa in terms of potential funding for citizen science activities. Do, do we have the same opportunity to uh, attract uh, public funding or, or maybe that's different? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I... 
need to say that funding is a big issue. As when I started working with the communities a couple of years ago, in fact, not just funding, there's this uh, disconnect between the community groups and the government. Uh, why the community group at their local level are trying to address the challenges affecting them. It was difficult to reach out to government. But when we started partnering with them from an academic uh, group, we were able to help them to standardize their, uh, uh, their method of data collection, which was part of why the government don't want to associate with them. And also by creating awareness about what they are doing. So presently now, we have the same way by the government now um, engage the community, even collecting data on uh, part of their uh, uh, mandate. So that may not be direct funding, but like empowerment. Not only that, they now make use of those data to inform decisions and planning. So I think uh, the funding is a big issue, but uh, that's why, like I mentioned, we're happy to be here uh, as uh, an association in Africa to explore opportunity for partnership and collaboration to uh, close that gap. The community are self-driven. They, uh, uh, they, they do, uh, they are deploy uh, collective approaches in uh, doing the little they are doing. So funding is a big challenge because that opportunity uh, is not there. Uh, DILEC is also here, like I mentioned, and already uh, when I uh, mentioned to our National Statistics Office in uh, Abuja concerning what was uh, done in Accra, they were very happy and were already talking about how to uh, escalate or replicate what was done in Accra in Lagos. You know, Lagos has a very long coastline and a number of uh, um, uh, uh, plastic litters you know, across the, the, the beach. So they are already thinking of creating a budget for that. But of course, it will take some time. So uh, maybe in this uh, piecemeal, <laughs> the issue of funding will be addressed, but I think we, need, we do need support, uh, uh, external support, to be able to uh, entrench these practices of the citizen science group. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Any other questions? Yeah. It's working, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Very insightful talk. Uh, two questions. One is related to technology, and especially in countries like ours with a very big digital gaps. What is your perspective of the role of technology and citizen science in, in the implementation of this kind of project? And the second one is related to governance. You were mentioned that poor governance is one of the big challenges that you had. And I would like to know how far citizen science is helping to or can help to address this challenge. Thank you. Thank you again for those beautiful questions. Of already in one of my slides, I mentioned the typologies of citizen science projects. And if you look at those ones where the African citizen science groups are not active, it's largely due to low technology adoption. So I think uh, that is another serious uh, drawback. So there will be need for training and exposure of this group to uh, technology where they have been uh, 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 assisted, like in some of our projects, on how to use mobile devices to collect data and all that. They are very enthusiastic. They are very uh, happy to, to, to use uh, data. And apart from even the technology itself, I mean the hardware, even access to the internet is another major uh, challenge which limits their activity. So I think um, the, the, the uh, in, in, in increase in internet penetration, increase in access to uh, 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 technology will enhance the operation. But for now, it's a big uh, uh, challenge for citizen science groups. Uh, and of course, again, um, let me cite the case of uh, fighting flood that a citizen science group, uh, the Slum Federation, uh, participated in. We have a community in Lagos called Ikurudu, Ajikuna Ikurudu, where they have been suffering from serious uh, flood uh, uh, incidences in the last uh, couple of uh, years. So that has affected a number of uh, uh, their livelihood systems. Lives have been lost, buildings ravaged, and all that. So 
And my um, uh, colleagues identify um, those problems and with the uh, code design brought this citizen group together and then they began to develop a resilience action plan. You know, they collected data, did analysis and identified priority areas and projects. And eventually they brought government on board. So now the government is adopting that report to uh, create solutions to some of the problems that have been identified. Yes, uh, it's a slow process, but I think uh, there's a prospect of uh, since science influencing policy uh, in Africa. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, thanks for your important message, for calling upon the European citizen science community to connect with the African citizen science community and share our knowledge and our lessons learned. And um, I hope you all take his call, his message along and connect with Peter in the coffee break today. And um, huge massive thanks again to you, Peter, uh, for this excellent talk and all the insights you shared with us. And um, I wish all of you now uh, really um, wonderful and inspiring morning in um, all the different sessions that you have uh, before you and um, thanks again Peter and see you all in this room tonight um, again for the closing words because we have a few more exciting announcements that you don't want to miss.
excuse me. Excuse me, Martins. Do you have your uh, contact? I, I don't have a card. Okay. But maybe but everybody knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so I'll send you Martins. I'll send you his this, email. Oh, great. Yeah, it's so just, it's just you. Martin Brocklehurst okay. at me dot com. Okay. And, and if you Google me, you'll find me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so I will, I will send you an email. And, yeah. uh, I'm very, yes, I'm very uh, open in okay. terms of my contact oh, okay. details. Okay. So no problem. <laughs> All right. Hello. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. May I please ask you to sit down and get ready for our next session? Wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. I know we had a very exciting and inspiring input already. Um, and now we are about to have uh, another exciting session on uh, human health, patient research, epidemiology, and foresight. My name is Kim Grutzmacher, and I am the lead for planetary health um, for the Museum für Naturkunde. Um, and I um, may chair the session, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity and very excited to see you all here in the room. And we will start the session with an input by Liselotte Rambonet um, on using passive citizen science to map the effects of COVID-19 litter on animal health. Please, Liselotte. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm really happy to uh, talk about something maybe a bit unexpected for this session, uh, but also the environmental side, which is really important for a planetary health topic, of course. Um, I'm a PhD researcher at the Science and Communication Department at Leiden University, Netherlands. Um, and we researched the effects of COVID-19 litter, face masks and gloves uh, on animals. And I also, uh, next to my PhD, coordinate a citizen science project myself. Uh, it's called Plastic Spotter. Every week, the whole year, on Sunday, we go out with volunteers in canoes in the canals of Leiden, which we really have beautiful canals. But they're quite polluted, like 12 bags of litter, big bags of litter we take out every week. Um, but fortunately, we can do something about it and really uh, have volunteers that are actively involved since two years, since the pandemic started, actually. And we not only take out the litter, we also uh, research the litter, it's science. Um, so we analyze after we come back specific categories we count, like uh, plastic bottles, but also um, tin cans. And we find the strangest things. Um, we're really at the source of, of the pollution in Leiden, a big, quite, quite an okay big city. Um, and strangest finds we do is, is like a, a, a diary of a PhD student, written in English, um, about his dating experience during the pandemic. So that was quite interesting find. Even a double dildo we found, and condoms we find every week almost, which says a lot about uh, what's happening uh, around us uh, in the city. Um, it's actually quite a mirror of what's happening in society, the litter in the canals. So, of course, also when uh, the face masks were introduced and gloves were being used uh, at the start of the pandemic, we saw this happening in the canals of Leiden as well. We found since January 2021, we started counting face masks as well, more than 3,000 face masks in only like five kilometers of canals every week we clean up and maximum 165 face masks in one cleanup of five kilometers. And one particular Sunday in the summer of 2020, we found uh, something quite striking. Well, actually our volunteers found it. Uh, they were like, ah, like half an hour ago, we found something. We don't know what it is. Maybe you can tell us. 
it was a victim of the COVID litter. Uh, a perch, which is quite common fish in the canals, was trapped inside a glove, in the thump of a glove. And you actually see that it ruptured where the tail is, so it probably tried to wiggle its way out. Uh, but it has also spines on its back, so it's really trapped in there. Um, yeah, and we were wondering, we find so much litter of the pandemic. How is it in other countries? Must be the same, other cities. And also, are other animals affected as well? Or are we the only one that finds something like this? Probably not. So we're wondering how uh, does the impact, uh, how does the increase of PPE in the environment affect animals? We started looking for other observations shared online by people uh, of animals interacting with face masks or gloves. We use Google, of course, um, to find, for example, shared by news media, for example. Um, but we also looked specifically on social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter. And we only looked in English and Dutch and looks with keywords like these, like PPE, face mask, glove, ingesting, entangled, a lot of these keywords. And then you can find uh, observations shared by people on um, face masks, like this one uh, in the bottom left, it's in Namibia. Uh, they rescue brown fur seals uh, every day. Um, they're entangled in all kinds of stuff, but also now they have two seals that were uh, entangled in face masks. One actually being a reusable one, so that's an interesting observation uh, because it's mostly single use. But people share the, yeah, different kinds of observations um, and we try to map these. So uh, this led to the first publication in uh, March 2021. 28 observations, like a first general overview what kind of effects what animals are infected, which was published in Animal Biology. Um, because it's citizen science, um, we also think it's important to keep uh, updating this overview. So we set up this website where people can share any observation they seen themselves or found online on, uh, on news media or social media. So people could also try to look up the keywords themselves and see if they find something maybe in their own language. Another team of researchers in Canada actually uh, used our methods and also did the same as we did and uh, updated the overview and published recently uh, 114 observations. Still English and Dutch, or not, they only looked into English of course. Um, and you can tell a bit more like quantitatively uh, what is happening where and which animals. And we keep updating this overview as well. We currently have two, one, two, one, 200, sorry, 200 observations of animals interacting with uh, PPE litter. And these are different kinds of uh, interactions. So entanglement is quite a common one. Um, so you see a crab, but also an American robin in Canada, uh, which was entangled. Um, another category of interactions is uh, nest incorporation. So birds mainly, but also other animals use uh, plastics in their nests and also face masks. And ingestion, of course, is also happening. So you see a penguin and a dog um, that ingested face masks, but it's happening to a lot of animals uh, currently. And other categories like this, um, a sea lion, which was probably playing or is like investigating the face mask, is not sure what kind of behavior it was, but it's actually also won a wildlife photography award. And it's 70% of the observations are from birds interacting with uh, face masks or gloves and 25% mammals and others 5% like fishes um, or reptiles. And the platforms we find these observations on are, yeah, quite a large percentage is from Google, so news media uh, that shared an observation, but also Twitter and Facebook are quite popular. Uh, and we currently extended our research also to TikTok, which is quite interesting and new for me, and Reddit as well. And uh, also part of our observations come from our own database, the covidliter.com website. And other things are like peer-reviewed art articles, um, personal correspondence of observations being shared. And the top six, um, so a large percentage comes from the USA, uh, but also the UK and the Netherlands. The Netherlands is quite a small country, but still we have a lot of observations uh, because we also looked into Dutch, of course, and did a lot of outreach that might, might play also a role. Uh, and Germany is also there. Um, now I will share a photo that you can't share yet. It's not published yet. Um, 
So this is uh, 30 kilometers southeast of Berlin. It's um, the white-tailed eagle. You can see the adult one in the top. But these are chicks that were being ringed by birders. And unfortunately, one is uh, entangled in a face mask in its leg, but it's saved on time, fortunately. But this is a kind of an observation that people encounter during their work as a birder, for example. And you can see the global north is quite well represented in our study. Um, so it's very interesting to also look into the global south to see what's happening there. Um, actually, almost half of the observations come from Europe in our study. But we see this is a case study of uh, how observations being shared online can contribute to our understanding of which type of species are affected by these mainly single-use items that have been introduced in the society. And also, where is it happening? How is it happening? What kind of interactions uh, there are? And of course, this is only one example of a type of plastic pollution, but it can be, um, yeah, be an uh, example for other types of plastic uh, that entangle uh, animals or are being ingested in animals. So it's a type of passive citizen science, you may call it, or crowdsourced citizen science. But you can still de de debate if it's citizen science, because this is data that was already shared, so people are not actively involved in scientific research. So this is something we are looking into. Uh, but it can say something about where is this data coming from, which groups can be more actively engaged in doing research um, with citizens. So wildlife rescue volunteers can be involved. Uh, veterinarians are also involved. Um, but also photographers, photographers who are in nature all the time, uh, photographing birds, for example. Uh, but also litter pickers, cleanup people, the volunteers doing great work there. And of course, dog owners, they are always there with their dog and they see things happening, what they eat. Uh, but an interesting point, which is uh, the case for many crowdsourced uh, citizen science projects uh, currently happening, especially with social media, is that of course you have a bias, the observer's bias, but um, yeah, species, we see species in our database that are living closely together with humans, a lot of seagulls, for example, pigeons. Um, so you have a bias there that you only will observe maybe the species living close to humans also being day active, not the night active uh, animals, for example. Uh, and of course, the location, as you already saw in the map, which has also a, bi a bias. So uh, it would be good to look into other languages as well, um, see what kind of observations are being shared in other countries. And which is also uh, discussed in another talk, in the global south, people may not have uh, smartphones, or not smartphones with a mobile camera, or connection to the internet, so it's good to be aware of this as well, that it's not uh, possible for everyone to observe or share their observations. Another uh, very important point I would like to address is the validity, to check the, valid uh, the, the validity of the, the observations. If there's a photo or video, you have already a bit more evidence of the observation actually happened, uh, but also um, the species that, uh, that someone saw, like people sometimes mix up the crows and the jackdaws, for example. Um, so if you have a photo or video, you can actually uh, check that. And of course, behavior, sometimes people interpret the behavior. Yeah, I will really um, uh, speed up. Um, but also staged photos, people use, uh, make photos for commercial purposes and uh, might uh, edit them. So check uh, if you can uh, get contact with the observers. So we have some other research uh, topics we're looking into now uh, rela related to this. You can ask questions about this if you want later as well. Um, so it's good to be aware of the bias and validity when you look into observations online being shared for research. And if you want to help out with this research, you can also do yourself by going to this website. And I would really like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lizelda, for welcome. this excellent presentation. Do we have questions? Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you, Lizelda. It's of course uh, it's it's uh, well, it's a touching topic that you uh, that you worked on. But I have a question on the term of the use of passive science. Yes. Because I think that seems to suggest that it's. Uh, 
but I'm not so sure whether this is, but for me, it introduces a bias into doing citizen science because these people have been actively taking photographs and studying the things outdoor. And how can we label such kind of activity as passive? That is kind of a bias from a scientific point of view. Yeah. So I'd like you to think of another term that <laughs> qualifies this type of citizen science, but not as passive citizen science. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for addressing this. Um, if it still works, can I still use the thing? I'm not sure. Um, but I will, uh, yeah, my perspective on it is also I'm doubting if passive is a good term. It's, it's also quite negative. Um, people are, of course, not or maybe not sharing these observations with the intent of that it can be used for scientific research. Um, so we're looking into this now. If do, we are doing interviews of, with people that uh, shared these observations on social media to see what their motivations are, um, if they would have thought that it could help science to understand uh, the topic, um, and also if they would like to be acknowledged, for example. Uh, but yeah, it can also be another term, maybe a spontaneous citizen science or a latent, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Well, that, that would go in an interesting direction, but I think it, it points towards a bigger issue, and it is that there's so much uh, research being done uh, among the public, so to say, among yeah, ourselves, definitely. which is absolute, goes absolutely unadverted. And that's what we have to be sensible to. I work in another domain of health, and you know, patients do a lot of things yeah. without even being noticed. Yeah. And that's not a passive thing. So yeah. it's a pretty important issue that we touch upon. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm also really a, a fan of bottom-up research, things that are already co being collected. So my next project is about wildlife rescue. In the Netherlands, we have more than 80 organizations with volunteers doing great work, collecting a lot of data, which can be interesting. But there's no connection yet with researchers. So we're also looking into untapping these sources of data that are already there. And of course, being critical uh, on the, the, the validity, like what kind of methods are being used? Can it be more standardized? Um, but it's, yeah, it's good to be aware that citizens are doing valuable things that we can, uh, can hopefully help to get to the right, uh, uh, right people. Yeah. Thank you. Anything? Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're a little bit over time, so we have no time for further questions. So if you have any more burning questions, please come find Lizalot in the break, as will I. So, <laughs> excellent. So we will move on to the next um, presentation. <laughs> so now we have uh, Josep Perillo, uh, and he's going to talk about COACT for mental health. Josep, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, uh, what I'm going to present is, is one of the, the actions of the pilots that we have been doing in COAG, which is an European funded project. And, and that's mainly been done uh, with a group of open systems in the University of Barcelona, but most importantly with the active participation and for the long term of 30 or more than 30 people with uh, mental health problems and also their families. So what I want to today show you is some preliminary results and some of the ideas that we have been working during this almost three years because we are about to finish with this project. And, and the idea basically also is to look to citizen science to enhance uh, its social dimension. And also I think that in terms of, of mental health, that's really relevant. So what we really take care of, or we have been looking at, is on this principle of connection and association and the principle of relationship among people and the importance of the social dimension when we deal uh, a research on exactly this topic and to do that uh, with citizen science can make a difference. And, and especially because uh, we generally don't talk much about mental health in public and especially because I think that to louder the voice of some people is especially relevant and also because the, the importance of listening to these people is also very relevant for them and for us. And this principle of association and relationship is what has been driving the, the research that I'm going to, to show you. And of course, it's taking also in a, in, in a really, really intense manner or the, the kind of the definition from Irving that is trying to assist the needs of concerns 
of uh, given of specific groups of citizens, and the idea that uh, that citizens themselves can be enacted and empowered with the uh, participation of uh, or in a citizen science project. So in COACT, what we would like very much to define is citizen social science as a participatory research that is co-designed and directly driven by citizen groups that they are sharing a social concern. And in this case, it's very clear, no? mental health care provision. And, and in this sense, uh, uh, we find or we like very much to think about a situated knowledge, and citizen science can play uh, again a key role here, to really face a concern with the people that are living these experiences, and also to, to, to really take care also what has been done in this field as well, from academic view, but also from civil society organizations that, for instance, in our case, are fully engaged uh, in this process as a knowledge coalition and trying to better frame what we want to look at. And of course, also uh, governments and, and policy makers that also can make also think uh, that this is a key element on how to better drive the actions and the demands from a, this specific group of people. So I would mostly focus on co-researchers in this talk, and uh, I, we understand co-researchers as people or persons that having a lived experience in relation to a given social concern. And then, and especially in this case, we must recognize them as experts in the field. So, and also another very important aspect is that they must feel in the whole process as really co-owners of this knowledge because uh, that could be fundamental for them as individuals but also as a community and also because uh, with all this knowledge also they can, uh, they can take a specific actions to improve their situation. So, which theme? So, in being more particular, and this was built with a knowledge coalition, which are these kind of institutions that are surrounding us, um, about 80 institutions in, in, in Catalonia, and, and the idea is to really focus on people's social environment, which are fundamental in the recovery process of people with mental health problems. So, in this case, the idea and the principle, which is quite uh, starting to be a general consensus, uh, to have a general consensus in the field, is that uh, the social interactions are fundamental for the well-being of people with mental health problems. And also, uh, to better study which are the roles that can be, around, uh, the, uh, can be taken by the families and other people surrounding this, the persons with mental health problems, uh, needs to have better study uh, and, and needs to be even strengthened or better learn which can be the roles, which are the difficulties and which are the challenges or which are the other problems that we might face in this context. This has been done in collaboration with the Mental Health uh, Federation of Catalonia that is just uh, uni uniting the efforts of associations of, of people with mental health problems and, and associations of families uh, of, of people with mental health problems. So I think that what I have been saying in a very theoretical framework and very uh, using, trying to use the best words, I think that the draw is much better. So when we talk about mental health uh, uh, and social support networks on mental health, it's something like that. So we need to support the people that are having these problems, but also the people surrounding that, they have to make the effort, but also if these people fall, also the whole system also falls. No? So if the people has a problem and is not feeling well, also the family is suffering, and also the friends. And the friends need to support this person, but as well this person uh, that is in principle the responsible of taking care of this person, feel guilty that he maybe or she cannot do the, the, his best or her best because she or he doesn't know how to do that. So based on this kind of idea, what we have been doing is to run a research that has been very long, and that's also a particular issue in our research, that has been taking, as you see, several years, and starting from a call for researchers, and ending up right now in a chatbot that is, is already active for, for several months. And now we are building, with the knowledge that we are taking from this, knowledge, from this chatbot, uh, a set of actions that can be delivered for the regional government who is the responsible of mental health care provision in Catalonia. So how it works? So basically, uh, you have to imagine you have a mobile and you are just taking breakfast. You are subscribed to the mental health uh, to Emperor La Salad Mental chatbot in, in Telegram and you receive a message, one like that. In this case, it's about labor. Uh, and that's a real story of a person 
that has have been having some mental health problems and and uh, and this kind of spaces has been uh, really difficult for this person okay so that's a real situation very personal situation and then you re you you are asked to answer something have you been living something similar do you know somebody else that has been living something similar like the story that you have just read so this very simple information unfortunately uh, policymakers they don't have any clue about that. So they don't know about that. And, what, and, and that's really difficult to start doing new policies without this information. So that was one motivation. Second motivation is that co-researchers generally don't dare to say that aloud and in public. Okay, so just to share that, you feel guilty because you feel weak, you feel that you are not doing the right things. To verbalize that, to write down that is very important for this person, but also to feel like somebody is listening to this person is also very relevant. So all these kind of things is what is behind this chatbot. So I, if you want, I can invite you to subscribe to Telegram chatbot, looking for Coactuem for la, por la Salud Mental. And there are some postcards outside that is giving you the instructions if you want. But I would like for, finally to explain, me, explain you a little bit how it works, okay? So first of all, a chatbot generally is a machine that is sending us message using artificial intelligence. Here, well, what we like to think is that the intelligence is already there, it's the people that they have these problems, okay? And these people already have the experience that they want to share. So what you are actually receiving is, is the set of stories that these people have been writing, okay, for, a, for several months, like in a, in a workshop, a writing workshop, with a short story, with very nice draws that they try to, in a way or another, verbalize, put into words they suffer. Okay, or maybe they're nice experiences, okay? So they are positive and not that positive experiences as well. And somebody is just listening that through a mobile phone and in a quite private uh, space. So you can answer that individually with no pressure, okay? So you can just share that and so on. So we have been doing that uh, with, a, with, a, with a diary, writing down the stories, okay? So they, we offer this kind of diary to the people participating, and they, they, the exercise was to write down this, okay? And also, uh, just to share some very short, notice, uh, short snapshots of the results that we are getting, for instance, you can, you can just question whether the participation is similar to other kind of citizen science projects. And the answer is yes, it's, it's a, it's, the dynamics is very similar. Okay, so if you compare that to the universe, so the kind of contributions of the people that are subscribed to the chatbot, they have very similar patterns. Okay, so the topic is not important in that case. Secondly, who is participating? That's a relevant question. No? So, and, and I can tell you, of course, it's mostly people from Catalonia, but it's middle-aged people, people with mental health problems, mostly, mostly women. I can talk about that if you have more questions on that or just pick me during, in the corridors. But the idea also is that we want to also to identify which are the relevant micro stories. This is another example, and statistically you can just identify who is, uh, which one is receiving a lot of much more answers that you have been living this situation, okay? That's the logics, but there can be many other logics to identify and to combine qualitative and quantitative research related to that. And also you can aggregate all this data and just identify which is the potential network of support if everyone should be able to just share their experiences and just say that, yes, I have been living the same. And the kind of meaning of that can be like, you have things in common, you are aware that you're not alone. This is very important for, for in this context. Also, but also the, the, the force of joining actions of that, okay, so we can awaken some empathy as well, or also, why not also highlight the differences. So I will stop here. That's just a snapshot of what is possible and that we are going to face to some political policy actions right now. And I, you can consult the website as well. And finally, I just invite you to the final events of COACT that are going to happen very shortly online that are going to share this experience and many others from this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josep. Fantastic presentation. We uh, have time for some questions. Are there any questions? Yes, please, up there. 
Yes, please, go ahead. Oh, is that Katya? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this very interesting talk. Um, maybe that's a very German question, but how do you ensure data protection? Uh, you mean like data protection? First of all, the, the, the chatbot, when you are subscribed, it's fully anonymized, so we don't know exactly your number, for instance, okay? Your phone number, okay? That's in, in these terms. So we just separate this kind of data, okay, into kind of, uh, of data sets, let's say. And secondly, um, also there is no interaction among participants, okay, so you, you only can press buttons. So if you have a mental health issue, for instance, and you're inside the chatbot, we rece you receive an automatic message, but we are not starting a conversation, so the interaction also is limited just also for, for the well-being of the person, because maybe he might feel like there you can also have a say, but it's not exactly this, that, no? And, and also in terms of, of the same stories, uh, all the names are fake, so they are not real, okay? But the stories are completely real, okay? So I don't know if I'm answering you, and of course we have been going through the ethical committees, and we have been taking care of the language in terms of suicide, for instance, okay? And other kind of things. Is this what you were asking? I don't know. I don't know if I am answering. Um, basically, yes, I just, you know, I read Telegram and they are having the phone numbers there. And so I was concerned about that, how this then yeah. works. But we can talk in the... Well, Telegram right. is the safest uh, platform on that, but maybe it, Francisca is here and he has been running the, the platform and he can have a say on that. Yeah, so um, maybe that, that would uh, extend a bit over this pause. So maybe if you come to me after the... Uh, after the, in the coffee break, I can explain exactly how it works, but um, we work together with the Open Knowledge Foundation and we discussed exactly with them um, how we can separate uh, a number that's not, a te um, that's not your phone number, but it's a telegram ID that we need in order to send and receive always to the same person. And inside our database, this number is separated from all the data, so as, as soon as somebody um, unsubscribe from the chatbot or as soon as the entire um, experiment is finished, we can cut off these numbers um, from the database. They are not intertwined within the database, so they, they can be thrown away. And also they don't allow any um, information about who is there because it's only between the chatbot and the person. But yeah, there, there are many more details about that. If you want, you can just ask us. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Do we have any more? Okay, we have a burning question up there, I can see. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the talk, it's very interesting. Uh, my question, I have several, but I will try to <laughs> summarize it. Uh, one of them is uh, these micro stories, how many of them or which percentage of them are positive with a good value, uh, emotional value, and how many are negative or yeah, with a negative value, and also if you have uh, asked the users how were their uh, experience using the app in, in terms of their emotions and their, uh, yeah, how they feel yeah. after reading a sad story, for instance. Okay, in the second answer, we don't, ans we don't ask that because we felt like it's something delicate as well, but uh, yeah, it could be a good idea to include that, and we haven't. Uh, but we know a lot about the participants, eh? not only the gender, the age, or whether they have a mental health problem and so on, but also which is the kind of relationship that they have ch just have with uh, their own environment, okay? So that's one issue. And in relation of the positive and negative, that's a very difficult thing to mention, but for instance, I can tell you that in, if you talk about the stigma, okay, so whether the stories are related to the stigma and, and taboo, uh, so it's, it's, it's quite high. Okay, so these also tell us that, uh, that the, the voices still have a real social problem there because we are not feeling like uh, we, these people feel like uh, is, is totally socialized their own problem. No? So they, they express some kind of discomfort or they, they, exper they express like they are afraid to share these problems with their neighborhoods, for instance. No? Uh, so these kind of things are like more than a half uh, stories are like that. No? But, to say positive and negative for me it's a bit difficult, okay, but, uh, but in terms of that I can tell you that, that most of the message or a lot of the messages are not positive as you can imagine. 
Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm sorry, I would ask you to come find Josep. So thanks again, thank Josep, uh, very important work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, now we are going to hear John Palmer on now casting urban vector mosquitoes for epidemiological preparedness. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, thank you very much for coming. What I want to talk about now is how citizen science can be used to um, better prepare for public health uh, questions and better um, control uh, disease vector mosquitoes, the mosquitoes that transmit diseases. The last time that I came to this meeting in person, uh, I was talking about how citizen science can actually be used um, for early warning as disease vector mosquitoes spread across territory. And one of the things that we were finding in this research, that's a little bit weird, uh, is that this seems to be some sort of distortion in the slides. Um, focus on the left here. What we were finding in this research is that the, um, one of the big values that citizen science can play in early warning is that you have this great geographical coverage that you don't get um, through traditional sampling methods. Uh, the question itself is important because um, uh, mosquito-borne disease places an enormous burden worldwide. Uh, dengue, Zika, and Chikungunya, for example, are really growing threats. They drive poverty and inequality. And with climate change, these are increasingly pr uh, big problems uh, in the places that they already exist, and they're increasingly uh, worrying problems in places around Europe where they haven't yet become endemic. So the question that we started asking after working on this kind of spreading question across municipalities is how can citizen science help public health agencies fight mosquito-borne disease actually in cities, right? You can do a good job of providing early warning uh, as they spread into new municipalities, but a lot of the questions that public health agencies need to deal with are day-to-day decision-making about mosquito control at very small scale. And to do that, they really need high-resolution data, and they need it in near real time. And what they're really interested in is human mosquito encounters. Where are humans encountering mosquitoes in space and time? Traditional surveillance here is lacking because it's both slow and it's low resolution. What you're seeing on the left is a traditional adult mosquito trap that basically sucks mosquitoes into that little um, neck there. Uh, right, so that's an adult mosquito trap. And this is a traditional, what we call an ovi trap. It's just a little container of water that collects mosquito eggs on this stick. And in both cases, you need entomologists to go out and set the traps and then check them after a certain period of time, typically one or two weeks, bring a bag of mosquitoes or a tongue depressor with mosquito bat eggs back to the lab, look at them under the microscope. All of this takes time, it takes resources, and it makes it difficult to cover a city at any sort of high resolution, and it makes it difficult to get information at, you know, in the time that you often need it in order to act and make decisions about treatments. So the same citizen science approach that we've been using for this kind of large-scale early warning approach, uh, this uh, citizen science system that we call Mosquito Alert, is something that we're finding can also be useful at the city scale. So the system right now basically facilitates the process by which ordinary people who don't specialize in mosquitoes can report what they find about mosquitoes because they get bitten, because they see something, and they can identify at least something about what that mosquito might be, because they may find a breeding site. And it facilitates the process of bringing that information to the expert entomologists who can help to identify the species that they're seeing, determine if they're disease vectors, uh, and bring that information to the public health agencies who need to act on it. So the system actually involves data going from the citizen science to a digital ento lab, which is now this large network of volunteer entomologists all around the world who look, around the, look at the photographs and they determine, uh, they score the photographs in terms of the species uh, that's represented in them. Increasingly, the system is also using artificial intelligence to do that identification. And it then feeds the information, it feeds this output into both a public web map and then a set of data portals that are designed specifically for public health um, actors to be using. We decided to try to combine that citizen science approach with both the traditional traps that are already being used in cities and also uh, networked smart traps. Uh, and this is something that's being developed by Iridian. It's a startup in Barcelona that has developed this sensor that they can put on top of a traditional trap, 
which um, uh, it's an optical sensor that can classify mosquitoes, um, and they have a paper now by genus and sex at high, level, high levels of accuracy as they fly through the sensor into the trap. And these are networked, they're connected to the internet, so it's part of the internet of uh, things, and that information is transmitted in real time both to the public health agencies uh, and to the mosquito alert system so that we can incorporate it into our models. So, um, again, for some reason there's this bizarre distortion, so focus on the left here. Um, what we did is we combined a set of, a relatively large set of traditional um, adult mosquito traps with just five of these smart traps placed in strategic locations around Barcelona with all of the citizen science reports that we get in uh, in an ongoing basis. Uh, this is really strange. So let's look here. We combined that with uh, a whole bunch of uh, layers of additional land cover information, uh, socio-demographic information, um, uh, population density, things like this, in order to model in real time interactions between human mos and mosquitoes from the three sources that we're using. So what I'm showing in this graph here is the model results, the time slice of the model results over four mosquito seasons from uh, the adult traps, which is the one labeled BG, so it's the green line, the citizen science data, the mosquito alert model, uh, and the smart traps, so the mos mosquito alert model is the, the orange line there. That's right, mosquito alert model, and then the smart traps, which is the, the top line which is the one where there's a lot of noise, but in fact what we're getting from the smart traps is high temporal resolution, and that's being, that's, you're seeing that in the noise. And what we do is we combine the three sources together into what we're calling a vector exposure risk index. And it's actually, so that's the bottom line, and it's actually the joint probability of a detection from all three of the sources. So in that sense, it's somewhat conservative, um, but at the same time, we're able to see when there's any sort of new information that's coming in, we're able to look at it in detail and see if that's something that should be passed on more directly to the public health agencies. Um, and what this gives us then is the ability to look at very high resolution, so this is a 20 meter resolution, at the probability of human mosquito interaction across Barcelona, both in space and in time. Um, that information is then fed to this portal that the public health agency can use. They can make decisions about placing treatments based on it. Um, and the idea is then they can make much better decisions, they can be more efficient in where they carry out treatments, they can be more uh, precise in the areas they target with public information campaigns, um, and this can help them do a better job of controlling mosquitoes in, in cities like Barcelona. So thank you very much. I'll be very happy to ask, answer questions afterwards, uh, right now. Excellent. So are there any questions? Yes, please. I was just wondering, it's really fascinating what you've been doing, um, uh, and I see you've been doing it in Barcelona. Would, do you think it would be uh, transferable to other areas where we've got increasing dengue pandemics like South Asia, for example? That's exactly one of the questions that we're looking at. We're trying to do a transfer to Bangladesh right now to see, so in the, in the next five years, to see how this can be transferred. And this, this is part of a new European project called ID Alert, where we'll, do, we'll look at just that. Um, right. One of the nice things of starting in a place like Barcelona is we have a lot of disease vector mosquitoes, but very low disease incidence of the mosquito-borne disease. Um, so it's a nice testing ground, but of course, where you really want to see how it works is in places like this that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, because the, the dengue uh, rates are going up so yeah. crazily with yeah. climate change at the moment. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for this presentation. Just one question. At the end, you said that and this information can be used by local administration to change policy, to really adapt, but is it? Do you have, are, are these institutions actually using your data? So the Barcelona Public Health Agency is using our data. Um, they're using the map that, that you see at the end, so that's a live web map, and um, I can pass around afterwards the, the address, so you can, it's a, it's a publicly available map, but it's there for them to make decisions both in terms of seeing that at that high resolution where the risks are located, but also seeing over time how risks are changing, right? If, if one neighborhood has increasing risk or decreasing risk, if their treatments seem to be successful. Um, they're also for, in going back farther, they've been using the raw citizen science data, particularly about breeding sites, 
in order to make just day-to-day -day decisions about where to go and, and treat mosquitoes. So they, they take that as a direct source of information about where, where people are complaining about finding mosquitoes. So both the raw information and the modeled information. We have one more question. Yes, please. Hi. Thanks so much. It was such an interesting presentation. And I was wondering, how do you ensure that the data collected by the citizens are uh, reliable and the, the quality of the data? Excellent. Thank you. Excellent question, because I also skipped over that. Uh, the, so there, there's two big concerns in terms of reliability. One is, are they reporting mosquitoes that are, are the actual mosquitoes we're interested in? And in Barcelona, the main mosquito we're interested in right now is the tiger mosquito. We do that through this digital ento lab. So I should have stressed that a little bit more. The purpose of having these entomologists look at the photographs is exactly for the reliability part. The citizen scientists tell us something about what they see. They take a photograph if they can. They also have a um, visual taxonomic key that they use but we also have this expert identification and increasingly we also have the AI for validation of is this a target species or not. Uh, then the other big question that we need to deal with is sampling effort, right? There's all this you know, problem of sampling bias because we, we don't have citizen science uniformly searching for mos mosquitoes around Barcelona. So from the beginning in Mosquito Alert, we built in a background, an optional background tracking module where uh, the citizen scientists, if they, if they can opt out of this, but if they don't, they, five times a day, their phone transmits a course location of where they are. So it's location masked in a, in a um, relatively large grid, square, grid cell, but small enough that we can use it usefully in the models to see basically where people are located. And then we can combine that with a model of their propensity to report, uh, which we get from just looking at the reporting activity and seeing like with many internet-based um, applications that most people first download it, use it, and then stop using it. So we put more weight on people, you know, the locations of people who've more recently downloaded the app uh, and less weight on the locations of people who've, who've had the app for a longer time. So we have a sampling effort model, which we can then use in our mosquito risk models to, to deal with that problem of bias. Thank you very much, John. Fascinating work indeed. Thanks to you. And So we will move on to our uh, to the next presentation by Timo Faltos on citizen science in medical and health science projects, legal questions and medical ethical contradictions due to participation. The floor is yours, Enrico. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. When the lawyers take the floor, the fun mode is over. Um, I'm here to present a little bit on legal questions on um, therapy-orientated citizen science projects. First, I'm not here to tell you you are not allowed to do what you are doing. Or I'm here to help you to, that you can do what you want to do. The problem behind is that most of law which affects research and science was made in mind of professional science, so science of universities, science of research institutes, and then we have to check if this professional law fits to citizen science and maybe what are the side effects which you maybe dislike. So, you will see during the talk, the more you are, the more problems you have. If you are only one person and doing your research maybe at home, for yourself, on yourself, in yourself, with yourself, it's okay. But the moment you are starting to collaborate, you will see in medical citizen science the number of problems increase. We start with classical issues, with medicinal, medicinal products, drugs. So most of therapy-orientated citizen science projects, as far as I can see, please, you can contradict, um, do not develop chemical substances for therapy. Very good. Very, very good, because this keeps you away from pharmaceutical legislation, which would put a lot of pressure to you. So if you are only looking for data, epidemiological data, health data, but you are not putting chemicals to you or to others, fantastic, this is not pharmaceutical law. 
It is law, but not pharmaceutical law. If you test a pharmaceutical subst substance with yourself, this is a more or less irrelevant self-experiment. It depends on the substance. We know there are citizen science projects using gene technology and so on. You should be careful. That especially in Germany. So if you are experimenting with um, GMOs, so genetically modified organisms, which you can do at home in, in your garage, uh, if you have uh, uh, the, uh, the chemicals and the apparatus, which you can buy legally, you can be very, very soon into gen in the law of genetic engineering, and that can, uh, can cause problems. The problems start if you are developing chemicals, at the generic term, and you're working together. What you are, what you are allowed to do to yourself, with the self-experiment, you are not allowed automatically to do to others, even if the others consent to it. In Germany, this can be criminal prosecuted. Medical device law. This is very uh, popular with a citizen science project. Here, you have to check what are you doing? Check your um, project design. Are you using a medical device which is legally on the market to obtain data? We have heard data protection law already. Are you just collecting data and you are not working on this medical device? Good for you. This is not medical device law. So if you are not interfering with this machine, if you are just using a machine, a device, an apparatus to collect data and not to further develop this machine, very good for you, no medical device law. You should seek legal advice if you plan to modify a medical device which is on the market already. This can bring you and others in your group into trouble. So to see how fast you can get into medical device law, so if you maybe develop a medical device, medical devices can be very, very simple. It can be a tongue depressor. This is this wooden stick doctors use to press down uh, the tongue, or even a Band-Aid. These are already medical devices. So if you develop something in this area and you plan to interact with others, with the public, you should seek legal advice because then you are already in medical device law. And it's your responsibility. So if you develop even a very, very simple medical device and you bring it to the market, bring it to the market sounds very professional, but it's very easy. You give it to others. So you give it to others. You hand, hand it over to others. This is already bring it to the market. And if you bring it to the market, you are responsibility. You brought a medical device to the market. And if this medical device is not in compliance with medical device law, you will be prosecuted. So criminal law issues. This is what I said before. So if you do a self-experiment with yourself, it's OK. But if you do something to others, even if the other person said, yes, it's OK, you should be very careful. So maybe taking a blood sample from the finger is OK. More, no. If the citizen scientist is not a licensed physician. So uh, the problems change a little bit or switch if one of these persons is a licensed physician. But if all citizen science in the group are not licensed physicians or nurses, maybe taking blood from the finger is enough. Medical ethics. We heard that today already. You know, if you develop pharmaceuticals, medical devices, you've heard there is something with um, ethics oversight, ethics committee. If you need ethics oversight, depends on many, many questions. In Germany here, it depends on how is your group designed? Is there a licensed physician in the group? If there's a licensed physician, maybe the licensed physician need uh, medical oversight or med uh, ethical counseling by an ethics committee, but not the others. Is your project invasive, so with pl uh, plot samples, or are you only looking at people? Are you collecting data? 
then it depends in which state in Germany you are, because the, uh, the professional f um, law for physicians is different in the different states of Germany. So please check your project design. And patent law issues is very, very important. Not only for you, but all for the others. So imagine you are in a citizen science project and you made an invention, a medical invention, which could go beyond your project, which could go for everybody who is affected by that disease or illness you are doing research on. If you are especially in, com uh, in a citizen science project, especially in combination with open science approaches, and you talk too soon, too early, too much in public about your project, about your results, about your possible invention, there will be no patent. This is infringing the nove novelty. So imagine some of you had an invention, a medical invention, and is talking here today and presenting this invention. You will not get a patent on this. It's over then. You say, okay, you say it's over. Yeah, but the problem is if you don't get a patent, you will not find like uh, one of the bigger players you, you, uh, to finance this invention to get into the market. You as a citizen science project, you may can develop some of these for your group, but you cannot go to the broader public because you don't have the money for that. And to have the money to develop it for the broader public, you need a patent. And if you don't get a patent, you don't find a partner to finance it. So please, whenever you do research in your projects, think before you talk and think where you talk. So data protection was already an issue here. This is, um, is only one very um, quick slide. Not much, more info, not much extra information. If you're doing citizen science in medical research, you don't have ordinary data, not name, not age. You have health data. And the European uh, data protection law is very sensitive with sensitive data. And health data is sensitive. So if you are processing sensitive data, such as health data, processing means collecting, processing, using, deleting, storing, whatever, it's not enough that you think that the person, you are, you, uh, the data you are using, has consented. It's not just thinking. You need an explicit consent. It means in written, it means in checkbox, or at least documented verbally. So it's not enough that you think the other person have consented, or that the person who's giving you the data thinks he or she has consented. Make it proof, click box in written or documented verbally. This applies to health data. If you think, oh, what can happen if I don't do that right? Well, prison is calling uh, or a, a fine is calling. So always think who is the responsible person in your project for data protection. This person has to make sure that your project is in compliance with um, data protection law. So fantastic, I'm uh, finished. If you have further questions, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Timo, for all this helpful information. We do have a question, yes, please. Yeah, Gaston Remmers, Foundation My Data Health in the Netherlands. Uh, the topic that you address is extremely important. We have been run into the same issues, ethical legal issues. We've had a project of two and a half million euros, which had to be aborted by the issue of medical ethical issues. So it's a really important issue. <laughs> Now the point is that you pointed out in the, in, the, in the beginning that these medical, ethical, legal issues are conceptualized from a pharmaceutical po uh, point of view with industry in the, in, or a professional mindset in mind. Now, and then you present some issues that want us to comply with this set of thinking. But uh, wouldn't it be the case to think of another set of, of ethical frameworks and legal frameworks that enable citizen science to happen uh, protecting citizens, but at least allowing a citizen science to flow as it wants to flow. You get my point? 
may you repeat the last uh, part for you? <laughs> so essentially it is, um, all these warnings we have to take into account because we have to comply with an ethical legal system that was conceptualized yeah. with industry and professional attitudes uh, in, in mind. But citizen science, especially those conducted by patients, is from a completely different perspective. So would we need another legal framework to address this? No, I get it. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think will be easier? To change the world or to try to comp get your citizen science project in compliance with this existing uh, legal and ethical uh, framework? I think that the question is rhetorical, but it is not. I think it is possible to conceptualize alongside standard ethical frameworks, other frameworks. So. Uh, <laughs> you need a, a lobbyist for that in the parliament. And uh, most of the laws I presented to you today is EU law. So can you imagine how complicated it will be to change just a part of that for that what you said. Uh, if, you, if you have an idea how to do it, uh, yeah. Well, I don't have the right answer right away, yeah. but I know that it's not enough just, just to want to comply with standard ethical legal frameworks. So of course we have to abide with them. We, we have no other choice to do that right now, but that doesn't suit, uh, should, um, uh, that doesn't mean that we have to continue to work along the established lines. It's killing us. I'm sorry. I know this is a very important discussion and I want you to continue with it, but maybe please, uh, being conscious of time, what we have, is it a short question? Is it a very quick one? Can we give a quick answer? Okay, then one very quickly, please. <laughs> it's just a little bit along these lines, but it's the same thing. Uh, and you mentioned that these are European laws. Um, I was thinking about the patent issues and open science. So if patent issues come from European laws, but open science and open data are also a drive in terms of European um, di directives, how do two conciliate and what can we do to improve the situation? Um, yeah. May, may I ask you back, you think patents are necessary to bring therapy to the patient? Well, it, it depends on what you're looking at. I'm just thinking about the thing that you said, you cannot, from the moment you communicate and you talk and you publish data, then you cannot have a patent. Yes. Okay, so this is a, this is kind of an issue because at the same time we are driven as scientists and also by European and not only European, um, North American and everything. Everyone is pushing for open data and more accessible data. And so is there any kind of reworking of the laws that pertain to these kind of uh, patent possibilities? Uh, as far as I know, no. But what you can do, you can do open science. The message is, do it right, do it not too early. You can publish all your data. The message is, do citizen science, do medical projects, do open science, but be careful with the timeline. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> That's a great final word. Thank you. Thanks, Timo. And let's move on to our next uh, speaker, Ria Volkorte who will speak about citizen science for health and action gaining insights in fatigue for people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. My name is Ria Wolkotte from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Um, and my work is mostly done in the TopFit Citizen Lab, which is a field lab focused on citizen science for health. Uh, the Field Lab has been sponsored uh, with funding from the national and uh, local governments. And our project that I would like to present today was part of this Citizen Lab, and it is focused on uh, gaining more insight for people with rheumatoid arthritis in their own fatigue. 
So, just a disclaimer, of course, this was not just my project, we've done this together. And I would especially like to point out Lieke Hesink, who's also here today. Uh, we have run this project together um, with several researchers, but also uh, more than 40 people with rheumatoid arthritis who joined our team, and the rheumatologist to also uh, give us the clinical perspective in the project. So as I said, it has been a participatory approach to the research. Um, so people with arthritis, um, they have um, inflammations in their joints. And as a result of that, they often experience pain, swelling, and stiffness uh, on a daily basis. So through living with this condition on a daily basis, um, they gain a lot of experience and knowledge on their disease. And in this project, we try to combine this knowledge uh, with the scientific and methodological knowledge that we as researchers have um, to see whether we can improve the daily life of, uh, of this group. Uh, we also got, got input from a, a rheumatologist uh, to get a clinical insight as well in several parts of the project. And I would like to take you through the whole project uh, to show how we have, uh, have done this, uh, this collaboration. So the first step, uh, we needed to have a research topic. Um, so what we've done is we reached out to people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis through an online questionnaire. This was at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, about one, uh, about one and a half years ago. And basically what we did is we asked people with arthritis, uh, what topic would you like to see more research on and would you like to be part of that research? Uh, while the topic itself was uh, quite clear, uh, fatigue is the number one issue that people want more research on. It is a, a topic that is hardly discussed uh, with the professionals um, because most of the professionals also don't have a lot of tools to help people with this, uh, this issue. But it is a big uh, part um, that affects them in their daily lives. The fatigue is, um, yeah, we hear it a lot from many uh, people with chronic diseases. It's really a topic that needs more attention. And as we were reaching out to the community in this part, we also asked, okay, what kind of roles would you like to have in the research project? Um, how would you like to work together with us? And one of the things that people mentioned is that they would love to work with us, but uh, preferably from home. So partly, I think, because of the pandemic, but also because this is a group that is affected by fatigue, traveling somewhere does take more energy, um, and it's easier to just do it from behind the computer. So the next step was to co-design the research question. So we knew the topic was fatigue, but fatigue is very broad. So we asked people to join us in online sessions. And we talked about what does fatigue mean to you in your daily life? What do you run into? Um, what do you need more uh, knowledge on? And basically what they said, well, fatigue is really unpredictable. You don't know today how you will feel tomorrow. Um, you don't know today how you will feel this afternoon, so that often means that you either cannot go to work or you have to cancel on your social, uh, social appointments. Uh, so, yeah, in order to get more insight, we uh, created the research question, which factors are associated with experience fatigue in people with rheumatoid arthritis? So they would really, the people with arthritis really knew what they wanted to investigate and the researchers were able to make it into a research question. And then, of course, we had to decide, well, this is the research question. How are we going to research this? What data do we need to collect? Uh, how do we need to collect it? For how long do we need to collect this data? So again, we had some online meetings and we discussed all of these topics. Um, and well, again, it was a strong collaboration. Uh, people, of course, know what they think may affect their fatigue. So we included those factors. Uh, we did a literature study, uh, we talked to clinicians to also get that perspective. And in the end, we came to a list of uh, seven points that we would like to um, collect. So we collected data on fatigue, on pain, on stress, on physical and cognitive activity, on rest and on sleep. And this was done on a daily basis for 21 days. Um, as a researcher, we said, oh, well, let's collect data for half a year. That's great, a lot of data to play with. But people said, well, that doesn't fit in our daily lives. 21 days is really the max. And I think it's still uh, scientifically relevant to do it for 21 days. So we came to a compromise that way. We also discussed how to collect the data. So it was e quite quickly, uh, we knew it had to be on an online platform. Uh, so we discussed how the platform should look, uh, the, um, the functionalities, the privacy issues that came with that. 
uh, and we discussed that as well. So for instance, uh, people said, I would like to get a reminder for the daily questionnaire and we would like to get it in the evening. It's easier for us than in the mornings. And of course, uh, during these conversations, we ran into a lot of ethical issues. I guess the last presentation uh, showed some of them already. Uh, also questions on data management, uh, and we were able to discuss some of them um, with uh, support staff at the university, and some of them we discussed with uh, uh, the, the people with arthritis in the project, and we came to uh, some solutions there as well. So then we got to the part where we collected the data. Um, on the left, you see part of the, the daily survey. It's in Dutch, so it's not really legible, I guess, for most people here. Um, but the idea was that people got an, either a text or an email with a link to the survey. It took them one, maybe two minutes to complete every day the same question for 21 days um, to really get an idea of how their fatigue was and other, all the other factors that we found relevant uh, to collect. And on the right, um, you see a dashboard because in citizen science, of course, reciprocity is important. It's not just giving data to the researchers, but you yourself should benefit as well. So people could see their own data. Um, this is just one example of how it could look. It was the fatigue, the pain, stress, etc. You can see the progression over the 21 days. Um, and we've got some great feedback on this as well. Some people were really happy that they could take this data to either their um, occupational physician if they wanted to talk about the fatigue uh, with their own rheumatologist. Having some data to show uh, what the actual situation is is easier than just saying it and they feel strengthened by showing the data. And that is actually where we are now in the project. We have collected the data um, from about 50 to 55 people who have uh, filled out the questionnaires. And it's now up to us as researchers to do some statistical analyses. It was together decided that this is something that's more for the researchers. But of course, if we have the data, we will go back uh, to the whole team and we will discuss with them uh, how they interpret the data, what, what they see in the data, what they saw in their own personal data, if that was already helpful for them. Um, so we will have those discussions and then of course also discussions on how to move forward. Um, because I think this is just one step in a, in a, larger, uh, uh, a larger project because I think from this we can go much further to get more insight either in the fatigue or maybe um, move towards solutions to so, so really uh, impact people in their daily lives. And so I guess uh, we are at the take home message. I think it's no surprise for anyone here that uh, we think that citizen science is a really great approach in, in the health domain. Especially people with chronic conditions, they, um, they have to live with their condition on a daily basis. This also means uh, that they are constantly looking for ways to improve their own situation. So how can you get to the day easier, uh, have, less, uh, have less issues? Um, and I think that citizen science can really help this group. Um, because they are all trying to do something and I think citizen science can help them to do it in a methodological sound way. Many people say, okay, I want to investigate this, but I'm not sure how to do it. And I think we can help them uh, with that. Um, and also move uh, the scientific uh, knowledge a bit further as well at the same time. Uh, what we did notice is that Citizen Science for Health does need a lot of uh, attention for um, prerequisites. Uh, I think the previous speaker said a lot about the ethics already. Uh, we came across that as well. Um, also on data, on, on privacy, how open can you share health data. Um, so uh, especially when you talk about Citizen Science, transparency is great, but at the same time health data, uh, so privacy may be needed. Where do you find the balance? So we do have some posters this afternoon as well on, uh, on fair data and on, um, on the evaluation of citizen science. So if you want to discuss these topics further, please uh, visit us in a B2 poster session as well. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Ria, for this uh, fascinating presentation. Do we have questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Brigitte Schneidler from Vienna. 
Uh, this was very interesting, and I was wondering, it seems that you were very open in regard to your research and project design in the beginning, and I wondered how you dealt with this uh, regarding the project planning and the resources. Yes, well, we were very lucky at the start of this project. Um, we got funding and uh, there were no strings attached, so we could do the project that we wanted to do. So that was great. Um, and, and indeed, we didn't have a lot of strings, uh, so uh, people with arthritis were really open to come up with a topic that they wanted to work on. And, uh, and also the methodology that we wanted to use. Uh, we were really, yeah, we had the opportunities to do it the way that we wanted. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Um, you said something about evaluation. I was wondering, are you also evaluating how these participants experienced being part of a research or citizen science project? Yeah, that is something that we plan to do. Um, so at the end of all of the sessions, we always ask, OK, how did people um, experience the session of today? Uh, is there something that you would like to change in the whole project setup or in the roles that people have? Uh, but we do plan in the next few months to have really in-depth uh, evaluation, both on the process and on the outcomes uh, of the project. Because I think it's, it's important to learn and maybe improve for the future projects as well. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ria. Um, being conscious of time, we will need to move on to the next presentation. So thanks again, Ria. So now uh, we're coming to our last presentation for the session and we're going to hear Claudia Rubiati on building community-based early warning and response systems for climate change and health in Kenya. Very much looking forward to your presentation. We changed the, the, the presentation, it's, not, but it's, it's fine, no worries. No, no, it was approved already in the program. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I mean, it's fine, no worries. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, so thanks so much uh, for having me here today. Um, my name is Claudia Robiati. I'm a research associate at STEMA, and uh, in a few seconds I'll tell you what is STEMA. And I'm here today to, um, to tell you about a, a project we are having in Kenya to uh, support uh, communities on their journey to positive health uh, through the development of innovative tools. Um, okay, um, so STEMA is a not-for-profit organization and we work to innovate citizen science approaches and to allow communities, in, mainly in low resource settings, uh, to crowdsource data and information about their, uh, their health. And um, as you can see from the map, we have an extensive network of partners um, worldwide. And we work with our partners to, um, to uh, develop participatory uh, community research uh, projects. Um, and we mainly use a system thinking approach uh, and we pair it with advanced tools like computer vision and GIS. So we, as I said, we want to, um, to, to work with our partners in Kenya to develop some tools for community-led planetary health specifically. Uh, but, but why? Uh, because as you know, communities in low resource settings are the most impacted by large-scale planetary health um, issues like climate change and environmental changes, and these impacts are uh, usually not monitored by um, indicators that are collected uh, locally. And uh, also the community knowledge is overlooked, is not included in this kind of uh, information uh, collection. And therefore community members and local decision makers um, face a lack of data and they often uh, doesn't, uh, don't know uh, what kind of interventions they, they should promote. Um, therefore, we, we try to uh, support them to collect this kind of data in a sustainable way and we base our interventional resourcefulness, that's the capacity um, of a community to mobilize resources effectively to improve their health. 
So in Kenya, um, we are working with three amazing partners. Uh, there, there are three uh, community-based organizations. Uh, MAMA, PDO, and SWAP. They work uh, in, uh, within three different areas of, uh, of community health and in three different types of communities. So MAMA is mainly working with pastoralist communities, PDO with urban communities, and SWAP with rural fishing communities. And uh, we are performing at the moment a formative participatory research based on system thinking. Um, and we want to conceptualize uh, what uh, community positive health means for them. And um, we want to uh, know what are their priorities and how uh, we can measure them to develop a measurement framework to fed into the development of um, the crowdsource, crowdsourcing tools. Um, so preliminary findings, um, so, so far we worked with communities to identify uh, what uh, community positive health mean, uh, means for them and so we mainly used um, focus group discussions and cognitive mapping uh, methods. So here you can see uh, a, a tree that a community, um, we asked uh, a community to, to draw trees representing their, uh, um, their health. And so in the branches we have the, the building blocks of positive health and in the leaves the, the resources. And what we found out is that community positive health, community identity and community vision were uh, strictly interdependent with a complex network of natural resources and affected by their depletion. So also interesting was um, the fact that community positive health was described by all the communities as more pronounced in the past when natural resources were more available. And here I reported um, two, um, these two sentences. They are from our communities because I really would like to bring their voices here today. And so mainly they say that um, population was less and so resources were more available and there were uh, enough for everyone. So envir environmental pollution was less, uh, the community was healthier and there was enough rainfall to promote agricultural activities. And also that's very nice, um, uh, this one, this, the second sentence. Uh, so they valued trees a lot and took care of the environment. Rivers were many and clean back then. They knew the importance of taking care of the environment. So um, preliminary findings also indicated that one of the greatest planetary health challenges um, was of course climate change. Uh, mainly associated with droughts, floods, and natural resources uh, degradation, um, ampering the community's um, journey to positive health. Um, so here we have another um, sentence from, um, this is from a community again, and it hasn't rained this year, the seasons have changed. Some time back we used to plant crop once, and nowadays we have to do it twice. It is also difficult to predict the best month to get good harvest. You find that if you do it early enough, you, do not, you don't get good harvest, and if you do it late, you also do not get. So communities are really struggling um, to and, and try to fight uh, all these climate and the environmental changes. Um, so these preliminary results show um, that large-scale large planetary health challenges reach small-scale community systems of positive health. Um, our communities provided uh, information-rich insights on how their positive health system are impacted um, over recent uh, decades by local environmental and climate changes. And um, also planetary health concepts and challenges are shaping community positive health, community identity and community vision, uh, mainly by limiting their availability, sorry, the availability and the agency of, of communities over natural resources. Therefore, it is crucial to enable 
communities to crowdsource information about planetary health challenges in order to characterize and prioritize them for action. Next steps, um, so we have a lot of work to do. And first of all, we need to understand how the building blocks of positive community health can be measured and we want to develop a measurement framework. And therefore, we will proceed to co-design a set of tools to crowdsource data for priority setting and decision making. Um, also, we are developing a tool, a sort of how to do guide for replicating the research process we used. And finally, we will replicate the research process in other settings, always in low resource settings, to validate our findings. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, do we have questions? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Matthias. Um, thanks for very interesting insights from your project. Um, one question, when you talk about uh, decision making or the road ahead, uh, what level of decision making do you have in mind? Is it more the local decision makers or also national, regional level? Yeah. Good question. Thank you so much. Um, so we are exploring at the moment um, our network of stakeholder and potential users. Um, mainly we think we will for sure include local um, decision makers, so mainly at um, district level, but uh, we would like also to um, decide with them uh, how to proceed um, because uh, Kenya, in Kenya, the health system is devolved, so each uh, you know county has um, can uh, you know make their own decision about health. However, of course, national level it's um, ruling you know all the system. Therefore, we think that uh, we we would at the moment we think we will start by involving local decision makers, but with the aim to also engage national decision makers at a later stage. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, please. I, I was very struck by how much your respondents really understood the connections between uh, climate change and their health. And uh, I was wondering about the age of your respondents. I've been doing work with adolescents in, in Nepal on climate change and health. And, and for them, I think making the linkages was very difficult. But um, what were the age of these respondents that knew so so much about the connections? Yeah, so our responses, respondents were of different ages. So for this uh, stage of the research, we engaged community members and each community uh, decided what uh, were the relevant members to include. We also had young people there, so adolescents. And, but I can say that the, I mean, it was very clear to them that um, the, um, the impact on the environment of climate change was directly linked to their health. Mainly, you know, they are experiencing uh, terrible droughts there. And of course, you know, their uh, um, economy is based on um, livestock and farming. And therefore, it's quite clear, you know, when the climate is affecting your environment and therefore your health will be um, directly affected by lack of food, lack of water. So I think it was pretty clear to them, these kind of concepts. And we were kind of, um, I wouldn't say surprised, but I mean positively surprised to how clear it was, the, the connection, you know, in, uh, between these um, phenomena in, in, in their experience, yeah. Wonderful, then I would like to conclude the session now by thanking all of the speakers, um, all of you in the audience, and also thanks to our technical and room support. Thank you all very much for coming today.
Okay, we're trying again. Excellent. Thank you very much. Welcome to uh, this next session. I hope you all enjoyed the coffee. My name is Gita Krak. I'm from Aarhus University and Nordeco in Denmark, also a board member of EXA, so I will be chairing this session. We have a full schedule. We have six talks, so we will have to keep to uh, a quite tight schedule. Uh, it will be on biodiversity monitoring for planetary health. And it will go from plankton to megafauna uh, through a lot of different crea creative uh, processes and monitoring approaches from the UK to Brazil. So we have a lot to cover in this session. So I would like to welcome the first speaker, Michael Pocock. Uh, he will be talking about precision citizen science. Please welcome Michael. Thank you. Yes, so I'm going to be talking about this idea of precision citizen science, how we can get um, the right data from the right place at the right time in order to um, benefit both people, participants, and also biodiversity monitoring. So I'm part of the Biological Records Centre, which is based at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. We've got an over 50 year history in terms of supporting volunteer recording right across the tree of life in terms of a wide range of taxa. We support both, um, in partnership with others, both structured recording schemes, which lead to um, things like the, the graph shown there, which is biodiversity indicators used by the UK government um, for reporting, but also the more opportunistic re recording um, with certainly over 80,000 people getting involved per year. Of course, for environmental science overall, citizen science is really crucial, but I do want to acknowledge that actually it's, it's complementary to um, many of the data that we can get from professionals and also from sensors and remote sensing. But it's increasingly recognised as this really crucial part because it benefits the science, it provides us that monitoring data, it benefits people through things like nature connectedness and well-being, and we've got work which is um, going on at the moment, looking more at that, and also benefiting society in terms of leading to that action for nature. So when we think about particular citizen science, for many projects, certainly nature-based citizen science, you can take part wherever you choose, whether that's in an entirely opportunistic way um, or semi-structured recording, where there might be a protocol, but you can take part when and where you want. The challenge is that this leads to spatial variation, both at large scales, we get more records where more people live, but also at small scales, so we get more records at the edge of towns than um, further out in the countryside. We can begin to address this, or we can address this to a fair extent, um, through statistical analysis and careful, approach of, careful use of statistics. Um, but we can also begin to address this by using project design and things like this. So we end up with this conundrum in a sense, that all the records are valuable, they're great. But we don't simply need more records, we need more informative records. And that goes in places like the UK, where there's a lot of data already on a wide range of organisms. But I think we probably need this approach, this principle, even more strongly in the places which are which are more data poor. So one way of doing that that we've explored is using this targeted revisit, targeting revisits map. So it's a, a fairly simple way of doing this. Um, got an interactive map which shows people where records have been made. But the simple thing is, is, is that we can use for our trend analysis the data from the squares which are green, because they meet certain criteria, but not the ones which are pink. Now if people go and visit the squares which are pink, then we can we can use those data as well for our trend analysis. So it's a really simple but striking way in which people can go to a map and in real time get the up-to-date information on where records are going to be needed. You can see that we've uh, developed this for a, a range of different um, taxa. So that's quite a, quite a simple way of doing it, but we also tried to think about doing that even more intelligently. And that's through this project called Decide, where we've worked together with a wonderful multi multidisciplinary team of people. 
So drawing on that knowledge from environmental science and also data science, but bringing in expertise from social science um, and uh, earth observation and, and a range of different things, working with partners who are actually engaging with volunteers as well. The crucial thing about this is all the way through, as I'll go on to explain, co-design has been at the heart of the project. So when we think about this challenge, we typically um, will be thinking about observers making records. They then uh, submit their records, which goes into digital data, which can be used for modelling. Um, when we use the, uh, use the information from these models to feed back to the observers, that can allow them to undertake this spatial targeting of recording effort. That re depends on a few different things. One of the things is about understanding the motivations of those taking part. Um, the second thing, certainly for this audience, is thinking about how do we uh, develop those intelligent digital engagements, ways of connecting with people um, and doing that in a co-designed way. So firstly, we looked at the motivations of recorders and we did detailed um, deep dive interviews with representative recorders. And we found a few really key things. Um, and this is work led by Rachel Pateman and others at the University of York in particular. So the first thing is that people really do want to make their recording count. So this is often, this was uh, engaging with existing recorders. They want to make their recording count. So this suggests that they are willing to be nudged in some sort of way, to be encouraged to go to this location rather than that location. They also said that they've got a really high degree of trust. They don't actually need, in general, they don't need to understand all the ins and outs of why we're suggesting this is an important place and that isn't. They said, actually, if, if a trusted, trusted people are saying this, we're willing to trust you. And the final thing is, is that actually people do have a wide range of intrinsic motivations there, their sense of nature connectedness, that sense of place. Things like this. So that might be a resistance to being judged, uh, to being nudged um, in terms of they want to keep recording in the places they like recording. But the question then is, how do we go on to develop those tools for persuasive communication? So we developed it around these principles of we wanted these engagements to be relevant, to be accessible, to be actionable and to be appealing. And so we took these to heart as we were developing these digital tools. And we also, as I said, did this through this process of co-design. Now typically the way that I would go about designing or used to go about designing citizen science tools would be I would try and perfect the tool, make it absolutely perfect. I'd, I'd think with a few others on the team, make it perfect, put it out there, um, and then get really uh, disappointed if anyone gave any sort of criticism whatsoever. Instead, in this particular project, what we did was we used this fail fast um, approach, which is used uh, quite a lot in design. So we ended up with skeletons and prototypes, which we ran through with people and developed this rapid iterations of the tool. So we did that through walkthrough interviews, just one-on-one -on -one interviews with people saying, okay, use this tool. What do you find, um, what do you find useful or not? Um, using focus groups, feedback, um, and as I say, developing this. So over that first year of the project, we had about um, six or seven versions of the tool developed over um, almost fortnightly, three weekly periods. So what information do we actually give people? Well, it's based on model distributions of species. So we take a whole load of covariates and we um, use that to, uh, in conjunction with the citizen science biodiversity data, so in this case, 18 million records of butterfly and moth species. And so we come up with predicted dis distributions. So those are the key things that we really want as data users. But the uncertainty associated with those distributions gives us some sort of idea as to where people can go to make records to improve models. So we take these uncertainties, where are the models least confident, we look at where observations have been already made, those are the places where people already go, so we know that we're getting records from there already, and that gives us the map which shows us the place where it's best to collect new observations, or where people, it's most useful to nudge people to go to collect these observations. 
And so we developed this and we packaged this all up in this tool, which you can go and visit and you can play around with. So we were asking people, do you want to go to or do you want to discover new places to record wildlife? If you do, then explore this tool. It shows those places with the highest priority for recording, um, as shown in the colours. And then we were asking people to go through existing tools, existing apps to make their records. We weren't trying to create yet another recording app. So if people go to this, they can also click on pins. And so those pins give suggestions based on high priority areas, but also um, those which are publicly accessible. It's all updated in real time. Um, and people, if they click on those um, locations, they can get more information. Um, in terms of those particular locations. And the second thing that we did was we also, or one of the challenges with those, that tool is that people need to go back to the tool in order to engage with it. So we said, well, how can we actually give people information? And this is through um, emails. So we did this as an experiment where we gave people weekly data stories about their butterfly recording. Um, and we designed these different data stories to appeal to different motivations, things like competition and collaboration. We asked people to rate which they found most engaging. We also we made them all personal, but some of them were highly personalised. So using this sort of data science approaches to incorporate all the information, to give people really specific information about the impact of the records that they had made. Um, and we're looking at the data now, but we found that those were most impactful. So this idea of precision citizen science or adaptive sampling can have two impacts, I think, both in terms of how much people record and also where people record. And the great thing is, is that even some of the simulations that we've done, even if only 1% of records are redeployed in this way, there's still an improvement on model outputs. So it's really worthwhile doing this. And currently we're evaluating the impacts of this precision citizen science um, for recorders right now. So I think this has got great potential, not just for biodiversity, but for a wide range of environmental domains. Um, I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Michael? Please, please use the microphone. Just press the button. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so you're just collecting the evaluation data now, you don't, you don't have that yet. So I'm wondering in terms of the tool, are you allowing for ongoing adaptation as you get feedback? Is that a possibility and how will that work? Yeah, so we did that primarily um, during that first year of the project as we were developing the tool, allowing for that iteration. But yeah, of course, having that ongoing feedback um, is really important. I think the interesting thing is, because we went through that process of co-design and co-development in the first year of the project, actually the feedback we've had in the second year of the project hasn't really required any major changes to the tool, which I think really goes to show the benefit of, of bringing people in right at that early stage um, in that in-depth co-design process. Any other questions? Thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, uh, speech that you, you made. I have a question that was uh, triggered by the map with the green and, and uh, red dots. Actually, the, it may be that things were not recorded because people didn't go there. So how, how, do, you, how do you use this information? Because you, you are trying to find a, distrib a, a geographical distribution of something. But people may have just gone where it was easy to go, for example. And the real thing may be out of that range. How, how, do, you, how do you approach this uh, situation? Yeah, I think that sort of thing is particularly problematic or particularly challenging if, for example, you're looking at a single species. And so therefore it's really valuable to know where people have gone and not seen anything. The sorts of taxa that we were working on um, in that particular, the targeting revisits map, um, were taxa where if you went there, certainly at the right time of the year, 
you were highly likely to see at least one species. So you could, so you would be going there and, and it was unlikely that you would go there and see absolutely nothing. But this whole question of how we deal with um, uh, non-detections, how we deal with absences and how we collect absences, I think is really important because I think the motivation to submit a record versus the motivation to submit an absence is very, very different. So if we simply say, tell us whether you saw it or not, that still doesn't give us a really useful data set of presences and absences. Um, yeah, lots of challenges. Thank you very much, Michael. We will have to finish here. Thank you, Michael. Unfortunately, the next speaker could not be here, uh, but she has sent a recording of her presentation. So, Natalia Giladi Lopez about the citizen science program at the National Institute of the Atlantic Forest in Brazil. Please play the recording. Hi, my name is Natalia Guilardi Lopes. I am an associate professor at the Federal University of ABC in Sao Paulo State, Brazil, and I'm going to present the work entitled The Citizen Science Program at the National Institute of the Atlantic Forest, Brazil, results from 2019 to 2021 by me, André Barreto Lima, Andresa Guimarães, Juliana França, Eduardo Alexandrino, João Victor Lacerda, and Cássio Zoca Zandomenico. Brazil is a country with great geographic dimensions, and because of that, we present different phytogeographic formations. The Amazon forest, the Cerrado or Brazilian savanna, the semi-arid Caatinga, Pantanal, the Pampas, and the Atlantic forest. All these ecosystems shelter at least 20% of all species on the planet. The Atlantic forest extends from the southern to the northern region of the country in 17 Brazilian states near the coastal region under high influence of the humidity of the Atlantic Ocean. It is a biodiversity hotspot with more than 8,000 endemic species. It presents about 20,000 plant species, which corresponds to 5% of all known plant species in the world. All Europe, for example, presents about 12,500 plant species. Regarding the fauna, the Atlantic forest presents approximately 850 bird species, 370 amphibian species, 200 species of reptiles, 270 species of mammals, and 350 fish species. Since the 16th century, with the occupation of the country by the Portuguese, the Atlantic forest has been highly impacted by human activities. First, deforestation for the construction of houses, luxury furniture, and ships, as well as the extraction of dyes, which even almost led to the extinction of the tree that gave the country its name, Pau Brasil. Secondly, we can mention changes in land use with agriculture, for example, sugarcane and coffee, and livestock production. And finally, Urbanization with cities like São Paulo, which has more than 10 million inhabitants, or the favelas that are built in the middle of the Atlantic forest, fragmenting it. Due to this historical context, as we can see, there is a great overlap between the Brazilian population density and the distribution of the Atlantic forest. Today, only 12.4% of the original forest remains, as can be seen in darker green in this map. Citizen science in natural environments like the Atlantic Forest can foster learning about ecology and environmental issues, generate data on biodiversity and still promote interest and feeling for conservation. 
In 2010, the National Institute of the Atlantic Forest, INMA, was founded in the state of Espírito Santo, in the same place where the Biological Museum Professor Melo Leitão is located. The museum was founded by the naturalist Augusto Ruski in 1949 with the aim of inventoring and protecting the region's biodiversity. INMA is linked to the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovations. In 2019, the INMA Institutional Capacity Building Program was started, which awarded grants to young researchers to work at the Institute. As part of this program, the Citizen Science Program was started and for which I was invited to act as a volunteer supervisor. The objectives of the program are to produce knowledge about biodiversity and environmental quality in the mountainous region of the Spirit Santo State using a citizen science approach, to recruit and train citizen scientists to apply protocols related to different taxonomic groups, to organize a biodiversity database with the participation of program volunteers, and to evaluate individual learning outcomes of project participants. There were six projects in progress by 2021. Let's see them. The Bromeliads project, which aims to study the biodiversity associated with bromeliads. The project I know the reptiles from here. The project Did I see a banded bird? The project Backyard Singing, which aims to characterize the diversity of amphibians. The project Is the water of this river good? which aims to investigate the quality of the water of rivers. And finally, the project I saw a monkey in the bush. From 2019 to 2021, we obtained the following results. The records submitted for the projects covered 50 municipalities in Espírito Santo. As of December 2021, 1,052 people have collaborated in the roles of observer, citizen scientists, or validating experts. The observers are local residents, students, teachers of basic education, visitors, researchers, and IMA employees, and users of iNaturalist or the project's social networks. The specialists are volunteers registered in iNaturalist or invited by the project coordinators. 1,701 registers were submitted mainly on iNaturalist or by the donation of specimens to the Biological Museum, Professor Melo Leitão. The records are representative of 150 species and nine groups of aquatic invertebrates from the Atlantic Forest of Espírito Santo State. Regarding the degree of threat, most records are of least concerned species, but seven vulnerable, seven endangered, and five critically endangered species were also recorded. From the total, 61 species are endemic of the Atlantic Forest, and six are endemic to the Espírito Santo stage. The data show that INMA has the potential to be a multiplier of these projects for other regions of Brazil and South America, configuring itself as a pioneer and a reference center for other Brazilian regions. For this, efforts are being invested in the production of material to support the protocols, such as videos and booklets. Furthermore, there is a potential for expanding the program to other taxonomic groups, such as pollinating insects, plants, bats, road-killed fauna, butterflies, etc. Efforts are still needed to systematically survey the motivations and interests 
of the different audiences that collaborate in the projects so that strategies for continued engagement can be properly planned. Data accessibility needs to be improved as more than 30% of data is still restricted to project coordinators. Likewise, the assessment of the impacts of activities on the learning of citizen scientists still remains a gap. Another important aspect to be worked on is the type of citizen science developed by INMA. Currently, projects are of the contributory type in which citizen scientists primarily collaborate on data collection. However, we believe that other types of citizen science that include collaborators in more steps of the scientific process can bring the public even closer to the science produced at INMA. I would like to sincerely thank the organizing committee of EXA Conference 2022 for letting me present this video for you today. Thank you and thank to all citizen scientists who collaborated with the projects underway at INMA. Also, we would like to thank the Institutional Capacity Building Program of INMA, financed by the Brazilian National Council for Scientific and Technological Development. Bye! So, unfortunately, you're not able to ask her any questions, but we can see some overlaps already between here with considerations of data accessibility and participant motivation and so on, and of course, the biodiversity underneath it. But it's not all about the biodiversity. Uh, there are other aspects, as we know, in citizen science. So, now we're going from monitoring what is already there to monitoring that it's something that is coming back. So, next speaker is Emu Felicitas Ostaman Oyashi, more or less, sorry, um, speaking about opportunities and challenges of citizen science for monitoring a recolonizing mega herbivore. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. And yes, I do have a very long and difficult name. It's Miyashita, it's Japanese. and. It hardly ever happens that somebody can pronounce it correctly, so it's all good. <laughs> um, yes, so I will start directly. Um, we are talking about the moose, as you saw in the first slides, and I don't know how many people know this, but uh, we have moose in Germany again, and especially Brandenburg, uh, which is also the target region of this study, has quite a few sightings uh, since the 2010s. So, um, there are several situations like this, like the wolf and uh, a lot of species coming back to a country. And then it is important to develop like management for these species. And for that, the first step is to monitor these species. And um, we thought citizen science could be a potential, potential solution um, because of its cost efficiencyness and also um, because moose is a big animal and has quite a few remarkable um, body parts which is easy also for non-experts to identify. And we had four um, questions we wanted to answer through this research. The first one was um, how much um, different citizen science tools um, collected moose data. The second ones were if based on the citizen science data, we could see any um, temporal patterns and also spatial patterns comparing it with habitat suitability models. And finally, which is very important for citizen science, um, how can we improve the base of data collection looking at the motivation side of the participants? And you can follow me up. I've made the section which we are talking about. So to start off with, um, we compared three approaches. The first one is a moose sighting form, which is based on email or mailing format. So this is analog. Um, it has been done at the Landeskompetenz Zentrum Forst Eberswalde since 2013. Um, the second one is the app iMamalia. This was um, one application which was developed in um, an EU project and we decided to apply this for the time um, in our project region. And the third one is a website 
um, which we launched with a student group at the University of LM Ludwig Maximilian University München <laughs> and uh, the WWF Germany. So, in our project time, which was from 2013, where the email format started, to 2021, um, this was the result of the data collection, to be fair, <laughs> for the app and for the website. Um, we have to say they only had a running time for three months, plus this time actually really collided with the COVID, so they, it was not possible to do like the advertisement which was be needed to make these um, visible to the participants. So at the end, we decided to use the, the first method for further analysis. And first, the temporal patterns. Um, these data um, gathered through this format was um, identified by the Skype criteria. This is a criteria which was actually developed for the Alpine moose sighting. And as you can see here, um, the category C1 is a clear evidence, so it's like a direct picture video um, of the species itself, and a carcass. And C2 is confirmed hint, which means, for example, if it is a lynx or a wolf or a predatory um, animal, it would be like the prey species or um, spur, which has been identified and confirmed by experts. And C3 is a sighting which, is, which could not be confirmed to be that animal. And um, there's also a criteria for not being, assessment not being possible and face false reports. And these are the results um, for the moose sightings in Berlin Brandenburg from 2013 to 2021. And um, so the dark blue and the green are the confirmed results and the light blue and the red are the ones which are not confirmed but um, here we can see a general trend of increase in sightings um, until 2020 to 2021. Um, there could also be other reasons but this is also the COVID time so it could also have been that not many people had the chance to go out. And um, we are also able to see some seasonal patterns for these years. And for this, we only use the um, identified C1 and C2 sightings. And there was a significant increase in the um, sightings in September and August, which, is, which also coincides with the rotting season um, of the moose. And to the spatial patterns, um, the analysis was done by one of our project partners at the Humboldt University of Berlin. And um, we developed this model using occurrence data of the moose, environmental factors, like if it's forest land or open land, anthropogenic factors such as streets. And after making the habitat suitability map, Using um, circuit scape, we also calculated the resistance, which is like the inverse of the habitat suitability, and made a landscape connectivity map. And we compared these factors to the siting. Um, so first, this is the habitat suitability map. And um, on the red one is the moose sighting through citizen science method, and the purple one is for the background. And here you can see that um, there was a difference, so it, the sightings occurred in habitats which are a bit more suitable, but this was not a very big significance. For the connectivity, there was also not a big difference uh, observed, but um, one thing which we looked at and which kind of was logical was the distance to the roads that the sightings of the citizen science methods were closer to the roads in the background, uh, which kind of makes sense because this is where the people go and take pictures. And um, last not least, we also had a survey. This was conducted also with the students of the LMU. Um, we asked uh, citizens about the motivation um, to take part in this project. And which was really nice is that there's a high willingness to report species. So especially in this case, moose. So 93% of the people answered they would if 
they saw a moose they would report it, of course. And uh, we also presented the three methods we presented before. And here, 84% actually preferred the web page, um, which is also because this was the option where the participants did not necessarily have to, they could choose if they wanted to give um, their own privacy data or not. And also one thing to back this up is that the time for reporting each of the participants were willing to give were um, three minutes. So 43% of participants were not willing to do the sighting if it took more than three minutes. And this is probably one thing a scientist or as we as scientists have to take into consideration when designing such projects. So I would like to go to the conclusion. Um, the first point is, um, as is often talked about, the data quality in citizen science projects, but if you have a good quality standards, this data can be applied for scientific research. And um, for citing is in Brandenburg, in our case study, we could also identify seasonal and yearly trends just based on this citizen science data. And, um, but we have to be careful because there is a tendency that there is a spatial data because of the opportunistic characteristic of the data gathering. And um, also people are generally interested and also willing to contribute only if it doesn't take too much time. And um, last not least, also um, to the point that the app and the website was not successful, um, we recommend PR activities to make the tools visible and accessible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Kate. Thank you, that was absolutely fascinating. Can you tell me more about the students that you surveyed um, for whether they preferred the app or the website? Were they biology or ecology students or just any old student? Because that might have influenced your results. Um, yes, thank you very much. And um, sorry for not clarifying the point. Um, we conducted the survey with a student group and, um, but also um, the people we asked were the um, group the, in our research institution, which is an agriculture and environmental research institution, and their families also, and within the university. And, um, but that was more like a, um, commercial, so it was not in the ecology reason, but more sociological study. So it was a little bit balanced, but it's true that there is a certain bias in the data. So probably if you would have like a very average data, it might be that people are less willing, yes. Any other questions? Um, it's a slightly flippant question, but um, have you also been monitoring the moose flies? Moose, moose? Mo moose flies. Um, no, <laughs> no, we have not no. been monitoring moose flies. Um, one thing which is not actually related to this, but which I got to know, um, is um, there has not been a reproduction or only one reproduction recorded in Germany of moose, and um, this is and the reason is that it is very challenging because of ticks. So I heard that there's a very high mortality rate of young moose due to ticks, but I haven't looked at the flies. I have a question as well then. So you're writing, you, there's an estimated 6 to 20 moose running around in Germany. Has this improved the estimate or...? Um, Actually, um, there was, the, as to say, there was a peak in the 2018, and then there was a drop. And at the moment, it is actually difficult for any animal to cross the Polish and German border because of the ISP zone, so the African swine fever um, fence. And for this year, we haven't had any moose sightings yet. So this is very dramatic, the effect of the fence. 
Yeah, sounds very sad. So is there a way of recognizing moose? Um, well, the size is one big thing and also the... Well, the individuals, I'm thinking, can you, because there was a nice map with various, you know, sightings and kind of thinking, well, every, all of them in an area could be the same one. Yes, actually, um, there were like three sightings through the web page and we know it's the same moose because it was in like two or three consequence days and, and we could kind of track the movement or we could think, we cannot prove it, but we could think of it. Um, we actually have one celebrity moose near Berlin, um, Moose Bird, who is now residing with a herd of cows because he cannot find a partner. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Right, so from a very specific monitoring uh, project of one particular species to monitoring a diversity and through a lot of different schemes, Benoit Fontaine is going to uh, talk to us about citizen science to mitigate the biodiversity crisis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to try to illustrate uh, through uh, our the Vigi Nature program, which is a larger citizen science uh, biodiversity monitoring uh, scheme in the museum in Paris. I will try to illustrate how citizen science can help to, to mitigate the biodiversity crisis. So we, we all know that uh, there is a biodiversity crisis and we know the causes, uh, habitat changes, global warming, over-exploitation. And as a biodiversity uh, scientist, uh, we, there is a growing co concern, so what, what can we do? We can assess the responses of uh, biodiversity to these changes and uh, suggest uh, efficient solutions. And this is pretty much done in the IPBS uh, report. We know the causes, we know what we should do to change it. We can assess the efficiency of uh, mitigation me measures. We can uh, try and raise awareness in the society. And we can try and impulse uh, behavior, behavior, behavioral changes among uh, citizens. So in this uh, framework, where do citizen science fit? And I will, uh, as I said, I will try to, ex to give some examples of what can we do with citizen science to, to help fight against uh, this crisis. So the Vigi Nature program, you probably, some of you have already seen this uh, slide. Uh, it's a set of uh, around 20 uh, biodiversity monitoring schemes, uh, which goes from uh, plants to mammals, and uh, which, but which are better uh, described by the different types of uh, publics. So we have uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, how does it work? I'm not sure how it works. Anyway, we have uh, seven um, uh, programs dedicated to naturalists. So the naturalists, they already know uh, the, the, um, the taxa they are uh, following, they are monitoring. Uh, we have uh, another set of uh, schemes which are dedicated to the general public, meaning that uh, they are conceived, they are set up for people who don't know in advance the, the taxa they are, they are monitoring. So it means that there are dedicated protocols for these, uh, these schemes. And then we have um, programs for school children, for farmers, and for uh, green space managers. Uh, I'm stuck. Okay. No. It should move, no? doesn't. So you can enjoy the vision at your schemes. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, back. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, and all these uh, observatories have uh, shared characteristics. Uh, they, they deal with common species. We are not uh, monitoring rare... Thank you. We are not uh, monitoring uh, rare species like, uh, like the, the moose we were just... Uh, we, we just heard about. Uh, we are monitoring uh, sparrows and uh, daisy flowers and uh, ladybugs. Uh, so that means that uh, these are, well, yeah, species which are everywhere. We rely on the, on the data collection by, by a large number of participants. And most important, we, we, need, uh, we use uh, standardized protocols, meaning that the data are co always collected in the same way. And so the data are comparable over, the, over space and time. And of course, the, the protocols are different if we are uh, talking with the general public or the naturalist or the school children. And there are three axes. This uh, program was first uh, set up for research, but then they are used for expertise and for education. And all three axes can be used for the, the, to help uh, fight the, the biodiversity cri crisis. So the, the most uh, basic one and the most uh, easy to understand is that the, these uh, schemes help to monitor the, the, um, the impact of uh, global change to, on biodiversity. So for, for instance, on, on this one, you have uh, data collected by skilled uh, botanists and they, they, they can, uh, with this data, they are able to follow, to track the mean temperature uh, preference of uh, annual plant communities over the year. So you see that this uh, temperature preference is rising, uh, illustrating the fact that uh, plants try to adapt to, to global warming. And we can also, with this data, we can also uh, assess the efficiency of uh, conservation actions. These, uh, these uh, graphs show the, the responses of uh, bird communities to uh, protection. So you see that the trend is uh, globally uh, decreasing in unprotected area, whereas uh, it's increasing in protected areas, which means that, uh, well, these protected areas have some kind of uh, efficiency. And going from uh, uh, conservation measures to management practices, in this, uh, this example is uh, taken from the Observatoire Agricole de la Biodiversité, where farmers record the biodiversity in their farms, following the, some protocols. And uh, you have here three uh, states of uh, management with a high uh, pesticides and fertilizer uh, use in uh, dark uh, red medium use and low use. And you see that the trends for butterflies and solitary bees are different and they are more decreasing when, when there is a high fertilization. And these data are, I mean, these uh, results come from data collected by the farmers. Um, so that was research, and now we can talk about expertise. So every year we publish some kind of barometer of the, the the state of uh, bird communities. Uh, so we publish the, the figures every year, and it's the, the, the bird indicator. Probably some of you heard the, the brilliant talk of, uh, from uh, Claire Burnell, Burnell yesterday, and she talked about the efficiency of the publication of these, uh, these uh, figures. And the efficiency is probably not where we, as, as she explained, uh, it doesn't really change the politics directly, but it has an immense impact on spreading the words about the fate of biodiversity all over, uh, all over France. So for, uh, uh, for this, uh, this uh, in 2018, we, re we made a press release and we had a huge uh, buzz in the, in the media. And last thing, uh, about uh, education. Uh, this is an example from this people where uh, people, participants, have to take pictures of uh, insects and flower, and they, they have to identify the insect following an online key. And you see that uh, the more they participate on the, the, the x-axis, 
uh, the more they are efficient in uh, identification. So the fact that uh, participating in these, uh, in these uh, programs uh, raised the knowledge of uh, participants on biodiversity. And uh, last example, here we are talking about uh, general public counting uh, butterflies in their gardens. And so they record the, the number of uh, butterflies they have in their gardens, but they also record which uh, types of uh, flowers they have in the gardens and what is their use of pesticide. And what is very interesting is that you see that the more they participate, the more they change the, the way they manage their garden. The, um, the, they increase the, the number of uh, nectar offering flowers in the gardens and they decrease their use of pesticide. When you, when you start counting uh, butterflies in your garden, you, you put pesticides. After a few years, you put less pesticides. So the, it was, we did not uh, set this, uh, this scheme for this purpose, but we were very happy to see that we had this effect. So to conclude, uh, there is a scientific consensus about the, the environmental cr uh, crisis. And, uh, well, I am a biologist, but I think that the, the need for research is mostly now in human and so social science to remove the barriers to, to transition. The, the ecological uh, di diagnostic is done. And in this context, uh, citizen science are uh, a very important tool, I think, uh, as a, a subject of research for the warning about the, the crisis, as a transformative tool, and also as a mean of uh, direct action, because we need to act now. I thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Slightly scary. We know kind of what's going on. We know what needs to be done. But we're not quite doing it, are we? Have we got any questions? Hello. Um, our UK Prime Minister, who's only been in post about a month, has said that she wants lots more research on the environment, presumably as a stalling tactic before taking any action. So how can we push back against that? I'm not sure how we can do, but... Uh, well, as I just said, the... the there is no more need to, 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 to say, okay, this, uh, using pesticides is bad for bio biodiversity, we know that. And uh, I'm sure, well, it's not me, I mean, it's documented that the, the, the agro-industry uh, fir firms, they, they push for research on uh, the, the, the impact of pesticide or things like that, because when, until we have the, the result, we don't do anything. So I think we, we have to, as a community, to say, okay, stop doing this. Now we, we have to use our brain, our research to, to, to act, to, to find solutions. We know the problem. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really great, all the stuff that you're doing. Um, and I think your final point about action is great and the work that you presented about the butterfly the people who did long-term butterfly monitoring using less pesticides is brilliant a scientist would look at that and go aha so what you're doing is you're um, sampling a more and more biased subset of gardens or the countryside or whatever what's your vision for accounting for that yeah, we are very conscious. Uh, we know that uh, we, uh, our sample is completely biased because the, the people who count butterflies, they are already uh, interested in butterflies. And in fact, we, we had uh, three categories of uh, pesticide use in our survey. It was a uh, high pesticide use, well, often, sometimes, and never. And we wanted to do the three classes. And in fact, we had almost uh, less than 5% of the respondents said they, they used the uh, high percentage of pesticides. So yes, of course it's biased, but uh, we have to start somewhere. And uh, this is where I think the fact that we have several programs uh, dedicated to school children, it's a less biased, uh, probably unbiased uh, in this uh, respect, uh, 
unbiased uh, sample, so probably there is something to do with the, the school children. And this is why we try to, to develop these, uh, this program in schools. Thank you. Uh, very interesting, the presentation. I, I understood that you found a close connection between participating in citizen science and environmental education. And I wanted to know whether the projects did some particular activities related to environmental education uh, that justified the, the, the impact that you found, or it was just by participating uh, that, that you found that impact? Uh, for this, uh, this uh, project with those people, the, the aim of the, the project is to take pictures on, uh, of uh, insects on plants to study uh, insect plant uh, relationships. So it was not, uh, there was no project of, uh, it was not an educative project, but it was conceived in a way that people, uh, for instance, uh, we, w there is a, um, a lot of things about uh, in artificial intelligence and uh, we can use the artificial intelligence to, to give the names of the insects which are, which are uh, uh, take, uh, photographed. And we decided not to do so because we thought it was more interesting for the participants to, to identify themselves, the, the, the insects. So maybe you can say, okay, this is a, we, we did that because we wanted to, to have an, an impact on education. But the, the project is not an educative project, it's a research project with, with an educative aim. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Hello. And so now from having talked about a lot of living organisms, which we all love and adore, to something a bit more <clears throat> dramatic dead animals, uh, roadkill. So please, Daniel Derla will come and tell us about seven years of Project Roadkill. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, hello to everyone. Also, hello to everyone who is watching um, online uh, from home. Hi, mom. Um, I would like um, to talk um, today about um, our uh, project Roadkill that um, lasts for uh, seven years now already. Um, and I would like to um, yeah, present it as a kind of uh, yeah, a showcase on how to yeah, uh, collaborate with other NGOs, with, with uh, museums, for example, to improve amphibian conservation uh, in, in Austria as, as one contribution to planetary health. Um, just a little bit of background information. Um, amphibians um, are endangered worldwide, as I'm sure most of you will know. Um, there are diseases that are killing um, amphibians, there are invasive species, um, we have uh, habitat, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Um, and in Austria, the situation is not really better. Um, we have uh, 20 amphibian species uh, in Austria and all of them are protected by law. And the main issue in Austria is uh, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. And especially um, when you think of roads, they really fragment the landscape. And um, for amphibian species, uh, when they are migrating to their spawning sites um, in early spring, um, this can be uh, yeah, a deadly trap. In uh, Project Roadkill, um, we are collecting data together with citizen scientists on roadkill vertebrates um, in Austria since 2014. Why do we do that? Because we only have statistics for huntable wildlife uh, that is killed on Austrian roads. We have no clue how many reptiles, amphibians, small mammals such as hedgehogs or also may many bird species are dying on Austrian roads and if this has an effect on their populations. So um, we are collecting this data together with citizen scientists who um, report roadkills they find on their daily routes um, to get an overview of the roadkill situation in Austria. And we also want to identify so-called roadkill hotspots, so areas of roads where roadkills happen frequently. And uh, our vision is to mitigate these hotspots together with NGOs and also public authorities. And uh, before I go to the next slide, here's a trigger warning. The next pictures are not so nice, so you might want to close your eyes if you're a more sensitive person. 
So these are roadkill reports we usually get. Um, and um, you already see by the names, these are three different species. But if you are not an herpetologist, you might think, OK, these are three frogs, more or less, not more. Um, so this is also why we said, OK, we need to cooperate with the Austrian um, Herpetological Society and also the Natural History Museum that help us to identify the correct species, because this is really crucial. Um, for, for um, yeah, data interpretation, also for analysis then. Um, and I just um, switch over to the next slide so you can open your eyes again. Um, after um, we did these um, collaborations, these cooperations with these two institutions, we were able to um, do our first publication um, on amphibian and also reptile road kills on tertiary road roads. Because what we saw in the reports of our citizen scientists was that um, um, road kills on amphibian and reptile species are also happening on tertiary roads, but they have not been considered in um, studies as far as we knew of, um, because they were only focusing on primary and secondary roads. And tertiary roads are, for example, bike paths or agricultural roads. Um, so we um, tested a an, an citizen science approach um, by um, um, yeah, monitoring a 97.5 kilometer um, long stretch of road along uh, Lake Neusiedl in the east of Austria um, for two seasons. And we collected um, around 180 roadkill amphibian species. And we then um, also saw, uh, we also looked at the land cover classing um, surrounding these amphibian roadkill reports using open data that was available um, here, Corinne data. And what we saw is that tertiary roads can play an important role um, for assessing amphibian road kills. Um, and this um, has uh, been neglected before. And um, so we thought, OK, this, this is a very important finding also to consider tertiary roads when, uh, when, when protecting uh, amphibian species. Um, what we also um, did then uh, was to cooperate um, with, with two NGOs because, as I earlier said, one of the goals of Project Roadkill is to mitigate hotspots in cooperation together with NGOs and public authorities. So um, we cooperate um, now with um, Naturschutzbund uh, Lower Austria and with uh, AGE Naturschutz, which is an NGO in Carinthia, or in the south of Austria. Um, both of them um, are coordinating uh, amphibian migration routes in uh, their provinces. And by coordinating, I mean they put up um, these temporary um, um, amphibian fences you can see on this picture. They are um, installed along the road. Amphibians cannot cross the road, but uh, they are steered into these buckets that you can see here. And then people are uh, taking the volunteers are taking these buckets and carrying the amphibians over the road so they are not road killed. Um, and uh, both of these NGOs are now using the data from our project Roadkill to identify uh, potential new migration routes um, or hotspots so they um, can protect amphibian species there. Um, and through this cooperation, we also um, talked with them and we asked them, hey, um, when do you know that the amphibians start to migrate in early spring? Because um, this um, point of time always varies from year to year. And they said, yeah, we do have some very, very experienced volunteers, and they estimate when this uh, time of year has come. So we said, OK, there must be an easier way. Um, and this is uh, what we did in the second uh, publication um, on amphibian spring migration. Uh, we um, just saw, OK, these temporary mitigation measures along roads need to be implemented exactly at the right time, too early, and uh, you waste the time of the volunteers. They are standing outside in the cold, waiting for any amphibians to come, and no amphibian comes. Um, or if you are too late, then the roadkill has already happened. Um, and since the amphibian spring migration varies from year to year, we wanted to know, is there an easy way? And we combined the data of four different citizen science projects coming from four different uh, institutions, from the Natural History Museum, for the Natur from the Naturschutzbund, um, from the um, Central Agency for Meteorology in Austria, and also from our project, um, to find out if plant phenology events, so sprouting or blossoming of plants, can predict amphibian spring migration, because both are affected by the same, uh, or influenced by the same factors. And uh, what we found uh, was, yes, you can uh, 
predict amphibian migration by looking at widespread plants in Austria. For example, if you look at the blossoming of um, goat willow and apricot, they can um, predict the start uh, of the migration for common frogs. So you know um, when apricot is um, uh, blossoming, you have three days to implement um, mitigation measures. So this is uh, really great. We are now evaluating if this data is also um, true uh, in the upcoming years. But it, um, yeah, it really is a help for many of these NGOs. Um, and another uh, uh, publication we did uh, at the end of um, last year was um, that we um, saw um, at the early um, stages of the pandemic, uh, early 2020, um, when Austria went through the first of, I don't know, seven lockdowns, um, that the reports, the roadkill reports, dropped uh, dramatically. You can see um, in uh, the, the black dashed line is um, the more or less the, the, the mean number of um, amphibian roadkill reports um, in the years before, and in red, um, the red line is uh, yeah the ro amphibian roadkill reports from 2020, and um, the red area or pink area is the area of the was the time from the first lockdown in Austria. Um, and we wanted to know, are really fewer uh, road kills happening, or is it because our citizen scientists were staying at home and could not report any road kills? So we asked our citizen scientists, were, uh, were you staying at home, or did you just um, did not see any uh, road kills when you were traveling? And um, it revealed that uh, indeed fewer road kills were happening. This was also in line with the finding that um, fewer cars were um, on the roads uh, during that time. Um, and uh, what we also saw that especially amphibian road kills uh, were happening less since the first uh, lockdown fell into the period of amphibian spring migration. So um, this was at least one positive note on this lockdown. And to sum it all up, um, you can see that corporations are really, really important if, uh, and what were really important for Project Roadkill. On the one hand, to ensure data quality, think about the cooperation uh, with the Hepatological Society and also with the museum, um, so we can verify the data on our roadkill amphibians, and also to contribute then to the conservation measures when you think about the cooperation with the NGOs. And you don't need to be a check of all trades if you are coordinating a citizen science project. Working together with the um, right partners helps a lot to create an impact. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and if you drive home, please drive safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, I have some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, so this roadkill mortality, how important is that actually, like in terms of mortality for amphibians? This, uh, especially for, for explosive breeders like um, common toads, for example, that um, migrate all at the same time to their spawning sites, it's really, really uh, an important factor because um, they are killed by the thousands if there are no protection measures along these routes. So this can be a very, very massive um, um, problem for many amphibian species, especially now since the populations of amphibian species are dropping worldwide. Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I wonder uh, which people are actually participating in your project. Is it uh, people already engaged in uh, conservation or also uh, yeah. Yeah, people from other areas? Yeah, the, they, they are really, really um, different groups of people participating in the project. We have, of course, the ones that are already active in uh, conservation measures uh, that uh, really volunteer for the NGOs that I mentioned before, but we also um, have people that just want to protect animals, that um, um, maybe even um, road killed an animal before themselves and really uh, felt really bad about it uh, and want to do something against it. Uh, but we also have um, yeah, groups of, um, I don't know, um, photographers that specialize on uh, photographing road-killed animals in a very aesthetic way, I would say. Um, 
it's really strange. We didn't know that these groups of people exist, but they are really helping um, to increase also the data quality of the um, project because they really make great pictures. You can Id easily identify the species, and this is a very important factor if you um, want to increase the data quality of the project. Thank you also for the interesting uh, lecture. I wonder if the citizens participating into the, the assessment into the project have decided to do things about, such as blocking roads uh, for cars or uh, building new cross paths for yeah. toads and, and, mm -hmm. and critters. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. It's a very good question. Um, no, um, so far, um, no people were blocking the roads um, because of uh, our uh, project Roadkill. But they approach us um, and they say, hey, you are coordinating the project Roadkill. Do something about it. Now, we are at a university. This is uh, usually not what we are doing. Um, this is also why we said, okay, we want to partner up with public authorities, with NGOs, because they um, have the means um, to do something about it. Um, and um, that's also why I said these cooperations um, are really, really important. And uh, I, as a researcher at the university, I have so many things to do. I cannot um, do this um, uh, on top as well. So this is why these cooperations are very, very important. And yeah, yeah. Hi, um, thank you. Um, I really like that, what you said about the partnerships and the collaborations, and I like that the Citizen Science Project, it, it, it has an action sort of orientation, or it's even an action orientation that sort of led to the Citizen Science Project. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how those partnerships were formed and mm -hmm. how they're maintained. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they were formed very easily. We just saw the problem and um, thought about, uh, okay, who can really do something about this? Um, and then we approached um, these organizations. I also have to say um, that um, both my colleague Florian and me, uh, we are not only active in this um, project Roadkill, but we are also coordinating the Austrian citizen science platform Österreich Forscht. And from this area of work, we are already in uh, contact with many NGOs, museums, etc. And we specifically knew, okay, uh, we have to approach this person um, to, to form this partnership. Um, but also if we approach new people, um, uh, new organizations about this issue, they are usually quite open and if it is into, in their power to do something um, or if they um, are, uh, have the, the resources to cooperate on a certain area, then they are usually open for that. So, um, so far we didn't have any uh, problems with, uh, for example, NGOs or museums um, in partnering up. Excellent. Thank you very much, Daniel. You're welcome. Thank you. And now for the final talk in this session, we go from uh, animals dependent on water to little planktonic things, also very dependent on water. So Celine Lire is uh, going to tell us all about objective plankton. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Céline Lire. I'm the scientific director at Océanopolis in France, in Brest, exactly, and also responsible of the citizen science program Objective Plankton. Oops, okay. <laughs> for more than 30 years, this Oceanopolis, a national center for scientific culture dedicated to the ocean, has been a place for sharing knowledge resulting from oceanographic research and, oh, sorry, and developing dialogue between scientists and the public. Oceanopolis raises awareness of all audiences for mediation activities and education to make responsible and committed citizens for the ocean. The western part of Britain has the largest concentration of research organizations, higher education institutions and companies in the field of marine science and, it, and technology. Oceanopolis was born from this concentration and works daily with them to strengthen the link between science and society. 
A few years ago, about five years, Osanopolis developed a citizen science program dedicated to coastal plankton. These microorganisms are essential to the functioning of our marine ecosystems. It accounts for more than 95% of the marine biomass and represents an incredible biodiversity composed by various virus, bacteria, microscopic algae, uh, reproductive cells, fish eggs, and larvae. Plankton plays a vital role in the functioning of the ocean and the balance of our planet. Phytoplankton produce more than 50% of the oxygen in the air we breathe, just like forests, and they contribute to climate regulation. It is also the basis of all marine food chains. Today, this planktonic biodiversity is undergoing a major erosion like all life on Earth. Coastal areas are subject to anthropogenic impacts such as pollution, invasive species, overexploitation, and of course, climate change. One of the major questions scientists are asking is whether this erosion of biodiversity can have consequences for the functioning of marine ecosystem and the services they provide to the society. To answer this question, scientists have to take samples simultaneously, simultaneously sorry, from different locations within the same, uh, the same location, the same ecosystem. But they do not have enough research vessel to do this. We exchanged with scientists to find a solution and objective plankton was born. The methodology defined consists in collect on the same day, at the same time, at several points. And instead of research vessels, sea users, such as yachtsmen, fishermen, shell fisher farmers of live worlds, collect the seawater and plankton samples. In short, objective plankton is free research topics supported by four scientific organizations. Free study site in Brittany, the Bay of Brest, Concarneau, and Lorient. Free collection, collection sessions at sea per year and per site. 29 boats, one per sampling station, and free scientific mediation structure, one per site. The research topic of the citizen science program aimed to understand the mechanism underlying the small scale spatial viability of plankton in different areas. That is to say, why one species and, one and not another is present at a certain place and time of the year. The objective is to obtain a synoptic view of their distribution linked to the plankton composition. The first research topic aims to define spatial and temporal viability in phytoplankton communities in the Bay of Brest and to study the link with uh, environmental parameters such as temperature, turbidity, salinity and nutrient concentration. This research topic is the subject of a doctoral thesis at the European Institute for Marine Study of the University of Bretagne Occidentale. The second research topic consists on the study of PICO and nano-phytoplankton community. Analyses are made by Yves and they focus on toxic microscopic algae a real health problem along the French coast. And the third topic concerns the study of zooplankton, in particular ichthyoplankton, like fish, eggs, and larvae. The team of the National Museum of Natural History and of Sorbonne University, located at the Concarneau uh, Marine Station, was thus able to produce the first reference collection of ichthyoplankton for the Bay of Biscay and the Channel. Alongside scientific bodies, there are three scientific mediation structures involving objective plankton, one per site. They represent the bridge between scientists 
and see users. They organize the collection sessions, choice the boats, deliver the materials, the plankton net, the disc of Seki, the sampling bottles, all the material to collect data. A total of 29 boats participate in each session at the three sites. It is very important to keep the sea users community mobilized all year round. The, the, uh, coll the, the, session collection, the collection sessions sorry, are in May, in June, and in September. We must keep the link between the participants to continue to interest them, to value them in their action commitment in objective plankton. For example, we present the scientific result in each site each year, followed by a convivial moment with uh, wine, beer, and food. And uh, we create tools uh, to give a sense of belonging to the citizen science program, like objective plankton flag, flags for the boats. Transmission and sharing are the cornerstones of the citizen science program to develop intergenerational link we propose to master students in marine biology to embark on with sea users. We ensure that knowledge and skill are shared among all stakeholders. During the collection session, it's an opportunity to raise awareness of plankton and essential role in the ocean among as many people as possible. The public can observe the plankton of the day with the binoculars and microscope Scientists are present and prepare their sampling for lab analysis. Uh, they take time to discuss with the public and also, of course, with the sea users. The ecosystem of objective plankton is composed of different stakeholders that interact with each other. Uh, scientific organizations, center of scientific culture, and sea users. Such a program could not be possible without fundings. Thanks to the Foundation, Foundation de France and the Laboratoire Brossier, a private company. They have been with us for more than three years now. Objective Plankton is based on a collaborative approach between science and society. It aims for a very long-term monitoring of planktonic communities in coastal ecosystems to study their ecological uh, functioning. Understanding the mechanism that control the dynamics of planktonic biodiversity is essential for predicting and anticipating their responses to global changes and the impacts on ecosystem services. Objective plankton contribute to predict changes in coastal ecosystems that feed an economy linked to tourism, aquaculture, and fishing. Today, other sites are very interested in this unique citizen science program. One of our objectives is to foster the exchange of knowledge and experiences. We are currently collaborating with universities in Quebec and with the Musée du Fjord, a scientific mediation structure, to implement objective plankton in the Saguenay Fjord. This development uh, will increase our marine scientific knowledge and make even more people aware of the planktonic biodiversity and of the challenges faced by the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting and very fascinating photos. Do we have any questions? Are you all just really hungry? Yes, I must. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, how do you recruit your sailors or the other ones having the boat? <laughs> we are working with the marinas. Marinas uh, uh, arbor, uh, yeah, yes. yacht, yacht uh, arbor, and there are some associations of uh, yachtmen, and also there are some uh, association of uh, regional committee for fishing and also for aquaculture, for conchiliculture. So we use all the, uh, this uh, organization to, to find the uh, sea users, but that now we have a, a big su success. <laughs> we have uh, too, much, too many boats, 
So we, we have a, a list d'attente, a waiting list, yes? No? <laughs> A citizen science project with too many participants. Who wouldn't love that? <laughs> yeah, I would. Anyway, I have a question actually, because it sounds very labor intensive looking at all these samples and sorting through and identifying everything. Are you using eDNA, environmental DNA, barcoding? Mm. Uh, for the moment, no. But uh, we, we would like to do that, um, mainly with, uh, for uh, zooplankton. But uh, we use uh, other methods for uh, phytoplankton, mm -hmm. of course, uh, visual identification, but also uh, we call that FlowCam. Uh, FlowCam is a, a machine which can uh, identify uh, phytoplankton, the, the, the uh, class, classes of phytoplankton, and uh, with uh, AE, artificial intelligence, and the machine learns. So we have to give a, a lot of samples. <laughs> but uh, we also use uh, cytometry, flu, flu cytometry, to study the uh, toxic microscopic algae. And so well, for zooplankton, for ectoplankton for the moment, it's only with visual. It's very long to describe each uh, species, each larvae, and associated to the egg. So it's a, a very, very long and busy, uh, busy work. Yeah. Maybe you could uh, make it into a Zooniverse project and put the photos online and have citizen scientists identify uh, some of it. Anyway, mm. just an idea. Any other questions? Um, hello, very interesting project. Um, I was wondering, does Oceanopolis have a lab open to the public where maybe citizens can get involved in the analysis? And, and my second question is, what, what, how is, how is Blackton doing uh, after, you know, from the data you have collected, what, what conclusions uh, do you have from Blackton Health? Mm. Um, concerning the, the open lab, we don't have a, a, a lab open to the public, and the, the participants, the C users, don't participate to the uh, sampling preparation and sampling analysis um, because it's very complex and uh, it needs to be very specialized. <gasps> and so only marine biologists are doing this work. Um, but we, we, we involve uh, sea users uh, in the discussion of the results. And the first results are there are some uh, changing in the uh, biodiversity, in the planktonic biodiversity today, uh, mainly in uh, phytoplankton. And uh, the fir this first result doesn't mean that the changing will be, uh, will be a long-term changing, but for the moment, uh, there are some very uh, uh, strange two years uh, uh, linked to the COVID, uh, and uh, with many uh, toxic uh, microscopic algae and a drastic change uh, from uh, the, the spring to the autumn and uh, never observed before. So the, the, this kind of uh, study, uh, like objective plankton, need to be a very, very long term. When I discuss with the scientists, they say, we have to, to go on with objective plankton during perhaps 50 years <laughs> or 100 years because the it's an, an ecological series of data, and we will have more and more results, and the value of this series will increase with time. So it's some a short first result, first result, but we cannot conclude of a, a, a real change and a long-term change in these coastal ecosystems. Okay, last, last quick question. Well, I have two, but I'm gonna ask one. <laughs> okay, I'm Ariana from Italy, from a startup Outb. Um, thank you so much for the talk, because we've been looking at ways that people that do sports can also get involved into this kind of activities. So that's really cool. But um, one thing we have noticed when we involve like uh, people that do outdoor sports, especially in activities that need some laboratory work, 
is that the, um, the feedback takes a very long time to come back to them. Um, is it something that you have encountered? Like, uh, how are you providing the feedback to the people that are collecting the data? And uh, is it always the same boats that go and do these things? Or is it, um, mm. like, always new boats and then you have to continuously mm. train people? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. It's a good question. It's, it was our main problem at the beginning of Objective Plankton when we, we uh, started to analyze uh, the data, to collect data. Uh, scientists, oh, it's not possible to, <laughs> to treat the data for the moment, to analyze them. Uh, we have no time, no possibility. So we explained to the C user during two years, three years, that no results, it will arrive. <laughs> Research is a long-term process. <laughs> and um, we, we found money. And it changed completely uh, the, the, the organization. Uh, we use the money to pay scientists, to pay engineer, engin engineers, and uh, they, they, like that they can treat all the data, they can analyze uh, the samples, they can uh, uh, do uh, reports. So now we are, uh, uh, for example, we have uh, already the results of the beginning of this year, and we have all the results. It's just a, a question of money. If we have money, you can pay more people to, to, to do more analyzing and uh, to, to produce uh, reports and to, to treat the data. Mm. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we all know about the biodiversity crisis. Now we have seen that citizen science can play a role in monitoring and addressing some of these issues. So it has been very interesting, I think, from the ocean to the forests and to roads. <clears throat> Maybe not so uh, nice, but interesting anyway. So I would like to, of course, thank you uh, to our speakers, to our helpers in the session and to all of you. And just before you go, just a practical note to anyone who has a poster in the A1 or A2 sessions, please go and remove your poster so that the B posters can, uh, during the lunch break, are able to put up their posters. So thank you very much to everyone, and there's lunch.
Okay. All right. I think it's time, and I think we we should start sharp. Otherwise, um, yeah. Let, let's let's be, you know, punctual. So we will start the oral session, the number 17, ways to preserve healthy oceans and fresh water. Hmm? My name is Jaume Piera, and I will chair this session. And basically, we will start with Maria Vicioso and Macarena Marambio um, talking about Observadores del Mar, a marine citizen science platform working for a healthy ocean. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so um, good afternoon everyone. I'm Maria Vicioso from the Institute of Marine Sciences in Barcelona, and I will present Observadores del Mar. Um, Observadores del Mar is a citizen science platform, a, a marine citizen science platform that engages a community in marine research and conservation. It is coordinated from the Institute of Marine Sciences together with other uh, research centers, marine research centers in, in Spain as you can see here. Oh, how can I go back? Okay. Our, our objectives are contributing to the conservation of marine environment, transfer knowledge to improve decision making, expand our activity. Um, now we are very present in the Mediterranean and we're going to keep on growing. Uh, establish alliances, uh, continue to develop in the digital tool, and consolidate a community of people committed to the marine uh, conservation. This community is plural and, ha and has many people, many different kinds of people involved, uh, of course scientists, of course citizens, um, and also uh, associations and other organizations. Um, and the platform already comes with 17 active projects, each project uh, about uh, an, a specific um, organism or, or issue about, uh, in the ocean. And every project is uh, linked to one or more of these five main areas of action, biodiversity, invasive species, marine litter, climate change, or endangered species. Every project has a scientific team behind in charge of validating citizen data and also propose a specific challenges. These challenges could be, for example, focus on target species, such as invasive of exotic species, or also species that can cause an social alarm, like the jellyfish. In, in particular, this is the um, Portuguese man of war that is not frequent in the, in the Mediterranean, but it can cause uh, serious damage. Uh, other challenges are more focused on the climate change effects on the marine environment, like the mass mortality events, like what happens to the uh, red gorgonian of the Mediterranean, uh, similar to a coral, during the marine heat waves, like the ones we had very severe this summer. And on also the changes in temperature can uh, lead to changes in the reproduction patterns of some species like Posidonia oceanica or again the red gorgonia of the Mediterranean. Our? Okay. Uh, in this community, uh, I mean, uh, as I already said, there are a lot of people participating, but today we're going to focus on talking about uh, scuba divers. Why? Because this is a particular uh, community that have a special bond to the, to the marine area they normally dive, and we can design a specific ways to interact with, with this community, with this part of the community. For example, we develop different kinds of resources, uh, resources that need to find an equilibrium between the accuracy, a scientific accuracy, and accessibility in order that people can uh, make an easy, easy use of them, uh, like protocols, didactic resources, or identification guides. We also do uh, some trainings, theoretical and practical. We go with the scuba divers to the sea with the scientists that try these protocols uh, in, in, in the field through different workshops. But then all, all these efforts of resources and training are for um, trying to improve the quality of the citizen science data over the quantity. But uh, does it help? Does it work? Um, now, um, uh, one of our colleagues is developing a PhD thesis where uh, this was taken to a test. So we did. 
a, a few training, theoretical and practical, with citizen science volunteers, and we did the same protocol and with one day trained volunteers, two day trained volunteers, and scientists. They had to do the same methodology in the same area. Uh, checking these two, uh, well, this protocol was about uh, assessing the mortality of uh, Gorgonians, okay? And we had to, uh, they had to, to, to look to two different variables, the percentage of affected colonies, and then total number of sample colonies. Let's see uh, the data they obtain, how variable, how variable it is depending on their train. In these figures, we can see how um, in the one, the one they train volunteers uh, have very uh, more chaotic data, but the two they, they volunteer, sorry, uh, get very similar data to the data obtained by the scientists in the both variables. So we can say that training really makes a difference in improving the quality of the data obtained by volunteers. Uh, so to wrap up, if we have a community and we propose them specific challenges and train them on how to resolve them, we can get to an engaged and trained community that can lead to improve the quality of citizen science data and achieve successful environmental monitoring. But how we do, how we build this community? For us, we, try to the, the, we, we get to the point to build the Sentinel Observatories. Sentinel observatories are groups of diving clubs, diving centers, or different or associations that are uh, collaborating with Observadores del Mar and are committed to follow uh, different uh, the projects of, of the platform, the ones they choose, but systematically along a few years. And as you see in the map, they, they have a, a geographical distribution, so they can also act as an early warning network. And besides that, they, they are like a hub to spread the word about marine citizen science with their clients or their colleagues in their territory. And another th uh, thing we think is, is important is that they have an identity. They have this level of being sentinel observatories and that en engages them and makes them feel part of this community. Uh, with the, uh, that the efforts made not only by the sentinel observatories but also for the uh, for the citizens and people participating. Uh, we do science, uh, scientific publication, transfer the data to global data banks, and we are also working with collaborating very closely to administration so we can uh, get to, <laughs> to transfer all this data to, to management. And a specific example of that is that we are uh, doing a report where we are trying to, when we are analyzing the, the lacks of information about the specific species that are present in the European directives. So we can guide the, the efforts of this community to fill in these gaps in the charges of species with the final aim of building a strong community and impulse science-based conservation policies. Everything is possible thanks to all the people that uh, participate, volunteers, organizations, uh, scientific teams, the coordinator team, and of course all the institutions that support us. Thank you very much. Also, thanks to you for listening. And here in these links, you can either uh, get to, to all these or social networks or newsletter and also a podcast but that is in Spanish, or contact us for further information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. So, any question? No questions? Okay, maybe I, I in that, ah, there is one. Uh, that, that, that's exciting what you do with, with scuba divers. What, what, what is their first reaction when you ask them to collaborate in this project? They ask for it. Um, for many people, it's a way of enrich an activity that they already do. They, they, are, they, they dive almost every week, but uh, when you offer them to do something like a scientific protocol, they, they go farther about their... They are not only doing some and leisure activity, but they're contributing, and that's it's already engaging for them. So sometimes they, they are like demanding of more. <laughs> we don't always get to that, but 
Ja, mit schön. Lente? Yeah, thank you for a very inspiring uh, talk. Um, the name Sentinel makes me think of the Sentinels of the Copernicus program. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, how you, have you uh, considered collaborating with them <laughs> to combine this data that you collect uh, from, from uh, in situ with the Sentinels from space? That would be, yeah, that would be interesting. We, we haven't considered it yet, but then we can, we can consider it for, for the future. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay, there is time for one more question. Daniel? It's essentially also a data integration question. So you said you have a number of use cases, like for instance, invasive species. And so the question is, how does your data about invasive species get integrated with other data sources about those species or those invasions? Uh, sorry, I think I didn't get the... Uh, do you mean how we transfer this data to the global data banks or to the, to the administration, sir? Well, there, there are various databases that have information about which species is invasive where, and you say you are gathering data about certain species being invasive in the locations that you are investigating, and so the question is how do the data from your uh, investigations get integrated with the other investigations about invasive species or the other use cases that you have? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, as they go to these global data banks, it's available to anyone, but also the, the, the platform is, is open and anyone can ask to, to use the, this data or explore this data. Would it, is so, it so you do transfer it to GBIF and uh, similar uh, platforms? Yeah. Ah, okay, good. Okay, one more, still time. Well, I would like just then to comment. Um, what do you think, because you mentioned quantity and quality, yeah. but quality, it's not only accuracy. It's timeliness, it's ti completeness. There are several multi-dimension, up to which point, obviously, the more trained the people, that the better in terms of accuracy. But you need, uh, up to which point, for example, you cover, imagine the whole Mediterranean. How many people you could train to cover representatively the whole Mediterranean area, for example. Do, do you, obviously, there is a trade-off between, you know, mm -hmm. completeness and, for example, accuracy. Yeah. Um, how you, you think, what is the optimal, uh, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, mm. that could be like a debate translated mm. to, to many of the project's mm. presence. And uh, in this case, uh, there are many strategies. But in this case, as we define like a specific projects, it's like we, we, already, we start with a question to answer, mm -hmm. so that it makes a bit uh, uh, easier to define how, how much data is, uh, use, um, is uh, sufficient? Or yeah, needed, yeah. To, mm -hmm. Needed, yeah, to, to, to get to, to answer these questions. Okay, questions. okay. all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank you. So, Okay, yeah, big applause for her. So, next time, next speak is Sabrina Kirschke. Yeah, okay, yeah. Groundwater monitoring through citizen science, a review of projects, designs, and results. So, Sabrina. Just waiting for the presentation to start. Oh, yeah. Could you switch up? Mm -hmm. okay. And then, okay. okay. And this works, right? Yeah. Is <laughs> Perfect. It okay. Perfect. So, uh, thank you very much, Jaume. Uh, correct, <laughs> um, for, for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sabrina Kirschke. I'm with the Museum für Naturkunde, the Natural History Museum here in Berlin. And um, I present here, unfortunately, not a study of the museum, but uh, a study, I'm also happy about that, I should say that, um, that was jointly designed and implemented with my colleague, Shuvo Lidnat from the United Nations University. And this is a study, yeah, we really jointly also implemented while we were both still working there. And now we have different um, affiliations, but this shouldn't 
hinder us from presenting our results. So the topic is groundwater monitoring through citizen science, a review of project designs and results. Um, what is the practical and what is the research problem that we deal with? Um, I think many of us know that groundwater scarcity and uh, also groundwater, uh, poor groundwater, groundwater quality has negative effects on socio-ecological systems slash planetary health in its very various dimensions so that there is a need for targeted or tailored action at policy level. The problem is, or many would also say, that uh, such targeted action also needs very detailed data on groundwater quantity and quality, for instance, to identify pollution sources. When you think about agricultural pressures, industrial uses, and so forth, we just need to know where um, water is extracted or where water um, is also used on fields so that we know where we should act. Um, the problem here is that uh, there is a lack of detailed groundwater data, um, both in terms of quantity and quality on a global scale. And I'm actually sorry for the formatting. It seems that my format on my computer doesn't work with the format here on the screen. Um, so potential, there are now many people that would say that there is a potential of citizen science to address this data lag, but it is also widely unclear which specific effects uh, groundwater-related citizen science projects have and under which conditions these effects actually occur. So do we have... Um, good um, groundwater, uh, a, high, a high amount of groundwater data, is the quality good, and do we have further impacts, and under which conditions does this happen? So our research goal is to do a systematic um, analysis of the first experiences related to citizen science uh, and groundwater, and we ask here what are the results of the citizen science projects with regards to data and other outcomes and impacts, and also are there specific design principles or design factors that uh, also trigger specific results. And we want to do this to add specifically to the groundwater community, but we also want to add on existing knowledge on the design effects of citizen science and freshwater monitoring and beyond, because this was part of a um, slightly bigger project at Junior Flores. Um, so what was our approach? Uh, we did a systematic literature review. So a desk study, I cannot show you any nice pictures from, <laughs> from the field, um, unfortunately, but I can show you this uh, systematic um, approach of how we identified relevant literature. Um, we had a keyword search on Scopus and Web of Science um, with, well, we had a diversity of keywords related to groundwater and citizen science in different formats, then identified, identified 81 articles, we had duplicates, uh, we extracted them, and then had a finalist, well, pre-finalist um, pre of 50 articles, then screened them and realized, well, many of them mention actually citizen science or other terms like voluntary monitoring, but they actually do not implement any kind of citizen science approach. So they somehow use it in a keyword function, but they do not actually implement it. So we only used um, 21 of these articles and also through some snowballing added another five so that we had a very small sample of 26 articles um, that we could include. Um, we then coded the literature and we referred here to existing coding schemes um, that we have already um, used um, or identified through other um, research that we did. Uh, we used here five main codes, first of all, the general project information. Uh, we wanted to know where is the project located, um, what is the project duration, which parameters were measured, uh, what is the regional scale of monitoring, how often uh, that uh, the project actually monitor, so um, groundwater. We were also interested in institutional characteristics, um, like uh, what are the project goals, what are the institution's um, responsibilities, who is funding the project. Then further, many of us talk about the citizen characteristics. We also wanted to know some basic aspects, like how many citizens are involved, what is their age, education, gender, motivation, awareness, and others. Uh, what was also pretty important were the process mechanisms. Uh, we just talked about the training, so we also looked for training, but also how were uh, citizens recruited, um, what are the tools for data collection and uh, data transfer, communication and feedback. Was this done, for instance, with these digitalized tools or yeah, digital to zero tools, or was this rather done in a more classical face-to-face -face form? And then finally, our key question also, what is then the actual result of the citizen science project? Uh, what, are, what is the data quantity, quality? Are there further outcomes on citizens, um, like learning effects or further impacts?
<clears throat> we did some double coding. I discussed the coding with a team of authors and uh, then implement some descriptive statistics and uh, qualitatively summarize the codes we actually planned for <laughs> statistical analysis. But uh, you may see in the next slide why we didn't do that. Um, this is maybe the most important slide, um, even though it may not look like it. <laughs> but it's a slide on data availability in, this, uh, in the scientific literature on the codes that um, we analyzed. Um, we have here the number of text segments identified for each subcode on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, this is the number of text segments identified for each code, so summarizing the subcodes that you have on the left-hand side. And what you see here is <laughs> a big divert... Ooh, I have to go back. A big diversity um, of, um, let's say, interest <laughs> in reporting on our codings, um, code, uh, on our code system. Um, on the top, on the left-hand side, you see um, a couple of uh, citizen characteristics such as gender, awareness, age, motivation, education, that are typically not reported in this groundwater citizen science community, so they do not say anything about the people that they actually work with. Um, but on the other side, they say a lot about the project goals, about the location, who is responsible about the project, what are the parameters being measured, and so forth. So this type of information is present, but not so much about what do they actually do with citizen science. And again, this is summarized on the right-hand side, and there you really see it in a very <laughs> generalized way. Not so much information on citizen characteristics, a bit more on different types of results, even a bit more on institutional characteristics on these process mechanisms, and general project uh, information is pretty dominant. So with this in mind, I present you the results, but you, you really know now that there is not so much information um, in the literature, but still I wanted to show you something. This is a map um, which we actually even created before um, this literature review based on a study project. I should mention that, so the numbers are not completely congruent, but it's extremely similar to what we have in our study. Um, what you see is that we have different regional context and with uh, the USA being extremely dominant. So most of the projects that are citizen science related groundwater projects are located in the USA, at least those that are published. So there may be many others, but those that really publish this and uh, in the reference system um, yeah, are from there. The duration uh, is very different. It comes, uh, can start from three months and can go up to two years. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer, but this is rather the dominant uh, duration. We have a monitoring of water quantity and quality aspects, and here also a diversity of um, parameters. Um, water levels are more prominent, but also some uh, chemical, physical, and biological parameters. But I have to say here that biological parameters are not so um, yeah, classic in, in water monitoring, as it's also pretty complex. Um, it was monitored in a rather low number of wells, and uh, data collection was run on a weekly basis. So um, how were the citizen science project designed? Um, we think that there was a diversity of project designs with some dom dominant design principles in terms of the institutional characteristics. You see that many of the projects had a data orientation, so they really wanted to collect data. Um, but some also had a more citizen or citizen science orientation and also talked about this a bit more. Um, most of the time we had a single um, responsible institution and this responsible institution was an academic institution so it's really driven by scientific or academic actors, um, this monitoring process. And the funding was also through um, governmental or research grants and if it was a governmental grant it came through the research grant to the, <laughs> to the actual um, institution. In terms of the citizen characteristics, you're aware we don't have a lot of information, but when we had information, then there was a range between about 20 to 40 citizens involved, so it's rather low scale. Different ages were involved, rather well educated, which is not a big surprise, and there was mostly an intrinsic motivation, uh, like learning and improving water quality, and uh, also the environmental awareness was rather high. So it's not that people that don't know anything about water or whatever come and join such a groundwater citizen science project, but it's um, people that are already somehow aware of the question or issue. And in terms of process mechanism, um, we had different recruitment mechanisms in this field, but what was pretty important, also mentioned as a success factor of the project, was what we just heard in the first presentation, uh, the different trainings for water monitoring. And I think this is also specifically important as groundwater monitoring is not as easy, maybe, <laughs> as uh, yeah, going 
and measure pH in a river or so. So it really needs training to be successful. Um, there we had um, our different uh, tools were used. Um, most different tools for data transfer were also used. And uh, what was also pretty important was the communication and feedback. So I assume um, this is also related to the training. So people need training and then they need feedback if the quality is not so good and then, then it improves. In terms of the project results, um, I start with uh, data outputs. Um, uh, with the outputs of the project, data quantity was rather positive. So although, although it was rather on a small scale, it mainly related to water quantity levels and not so much on water quality. Um, in terms of data quality, this was rather good, um, but it also depended on the parameters that were measured um, and the respective trainings, as I mentioned. In terms of outcomes, uh, yeah, learning on groundwater systems was important, the sense of ownership and behavioral change, further political engagement of the public institution building somehow happened in some selected cases. And in even more selected cases, people also reflected on further impacts, like from coming from a data to um, from data to better decision uh, and management of ground groundwater resources. But also the uh, project uh, reported the other way around. Um, they said something about a lack of impacts due to a lack of trust in data collected by the citizens. So the lessons learned, uh, we have a variety of positive experiences with citizen science and groundwater monitoring with the predominance of US American examples. Um, design variables uh, varies, but some principles seem to be important, like the training, communication, and feedback. Or oh, it's here, communication, training, communication, and feedback. And the effects mainly re relate to data output, uh, data quantity and quality, but further effects on citizen change and poli policies are sometimes somehow also possible. We think that this is generally in line with the general literature in citizen science and freshwater monitoring because we also did a broader study which also involved around 100 projects related to water, um, freshwater monitoring. <laughs> and here we basically have the same ideas. I see the sign I have to close. <laughs> but we want to highlight at least that there, is a specific, there are specific groundwater related barriers. And um, further citizen science projects, this is the main message, should report a bit more on the citizen characteristics and design. So thank you for listening. You have your further project information. I'd like to always thank the team that also worked in this uh, freshwater-related citizen science project, and you can always contact us for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> I think there is probably at least one, maybe two. Thank you so much, Sabrina. That's really fascinating. I mean, that's the area that I'm working in, so I'm really interested to see what you're doing. Um, it's a little bit sad to see there are only 21 projects. Um, I see there were two in South Southern Africa, and I wonder if ours was one of them or whether it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so we can discuss that later. Um, and what did you look at technology, what kind mm. of technology there was used and whether there was some sort of um, standardization of technology? Mm. Was the measurement mainly in kind of small wells or was it in bigger boreholes? Mm. So that's the other question. And then what were your parameters, your water quality parameters? How many um, parameters were there? And did they differ a lot or were most people measuring more or less? the mm. same, and then I'd love to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your question. You, you ask all the technical details that my colleague Shubut Litnat should better answer because he's the groundwater expert. But uh, we also took a look at the different technologies and also at the specific barriers that are associated with using specific technologies. In terms of the um, actual parameters, we also saw quite some variety. Um, we thought that there's just like a focus on like one like water level, for instance, or one additional water quality indicator. But I think the final set involved at least 10 different indicators, and um, the different projects really focused on different types of indicators depending on their specific goal. I would have to like to have a private chat that maybe afterwards and also we can well then discuss the details on <laughs> what exactly was measured where also regarding your project. <laughs> okay. Bente, is it very short? Sorry. Uh, um, Thank no, you. But, but, uh, there will be just one. Um, oh. I mean, sorry. No, no. If, if you go fast, yes. you, we, we are on time. Uh. Ah. Thank you. Uh, groundwater yeah. is super interesting also from space. 
uh, we have the uh, GRACE follow-on, the GRACE gravitation measurements that see water, groundwater extraction. Mm -hmm. um, since you're not technical, I will ask them the question that is more on the um, um, willingness of the mm -hmm. institutions to actually do the in-situ measurements. I saw you had none in India, but there is, you have the similar um, conflict of interest in California where you had, so the US, you had more. So where did you see any reluctance in the institutions mm -hmm. with respect to support in C2 or the engaging the citizens? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. I think we did not get this type of information while analyzing the scientific articles. So I think this would really need a second round of interviews with the respective institutions to see, um, to get some more background information on the barriers they face when, when implementing such a project. But I know this debate um, also from the World Water Quality Alliance and the Friends of Groundwater that say, well, citizen science and other in situ measurements are super interesting, but at the same time we have uh, other approaches and uh, what does it really bring in addition to all these other approaches that also are maybe more cost effective. So I, I feel your, <laughs> your point. Okay, thank you. And sorry, but I hope that you will be able to talk with Sabrina during the coffee time, all right? Yes, please. Okay, <laughs> so let's move to the next speaker, Anais Benavides Leinstein. Okay, yeah, thank you. And science learning through marine community science in the Yucatan Peninsula. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, you have your own, okay? okay. Hello, I'm Ana Benavides Lanstein. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Natural History Museum. And I work on educational research in areas such as science education, environmental education, and of course, it is in science. And I forgot the clicker. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> So the Big Sea with Search, it's a marine citizen science program. It's mostly contributory. And it was launched by Juliet Brody, and it's been going on for over 10 years. Its presence, it it's ex uh, expands beyond the UK. It's in, an, in a few other countries. We can tell you more about that. It has recently been studied for its learning potential by the Learn Sitsai project. And uh, in, the, in the few recent years, we've been developing another collaboration with the Institute of Resources at the University of um, Greenwich and also with some colleagues in Mexico at the National Autonomous Uni University. And well, at this point, we are sort of trying to work with the project to see if we can turn it or adapt it into a collaborative project. So we can talk about that in the coffee <laughs> uh, section, but so now I'm just going to tell you about the educational aspect of the project. So essentially, the Big Seaweed Search in Mexico, it's not just about the adaptation, it's also about providing some form of response, an alternative response to the sargassum seaweed issue in the area. It's also about engaging people with seaweed because essentially they are key actors for us and to help us work out this wicked issue. We have two study areas. So the first site, it's a small semi-rural area. It's called Cisal. It's, a, it's in the Yucatan Peninsula. And they don't really have a big issue with sargassum. However, they're part of the community because they're an hour and a half away. Well, no, sorry. Four hours away from the uh, other site that actually has the big issue with the sargassum seaweed. And for this part of the educational research, we invited young people from something that is called telesecondary, which is uh, not quite like in-person in education, although at the time we did the research, they were actually taking lessons in person, but normally they would be studying through television, through videos and things like that. So um, to be fair, they, they have um, a lot of different challenges in terms of how to get access to science and to science education, even in their formal education. So this was really uh, a good opportunity for them to just engage in something they might be interested in. They were, they were excited. The ones that participated were excited. The schools weren't very big. I don't have the specific numbers of how many we approached. We approached two schools in each, in each side, and we got a response that you will see of 18 kids. So the program has different purposes, and for this talk, obviously, I already gave it away that I'm going to focus on the educational part of the program. Um, 
but we are different academics from all these different institutions trying to work out how to adapt the program, how to use it to respond to the sargassum seaweed issue, which is affecting the uh, socioeconomic lives of people and the ecosystem as well. But also there's potential to support science learning and STEM careers promotion in the local areas. The focus of the research is looking into um, well, what is the new disciplinary knowledge they gain from taking part in the program? And are there any scientific skills that they are actually developing from taking part? And is there any, any transformative potential from actually engaging and learning all of these new things about seaweed? It doesn't sound very exciting, but after you take part, believe me, it is really exciting. At least that's what the kids say. Um, I gotta say that this uh, this program happened also thanks to the Learn Seed side because it's heavily influenced by the focus on um, just looking at youth learning, science learning, and the research design was also influenced by it. We went a little bit beyond that and we did a mixed methods research. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So we have um, three different parts in the design. So we are looking into their knowledge and their views before they take part in the project. And then we have this big chunk of training, which is eight hours along a week, and their participation in field-based activities to collect data, to collect data on seaweed, on the beach cast seaweed in particular. And then after they take part in two sessions of field-based, and after they went through the training, well, we had a conversation with them, an interview, and a post-survey. So we have nine kids from, and that is totally a coincidence, because um, I know I get people asking me, did you choose for, like, on purpose made that even? No, I didn't. Uh, so we had nine kids from each setting, and, um, well, they were really, really engaged. And those that were really, really engaged were the ones that we interviewed because they participated more than two times. And I'm telling you, this is an after-school program, so they actually had to make time to go to take part after their school lessons. They are two case studies, but I will discuss the results together because I didn't find any particular difference but one thing that I will mention in the end. Another thing to mention is that um, these kids actually didn't, I mean, I'm a native speaker in Spanish, you can tell probably, and their language skills and their, their communication, um, it was, I don't know how to describe it, but it just didn't have, um, I don't know, in my experience looking at other data, it just didn't have as much, I guess, of the potential of what you can use Spanish. I don't, I don't want to say in a mean way, but I just mean that there were several uh, triggers and things and indicators in what they were saying that just told us that it was a big deal that they were talking about their own learning. Like you could really tell they weren't used to talking about their own learning. And this is what we did through their surveys and interviews. So the analysis, uh, I coded the data, uh, and then I used the coded data, obviously, to do an interpretative analysis of each case separately, going kit by kit, and then across. Um, there's a little summary about this here, but I would really like to move on to tell you a little bit more about them. So seven of them indicating having uh, an indigenous background, but all of them were able to speak Spanish very well. It was their first language but clearly there were other uh, cultural influences. We were really interested in knowing about this in case there were any uh, traditional knowledge influences in what they were just learning about seaweed. Um, we didn't find anything in relation to that in particular. We did ask them. However, um, I do think that they were communication challenges that it has to do with the language of science as well. So, in terms of like the new disciplinary knowledge, my colleagues at the, um, the ones who are leading the project in Mexico, they were really interested in seeing if they, you know, actually got some of the content of the workshop, which, which was telling them a lot about uh, where, what seaweed are, the ecosystem services related to seaweed and sargassum seaweed, different types. And we did find that after the, they took part in the program, their conceptions didn't really change a lot. They still kept thinking that sea, uh, seaweed as plants and the, something that did expand is talking about seaweed in terms of something that could be useful for us and that we could make the best out of and we can use it even for art, so different phases of the ecosystem services. Uh, in terms of um, 
the use of scientific terms, that was something as well. They started using scientific terms when they were explaining after they took part. In terms of how they organized their knowledge, it was a bit tricky. So whenever they were explaining how they identified seaweed, they would combine all sorts of different concepts. So um, this is really interesting because it's something we could really work on if we were really focusing on the science learning of it. In terms of the scientific processes, so they were all able to remember and tell you exactly every step they did, but they weren't very good at actually understanding why one step followed the other. Uh, there was quite a lot of confusion of, well, we did all these different steps, but what's the logic behind that? Interestingly though, one aspect they did get very well is why we're collecting data in different seasons and why, what, what's the purpose of the data. So uh, when, when this kid was explaining to us, he was telling us that, well, the thing is, you know, if you only collect data in, in one point or uh, you will not get the extent of what actually happens throughout the year. So anyway, he, we were having a conversation about that during the interview and this is a really good explanation of how kids actually uh, just advance their knowledge in terms of how could you use science to understand a phenomenon? Right, and this is one of the most positive and I would say significant findings of our research. Uh, they significantly changed their views about seaweed. So there were a lot of beliefs that they had in terms of like seaweed is just, um, it's rubbish, it's something you shouldn't touch, it's dangerous. We, we do get, we, we get told when we're little not to touch it, not to approach it. And after taking part in the program, they actually felt like they could engage with seaweed and learn more about it and even tell their family about that there are different types of seaweeds and not just sargassum, because that was one of the things that they were actually continuously repeating that they, you know, it's a cultural social representation, I would say. Uh, there's the belief that when you see beach cat seaweed, it's just sargassum. And the kids found out that just by realizing that there's more than that, uh, there, you know, there's something that interesting about it and that, that that is interesting about it, we can work on. So, these are some of the different ways in which they change their thinking about seaweed. But I like this bit because it actually shows you some of the cultural background of people just feeling a little bit grossed out really about seaweed. <laughs> and then, just realizing that, no, actually, you know, that's, if, if you know that there are different types and they actually touch them, if you see some of the photos are touching them, they did different activities. For example, they desiccated some of the seaweed and then they framed it and they kind of passed that barrier of feeling put off by seaweed. And they kept actually, as, I, as far as I know now, uh, many of the kids continue participating because the program is still ongoing. Uh, in terms of their views about science, that wasn't so strong for them, but I think this is actually, again, because what I mentioned at first, their access to science learning is really perhaps just limited. It, there are many challenges. So they just found it more fun, something that they could really do, they could take part. And especially I would say that another aspect that's really important is well, the agency that they showed about approaching their families, their, their parents, their friends, because we do have those accounts, and telling them that there is not just sargassum, there is more seaweed out there, and then some of them taking small actions. And I think uh, the golden example is the one kid actually starting to work on a solution and using seaweed for, um, you yeah, have just working on the garden, I think. Uh, so anyway. We are still working on the discussion points and I think some of the important aspects that I would like you just to think about and take with you is that maybe uh, if your participants take part in a program and maybe they don't learn all the disciplinary knowledge that you probably put into that workshop or into all those guides, however, knowing that there is more out there to learn could actually help them just advance in and perhaps question their beliefs and change their attitudes towards whatever it is that you're studying, in this case, seaweed. And a few takeaways. Um, well, I guess we realized that the eight hour workshop, is that red card? Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Um, so yeah, so just a, a few takeaways is the eight hour workshop didn't necessarily prove um, really good just for you know getting all the knowledge out there etc but it was very good for engaging them with the scientists and get them excited about the project and it was the actual participation in the scientific process that we believe it made all the difference and the fact that they had their own resources and they took their guides with them um, so thank you very much um, there's so much we can say about this project and if you want to contact us please do thank you very much Time for one or two questions? No questions? Uh, I would like to ask you, because you, you were mentioned the idea, you know, to transfer some of the knowledge of the information from the kids to the family, but what about to the family, to the kids? I, I always think, you know, particularly grandparents, people, and particularly those, let's say, local communities that usually are more attached to nature, so they, and particularly grandparents may have some, you know, experience that they can transfer to the to, to, to the kids? Do you have any yeah, idea on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, I guess in this case we were interested in actually seeing kids using their agency and using their knowledge and seeing themselves as experts um, from whatever they gain from this participation, right? So that's what we were really focusing on. However, yes, we do have some accounts of from some of the kids discussing how their, their parents, for example, they do this one thing at the beach and it somehow informs whatever they are understanding mm -hmm. on seaweed. But we don't have any clear example. We didn't interview the parents. Uh, we were just working directly with, with the young people. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, we sometimes we comment the idea, you know, that maybe, not force, but um, invite the kids to interview their parents or their grandparents. And maybe through this communication they can get, you know, better answers and some ideas of the local knowledge. I agree. And I have another project where we did that, and okay. I know it works. Okay. It's really wonderful. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Next speaker is Alina Luna. Uh, she will talk about citizen science as a key tool in integrated ocean and coastal observing systems. So, Alina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jaume. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, to come. Um, uh, well, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Alina Luna, and I, I belong to a research group that is called Envimos, and it belongs to the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona. And now I'm here to talk about as Jauma says, the citizen science as a key tool in integrated ocean and coastal observing systems. So, uh, I will talk a little bit more this project that I'm working on, that it's called MINKE, that it means Metrology for Integrated Marine Management and Knowledge Transfer Network. I know that maybe you think that citizen science cannot uh, fit in this title, but it will in two or three slides. So, this project that is called MINKE receives funding from the European Commission and um, is part of a um, Horizon 2020 program by the topic of Infraya in the face of integrated activities for starting communities that has 22 organizations from 10 different countries. So, to the point, MINKE uh, proposes an innovative framework of quality of oceanographic data by merging two communities uh, that use different marine research infrastructures. One community are the marine meteorology centers, and the second community are the citizen observatories. So here you have uh, two pictures where we can see a kind of the same scenario where one is uh, obtaining marine data with the marine meteorology center or tool, and this, the second one, is uh, the same, obtaining marine data with citizen science. So um, by this, we are uh, in this project, we are integrating two dimensions of the quality of oceanographic data that are the accuracy and completeness. So uh, I'm going to talk on, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the first dimension that is the accuracy. And so, uh, the accuracy means that the selection of a few key points for regular monitoring prioritizing the use of top-level instrumentations. So, 
this maximize the measurements accuracy. And for example, if you see this map, uh, we can imagine that maybe we can measure an ocean variable like salinity. So we circle some specific points in, in Europe to measure this with advanced instrumentations, only with advanced instrumentation. So uh, for sure, these measurements uh, will be exactly and with a lot of accuracy. So the second dimension that it's, uh, it's with the completeness, this means to uh, attempt to cover all the potential points of measurement uh, with the implicit use of low-cost observational systems like citizen observatories and fab labs to maximize the completeness of the data set. So if we have the same map with the circles of the accuracy and we put in blue crosses the, the potential points that we can obtain data from the citizen science. So these will the two dimensions, the accuracy and the completeness. So, um, if we keep in mind the second map, uh, we can have in a, in a dream world uh, the ideal case that you can see has accurate measurements in all stations that are the red squares. So the ideal case could be to have all these lines measured. When you have a pointer, this one. Yes, this one. It doesn't work. Uh, ah. yes. Okay, so. The ideal case, to have all these red squares measure with accuracy. But um, this um, ideal case is unviable because of the implicit and high cost to maintain these top level instrumentations. So we have to come back from the dream world and be in the real options that one option, option or one dimension could be to accurate measurements in few selected points. So instead of have all the red squares, we will only have three of them, okay? It's not too bad. And the second dimension could be the measurement in all stations with low cost systems. I mean, the citizen science. And maybe we are not getting the red squares. We are getting all of them, but in blue. It's not the same, but it's better than nothing. And uh, even though with the associated errors to each dimension, um, we can obtain an optimal product that could be the data um, uh, as a result of data fusion, that could be this, to have all stations measure, not in red, not in blue, but in green. So, um, in particular, Minke will evaluate the benefits of using more conventional systems of advanced instrumentations, that means the accuracy, again, I'm going to say accuracy too many times, and with the complementary information provided by volunteer researchers and civil organizations, the citizen science, uh, that provides the completeness of the data. So maybe you're wondering how do we integrate both dimensions? So in, in Minkek, we do that through the services that we offer. So with these services, we have divided in two groups. The, the first group is the metrological network that it's uh, with 10, cal 10 calibration laboratories, three ferry box systems operating in different um, European seas, and three marine observatories. But we also have uh, the second group of the services in Minke that are the citizen science projects and platforms. So we have three that we are working with. The first one is uh, Cientificos de la Basura. Um, it's um, a citizen science project, in English, litter scientist, that investigates the problem of litter in the coastal zone of Chile. So this Científicos de la Basura is made up for teachers and students and professionals who apply the scientific method to analyze the problem of garbage in nature and proposes actions to address the environmental problems of today and for the future. So um, if you want to know more about them, you can Google them and they, they do really interesting things. So another platform that we have in Minke are the smart citizens. 
and these provide virtual access to participatory monitoring networks based on low-cost technologies and do-it-yourself technologies. So this Smart Citizen is developed by FabLab in Barcelona also and develops tools for citizen actions in environmental monitoring and methodologies for community engagement and co-creation. And the third one, it's a platform called Minka. And this is a virtual access to cloud-based services to develop new participatory biodiversity. So Minka is a citizen science observatory that offers free access uh, to this platform that allows creating a specific projects of citizen science uh, to monitor marine target species or coastal areas uh, of interest. So I would like to talk um, especially about MINCA because this is, this is a platform that we are developing in the Institute of Marine Science in the group that I mentioned before, ENVIMOS. And we have um, obtained a lot of contributions with this platform. So one could be that this platform has contributed to the SD, to overcome the, some SDGs, the number 14 and the 15, uh, life under before water and life on land. Um, Minka has also helped us with the data that we have get in this platform to recognize the distribution pattern in marine species due to the global uh, warming effects. Uh, also, um, we, ha we had a really important contribution this year uh, that was about the, that the Barcelona City Council um, developed a marine atlas that uh, obtained or get, got all the data set from the platform to, uh, to develop this marine atlas. Uh, this, uh, the City Council only had the Earth Atlas, the birds, the trees, but now with the help of this platform was able to add the marine, the marine atlas of Barcelona. And also the add to, to this atlas uh, has also impact the change on the social perception of urban beaches. And the last one uh, that it's uh, another contribution that Minka allows is to develop projects and events, and for example, uh, in this summer, I, we had the Bio Marato that was realized, um, was developed in Italy and Spain. So, I, th I think I was quick. So, well, many things. Um, if you have some questions, if you want to visit the platform, you can scan this uh, QR code. You can visit the website, you can, well, all the social media, you know. And, or you can write to us, the, to the Jauma, by the way, that is the coordinator, and me, the project manager, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. You were fast, so yeah. probably there are possibility questions. Do you have any question to address? No questions? I, the, oh, sorry, there. How does um, Minka work in terms of data collection, data validation? In terms of what? Data collection. You, you mean Minka? The, the word? Minka, yeah. The, M yeah. Minka, it's the a biological quechua. records. Yeah. The, the word Minka comes from a Quechua um, word. And it's a it's uh, traditional action, you know, to help people, each other within the community. Yes, but how does the project work in how terms of work? data collection and validation? Uh, in terms of validation, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that now it's a collaborative validation. It's a peer review. Uh, it's, a, it's a system that people can vote and can, you know, exchange. And this, um, there is an in, well, internal algorithm that takes all the, all the opinions from the people and on top of that, there is then the reviewer of the project because, because every single project you can assign reviewers and those people have, I would say, a different uh, voting system. So you can see what the community has decided and what the reviewer has decided. In many cases, there is strong coincidences, but in some particular cases, it could be, you know, differences. And then you can somehow, you know, decide if or you wait if the reviewer is the, the one you have to consider and not. 
On top of that, we are planning now to, to do extra things in terms of automatic identification systems, but it's an ongoing system to validate. I'm sorry, do you use your own software for that? Um, yes. Yeah. Actually, I missed to say that in, by now in Minca we have 293 uh, users and we have 90,000 uh, observations. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's in the deployment stage. Probably we will start officially next year. Hmm? Hmm. Okay, I think then we can move to the last one. The last speaker. Okay. Oh, hi. It's Tanya Jenk Jenkins. Yeah. Yes. So she, Tanya will talk about COFISH, no? Co creating a research project with fishers for sustainable lake fisheries. So, Tanya. Thank you. Does, um, it should work. Does it work? Yeah. You can hear me. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate that you're still here, even though there are delicious cakes waiting for us outside. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here to present uh, my latest co-creation project, which is in the group, uh, a collaboration with the groups of Bastian Ibelings and Bruno Strasser at the University of Geneva, where I am based. So CoFish has three project goals. The first one is to co-create a citizen science project between scientists and fishers on the sustainability of lake fish populations. The second and the third goals are linked and they're about evaluating the learning outcomes, both for scientists, professional scientists, because yes, professional scientists can also learn through the process, um, and uh, our participants, the fishers. And what I'm particularly interested in is looking at how um, learning outcomes for those involved in the co-creation versus those that are involved in data collection uh, vary. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the first phase of the project, so the co-creation and the design of that, um, because it has been a substantial part of the project and the rest of the work is actually ongoing. So our context is this beautiful lake uh, nestled between uh, Switzerland and France. It's one of the largest lakes in Western Europe. Um, it's got a lot of fish in it. <laughs> a lot of people think uh, that it doesn't have uh, people fishing uh, in the lake. And in fact, we have 130 professional fishers and uh, 8,000 anglers that fish in the lake. So that's roughly equivalent to meeting a fisherman every two kilometers. Um, it's a very rich ecological system. It's a very unique alpine lake system. It's also a very important source of uh, drinking water. And there are a lot of people that you, around the lake that use it uh, for recreational uses, so for sailing, for swimming, even for diving. And uh, we're privileged because we have a lot of research institutes uh, around the lake with a lot of expertise on fish and on fishing and on the relations between um, fishers and their local environment. Um, there are also some serious issues um, in the lake, uh, so issues such as pollution, eutrophication, invasive species, diseases, overexploitation, and uh, of course now climate change. A classic example for the local area is uh, the Ferra du Le Mans, uh, which is a, an endemic species of whitefish that was fished to extinction. And so if you want, you can go to the Museum of Zoology in Lausanne and see this uh, specimen. It's the last remaining one. Um, so it forms really an ideal terrain for a co-creation project because we have, as I said, a lot of fishers, um, both professionals and anglers. And uh, also it's very interesting because we have the Swiss fishers and the French fishers, which have slightly different practices as well. Um, and as I said earlier, we have a lot of uh, scientists, a lot of uh, expertise in uh, the area. Um, so I wanted to basically bring everyone together, so anglers, professional fishers, managers and scientists for an opening workshop. And I wanted everyone to listen to the fishers um, and to hear their opinions about what mattered to them in terms of the sustainability of lake fish populations. So really we started with quite a broad open question. Uh, 
a lot of topics came up and we roughly grouped them into uh, topics such as pollution, uh, restocking practices, the evaluation of fish stocks, urbanization, the impact of predatory birds on fish populations. And then through a series of iterative votes, uh, both at the workshop and after, uh, we decided, the fishers decided that they were really interested in um, estimating fish populations, so in the evaluation question, actually statistics. Um, and with the, them, we reformulated uh, the question and we again went through an iterative process of workshops and interviews where we asked them how they themselves have experienced the decline in fish populations. And again, a lot of topics came up. Um, uh, just the methods that we used, we used a mixture of uh, design thinking and uh, storytelling methods. Um, but one of the main topics that came up was the issue of food and food in the lake. And actually what the fishers say is that the lake now these days is too clean and that there isn't enough food for the fish. And so <laughs> some of the quotes are, you know, the less phosphorus there is in the lake, the less food there is. Uh, they say that the lake is too clean, there isn't enough food, uh, the fish are too thin. Um, some of them remember fishing fish that were heavier and they said that they looked fatter. Um, so yeah, I found this actually very interesting. And of course, it's linked uh, to the story of eutrophication and eutrophication in the lake. And in the 1960s, uh, the lake actually became um, heavily uh, eutrophic. And some opportunistic species, uh, such as the perch, did actually quite well. They were able to tolerate uh, quite eutrophic uh, conditions. Whereas other species, such as the reintroduced whitefish, um, <laughs> from a different lake, uh, fared uh, worse and were actually quite susceptible to the effects of eutrophication. Um, and so it was a policy change. The decision was to clean up the lake, uh, to have stro stronger environmental policies, to ban the amount of phosphates going into uh, the water and to regulate that more closely. And as a result, uh, here you see the gray line, the amount of phosphorus actually declined in the lake and uh, the, the lake got uh, cleaned up. And so the, the phosphorus monitoring uh, happens by one organization on the lake called uh, the CIPEL. And they've been monitoring, uh, it's an amazing data set, they've been monitoring the phosphorus level since the 1950s twice a week. Um, and they used a standardization. So back in the 1950s, they said, okay, um, these two points are the ones we're going to use and they based it on a standardization. And they found that they were representative uh, of the lake as a whole. So we have one point in the um, CHL2 and uh, GE3. And they said, okay, these are representative of the lake as a whole. I've got a nice red dot, anyway. Next slide. I don't think I can move now. Oh no, it's okay. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, so one of the, the points of one of the fishermen in, in one of the workshops, he, he said, well, how you talk about climate change. <laughs> how can you be sure that these two points, uh, that the standardization was done back in the 1950s, how can be, you be sure that this, uh, rep this is still representative today in 2022? And, you know, uh, actually that was a very valid point. And Bas Ebeling, so one of my two bosses that was at the workshop, said, yeah, you know, this is a very valid point. We have uh, data from modeling, we have data from space uh, that shows that this may be the case, but we, don't, we haven't redone an empirical study uh, on this. So, you know, like, do you want to do this? And, and yeah, they, they were motivated to find out to what extent these standard two sampling locations were representative of the lake as a whole in terms of phosphorus levels, um, but also we added on uh, carbon and phosphorus uh, because it's an indicator of quality of uh, food and also cyanobacteria because it's becoming a more prominent issue uh, on the lake. And so we went out, in fact, last week uh, to the historical sampling points. This is the historical map. Uh, we sampled uh, 35 uh, stations on the same day. 
and it was a, quite a logistical challenge because we all had to be out on the lake uh, at the same time. So 15 fishers volunteered to go out in their fishing boats, either as part of their normal fishing activities or as an extra outing uh, to go to these uh, historical uh, stations. And what they did is they took an integrated water sample, which is a very sophisticated device, uh, which we call the anaconda, <laughs> which we put in the water with a heavy weight and we tested exactly which weight was required and five kilos seemed to do the job. Um, and we sank it uh, overboard and the fishers collected the water as samples and then hauled it up and uh, it's very convenient because the end of the hose pipe, um, the Porto wine bottles fit uh, the end of the hose pipe to create the suction. So we're talking about really sophisticated equipment here <laughs> that then the fishers just emptied in a bucket, stirred and um, put in a bottle. Um, they also took Secchi measurements uh, for lake turbidity. On some of the boats, it was a member of our team because it's the first time we're doing it. Um, so we were very keen to see how it goes and you know, also see how they find our tools and our methods. Um, yeah, so also the opportunity to exchange with them about uh, the science. And then uh, we basically started the logistical feat of getting everything back to the lab in 24 hours. And here we have uh, Alexandre with his samples, my colleague Elisa, we're carrying, uh, oh yeah, everything had to be on ice as well, uh, just to add to the complexity, uh, with the ice boxes and then um, us here in the lab uh, about to process the samples. So I want to just touch upon the challenges of doing a co-creation project. Unfortunately, I don't have any results to show you because I'm still waiting for the lab results. So maybe in two years time, I'll be able to share the results and also the results of the learning outcomes. But I'll just say about the challenges and a few of the lessons learned of doing a co-creation project. I'm sure you all know that it's a lengthy process. Um, this entire process of the, just coming up with a research question took nine months. Um, so it's basically uh, a pregnancy, <laughs> in the end uh, you have a question and, and we were then able within the year to do the sampling as well. Um, it's very difficult to decide sometimes on research lines and it's very important to have a clear kind of governance structure on who's going to decide and when and how the decisions are made. And as an outsider to the lake and to the fishing context, um, yeah, there are past relations and tensions and you've really got to walk very carefully and it's very useful to have a local person that perhaps knows and is aware about that and is respected by the community uh, to avoid, you know, stepping on some toes. Um, in terms of involving academic scientists, I think that in my project uh, I was too enthusiastic and I involved them too early, uh, before the topic was known. Um, because, yeah, unfortunately some of them, even though there were lots of research lines that were possible, uh, some of them were not willing to do a very basic literature review to show like, basically what had been done in each uh, sub-question. Um, and then others actually wanted to contribute but couldn't because uh, they were postdocs or PhD students and they didn't have the support of their supervisors. So it's, not, it's non trivial to actually match the interests of the fishers with the interests uh, of the scientists and actually to find the right person at the right time. Um, there were also some scientists that were interested in pushing their own agenda uh, during the workshops and basically saw this as a nice pot of money to do their, their project and collect some data. Um, yeah, lessons learned from the side of the fishers that there were some, there was mistrust of certain scientists, not of science as a whole. A lot of them had already contributed to science, but one of the biggest problems for them was the lack of feedback that they tend to get in citizen science projects or in general scientific projects. Um, it, just in general, and one of my major challenges at the moment is just the high expectations that they have. They want immediate results to lead to political change and impact, but I'm sure you've all experienced that in some way or another. Um, a particular challenge, again, uh, was uh, COVID and technology issues in our case. Uh, not all of the fishers um, are comfortable using Zoom and working in an online setting, but I think a lot of us had to deal with that in the last years. Um, there were some successes, so I thought that the biggest successes are actually getting, seeing people disseminating about the project. Um, we did have some uh, 
fishers that were very keen to uh, post uh, Instagram stories during the sampling campaign. So we had one female fisher, um, a young one, who was out with her dad, who was also a fisher, and she was uh, she posted a whole story, and I was amazed because, you know, I couldn't even I could barely stand on the boat. <laughs> And she was posting on social media. Another sign of success was, uh, yeah, people recruiting others into the project. And so I'm also really looking forward now to analyzing the interviews um, that I've uh, conducted with all of these actually amazing people. Um, next steps for the, this part of the project, lab analyses, um, workshops on dissemination and impacts to pathways to impact. I feel we haven't, we didn't really cover enough in the first part. And I've learned a lot by being here, so thank you, Exa. Um, and a second sampling campaign in January, and then further evaluation. So I'd like to thank uh, all of my main uh, collaborators, so Bruno, Bas, Elisa, Maria, my master's student, and Roxanne, our amazing technician, and also, of course, the amazing community of uh, fishers and scientists that have contributed uh, to the CoFish project so far. And uh, yeah, the Swiss National Science Foundation and Stiftung Mercator as well for some funding and all of our incredible project partners from actually quite a lot of different places. So I'm, I'm very thankful and very grateful. And now I will be happy to answer your questions, but I also know you want some coffee and cake. So I'm also happy to answer them during the coffee break. Okay, thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Any question? Bente, please. Uh, can't help myself. Uh, very interesting um, story. Um, you said that um, it took nine months to get started. Um, and you said something that you brought in the scientist a little bit too early. So would your recommendation be, you could regard the, the, the citizens here as the users, maybe also the politicians, but the users of the result. Um, uh, any, any ideas on how you could have included the scientist earlier, or would you do the same again, that you would, uh, you know, talk to the users, the citizens first, thoroughly? Well, yeah, so I did, I mean, there was a six months before the nine months, there was a six months phase before the nine months where I was just preparing everything, um, and then, of course, there was the nine months, so I think what I would do now was definitely have conversations with the scientists and find out exactly what the levels of expertise and, you know, make a list at least of topics, but maybe I wouldn't bring everyone in at the first kickoff meeting from the start. Um, I felt that the scientists also felt frustrated because they weren't, we were, I mean, I think it was, it was good in a way that they were not uh, talking and they were listening and that was really encouraged, but I think for them that was really frustrating. And I think it's more likely um, to get more engagement after we've passed maybe a few iterations of what the fishers could possibly want. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> okay, please. Thank you, that was an Excellent uh, documentation of a co-created project. I just wondered what you did with the fact that what they talked about at the beginning where the fish were small, it was better when the lake wasn't so clear, and then you started to study phosphorus, but I was wondering where that, mm -hmm. you know, because about clarity, but I, I didn't hear it come back around to like, how did you deal with them saying, we liked it better the other way, and now you're studying the thing about they don't like it that way. Well, they don't like it being uh, clean, but they, they're the ones who challenge the standardization. So really, like, yes, we need, if I understood correctly, your question is that we're not bringing it back to the fish, or... I wondered, I wondered how in the conversations about the study, like, do they think that what you're doing is going to prove them right? I find that the, that's often what happens is that the science process is to show that I was right <laughs> from the beginning. Yeah, I think that that's what they expect. They expect to be proven right, but it's also a result of their proven wrong. Um, and I don't, I don't really know the answer to, no one knows yet the answer to the question. And so I think even if we fail to detect phosphorus, it's something about, in terms of, because it's actually very low amounts and it's very close to the detection limit of the machine. Um, that is also a result that, you know, is worth communicating and is worth exploring with them, you know? So, 
I feel that in, in my, from my perspective, it's still a, a win. <laughs> if they can better understand how science works and the fact that you sometimes don't get the right, don't get the answer that you want. And then you just have to go back and reformulate and rethink. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Uh, I yes, have one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Maria. Thank you very much for, oh, sorry, for your presentation. Um, you, you said um, the dif difficulties about approaching to this sector, to the fishermen, uh, mistrust and, and the, their expectation. Um, I'm wondering if you have some recommendations of how to approach them in a way that they will com uh, consider positive or how can we engage with them? or? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I went through the associations, so the established fishing associations, and I was really lucky because, uh, you know, one of the presidents of an association which is in charge of all of the associations um, is actually a former scientist and was very favorable to the project. So he was like an amateur uh, fisherman. And so he was really a kind of voice, and so the project was already in their, so in their newsletters um, before it even started. And so they supported it. They were project partners. Um, although, hang on, the Swiss National Science Foundation didn't allow them to be project partners, but they, were, they sent in letters of intent saying that they supported the project. So really having people on board that can be, you know, act as the kind of voices within their communities um, helps yeah, like to Like having allies inside there. And I think it. also, I must say, as a, as a female foreigner on a Swiss, in a Swiss lake, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, you know? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, that's my point. Uh, I wanted to ask you because uh, I suppose that the gender balance is completely unbalanced in that case. Um, have you found um, any kind of community of women? Yes. Fisher? Yeah. And are they more sensitive or, or not? The, or the approach is more or less well, the same? We have two women on the project. So one of them was posting on the social media and another lady um, in Geneva. It's actually a reviewer comment was that I should diversify the sample. So the first time we submitted the grant was that I should diversify the sample. And so I then included a sentence on diversification measures. Mm -hmm. But and then the reviewer came back the second time around and saying that it wasn't my responsibility to diversify the profession. Okay. So I think, <laughs> so I think that's, I, 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 yes, I mean, yeah. there are a few women and actually they are uh, the two that I've heard of are actually involved in the project. I don't know if that's the general conclusion that makes them more sensitive to no. or more amenable to citizen science. I don't, I don't okay. know, can't draw that conclusion. Okay, thank you. Since there are a little bit more time and Heidi, I, uh, do, do you want to share your question before with uh, the previous or anyone? I think no, it's fine. So maybe you have time to do it on, on the coffee time. All right, so thank you very much for all of you. And I would like to thank again to all, all the speakers uh, for their contribution.
Hello. A warm welcome to the very last session of this EXA conference. The very last session is dealing with issues like empowerment and social justice. And I think climate change is one of the key topics where it becomes very clear the relationship between injustice and climate change. And this is also a very international session, um, people coming from a lot of continents. And the first study is dealing with Nepal. And Naomi, please, the floor is yours. Sorry. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks very much for coming to the last session of the day to listen to me, really grateful. Um, so my talk is about a piece of work I've been doing with some colleagues from Kathmandu Living Labs in, in Nepal, um, where we've been looking at how to use climate change to promote advocacy um, amongst teenagers. Uh, so. The problem that we face uh, in Nepal is that although Nepal only uh, contributes 0.04% to global CO2 emissions, um, temperatures are set to rise above global averages by 2080, and severe impacts of climate change are already being felt. And children stand to suffer more as these impacts worsen over time, yet efforts to engage youth on climate change um, issues are lacking, and citizen science um, could be used to educate young people by enabling them to analyse how their environment is is um, either reacting to or contributing to climate change. So the aim of our study then was to um, test a citizen science approach to increasing climate change and health awareness amongst Nepalese teenagers. And um, w our research questions were, to what extent is it feasible for adolescents to do citizen science? What were the challenges of um, of using mobile technologies in this context, comparing two different settings, and to what extent were Nepali children uh, aware about climate change before and after the intervention. So the setting, uh, we, we, we purposefully chose two very contrasting districts of the country. Uh, the, the district of Jumla is in the remote northwestern mountain areas, area which is uh, three days by road on um, very rough um, terrain from Kathmandu. Uh, this has very poor internet access. And then we worked in Kavre in, the, um, in an area which is just uh, close to Kathmandu, which has relatively good mobile phone connectivity. So th what, what we did was we, we um, identified some existing apps which we could localize into the Nepali language. We made some um, new bespoke citizen science apps for use on tablets. We trained the school children how to collect the data. Uh, they went out and collected data for some days. Then we uh, processed the downloaded data, um, made data visualizations which we showcased to the children and uh, explaining where there were links with climate change where possible. And then we gathered children's experiences um, on, on what they learned from the project. So uh, how did things go? Well, we, uh, the first app we used was uh, a, a localized version of OpenStreetMapper. And the children there collected um, waypoints and made these maps of uh, waste disposal, um, inappropriate waste disposal mostly, uh, water sources and infrastructure, collecting about 640 something um, waypoints. We also translated iNaturalist into Nepali. I think that uh, this app ne needs no introduction here. Many people will be very familiar with it. Um, in Cavalry, it worked really well because they, we were able to sync the, the phones, and so the, the children were able to see this data dashboard here, um, and of the 652 observations, 277 of them could be identified by the iNaturalist community of users, which was great. But in Joomla, although we, the kids were very enthusiastic and collected um, photos of 298 animals and nearly 500 plants, we couldn't sync the data there on site, so we couldn't get the um, identification to work. Um, however, we were able to feed back the, the data by downloading the, um, the data directly from the, the devices. And so the, um, we were able to show the kids some of the photos that they'd been taking and, and discuss some of that with them. And you can see that they, they, they captured some really beautiful biodiversity here. 
Then uh, of the bespoke um, apps which we designed using Open Data Kit, we used, um, we, we used one app for hazard, hazard mapping, where we got the children to, to look in their environment for uh, the impacts of, of climate change. And they were, they were able to um, discover different crop pests, um, landslides, um, failed crops that had been affected by drought, and previous um, flash flood locations. Then we also designed a nutrition app for the, for the kids to uh, explore the nutrition of the, them, the, themselves and their own school community. So um, they were able to measure heights and weights with the weighing equipment that we brought to the school. And they, were, they also then could interview one another or interview members of their community to discover their dietary diversity. So in this, we ask about 24-hour dietary recall and about uh, numerous different types of foods that you see depicted on the slide. And then those are aggregated into 10 different healthy food groups and they get a score out of 10 for their dietary diversity. With the other thing we recorded was unhealthy eating with sentinel eating um, unhealthy foods so the kids could um, find out their unhealthy eating scores at the end of using the app. So uh, after filling in the form, the, the, the form provided them with feedback. They would uh, find out what their di dietary diversity score was um, with sort of happy and unhappy um, emoji kind of images. They also... Um, could, could find out their unhealthy eating score and be uh, advised on, on foods that they could avoid or eat more of. Um, for adults, we, we reported back their BMI, and for children, we reported back the BMI for age Z score. And so if a, if a child was um, underweight or um, severely underweight, then um, warning signs would come up and they'd be advised to seek care from the, their local health facility. Similarly, if they were overweight, they could get, they would be advised to eat less um, high calorie food. Uh, the kids uh, collected 183 measures in, in anthrop uh, anthropometric me measures in Joomla and 67 in Cavre. Um, so we were able to then compare the two districts and we saw higher levels of overweight and obesity in, amongst the children in Cavre than in, in Joomla, but uh, the children were tended to be more stunted in Cavre. And then we, we fed back these kind of plots to the children with photographs of the different foods indicated um, on the plots. So we, for example, um, you can see here that the, um, the kids in Joomla, for example, were eating um, green leafy vegetables well so we, and lots of pulses so we were saying that's really good but it would be good uh, if, you, if you could eat more of the, of the fruits and vegetables for example. Um, similarly the, the children in Cavre were eating um, high levels of, of junk food so we, we fed back uh, that to them and, and encouraged them to eat more of, their, um, of, of fruits and vegetables. Um, the last app that we designed was a plant atlas, which is a photographic um, manual, uh, on, in paper manual, which would, was designed by a colleague of mine, Tom Timberlake, from University of Bristol, for used in a different project. And we, we shared this with the children, and when they found a, a plant that matched to the photograph in the manual, they were then able to uh, scan a barcode to record the, the, the prevalence of, of that um, species. Uh, we also gave them these uh, photographic guides to different pollinator groups and pest groups so they could record the, the pollinators and the pests on the plants that they were observing. So the, the, the children um, made 223 observations. They, they uh, recorded a, a range of different insect visitors and, and um, insect pests as well as um, 36 records of plants affected by disease. So in conclusion then, um, Nepali school children enjoyed using citizen science apps enormously, but the feasibility of ones which had online interactive fu uh, functionality such as iNaturalist was limited depending on the internet connectivity. The children were able to monitor and map climate change impacts, um, including drought, failed crops, landslides, flash floods, and also some causal factors like poor waste management. 
and they were, they were able to explore biodiversity in their areas. They identified under and over nutrition, um, and they learned how agricultural losses might uh, drive increased consumption of things like junk, junk food. But um, although they f the, their knowledge of climate change and nutrition increased, um, the linkages between climate change and the data were often quite unclear to the children. So that's something that would be, need to be touched upon in, our, in future projects. So our next steps are to reduce dependence upon scientists like myself for the feedback in person by building in some kind of data dashboard to these ODK apps. Um, to, we need to design apps which can be used offline with intermittent access to the internet. Um, we, I, I, what I'd like to do is now integrate the, um, the longer term citizen science into youth community projects on climate smart agriculture and diets and combine this, these activities with youth leadership training so that the kids can be supported to do advocacy with their local leaders around climate change impacts and potential um, adaptation options available. So just before I, I close, I just wanted to end with one uh, observation which came out of our qualitative data when we were talking to the kids. One of the young lads, we, we, when we asked them, you know, what, what do you think can be done to, to, uh, about climate change and what can you be doing? And, and remember that these children live in three days drive from the capital city. There's one bus that goes to the area once a day. And he, this, this lad said, oh, we could use less motor transportation. And I, my heart nearly broke when he said that. You know, it's not his responsibility. We need to be looking at pos positive climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts are certainly not their responsibility. But anyway, thank you very much for having me. I'd just like to acknowledge our donors and, and all my collaborators. Collaborators, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A short question: What about the language? No? When do they learn English? Because Inatrist is in English, or do they have their local language? No, we translated it into into um, Nepali. I see. Questions, please. There should be a mic. Hello, thanks. Uh, you said that the connection between, let's say, the impacts that these children witnessed and climate change was not always easy to draw. It's because of the, let's say, data uncertainty causal patterns, or rather that the children ideas of climate change was not necessarily our idea. How could you, let's say, from the beginning, communicate a shared idea of climate change? Because I think, let's say, from his most experience, I feel that one of the problems is really that we have an idea of climate change and causality, which oftentimes doesn't match. Maybe this is a buzzword for, for us and for them doesn't mean much yeah. as such. Thanks. So the, the, the kids did have a, co a concept of what climate change was, but they, they weren't very clear on causes and effects and how uh, differentiating what was a cause and what was an effect of climate change when we first started talking to them. I think that became clearer as they worked with us, but you know, things like collecting data on biodiversity, I mean, there isn't a direct link. And so they were saying, well, I didn't really see what the point of relation to climate change was of me looking at taking photos of all these insects. In a way, there is but uh, on the other hand, uh, as they begin to get um, aware of the biodiversity in their community, then they're paying attention to it, and then they're, they're enabled later on to monitor the impacts of climate change in their, their communities. So that was one area where the linkage wasn't so clear. I think the other area was that, you know, we saw they, they, they could clearly see the link between climate change and the effects upon their crop production, but then how that might then have a knock-on effect upon their their diets and upon their dietary diversity was, was something that we had to kind of draw out together with the children. I don't think it was very obvious for them. Thank you very much. So for our next example, we move to Latin America. Our next speaker gives an example from Argentina. So Letizia, please. <laughs> Sorry. Well, my name is Leticia Castro, 
and together with Valeria Arza and Guillermina Actis, we have, um, we have made this presentation to share with you some insights on our research and innovation action in Buenos Aires, Argentina, that we have carried out with communities during the COVID pandemic in 2020 and 2021, and that is part of the COACT Global Project for Citizen Social Science for Collective Action. So the goal of our research and innovation action is to promote citizen social science tools for environmental justice. And that's why we have formed an alliance with a civil society organization called FARN, who is, who is devoted to environmental advocacy. And the plan was to relaunch a digital platform called WhatsApp Riachuelo. There you have an image. And it was uh, made by, uh, through a co-design process with communities, researchers, and organizations that are concerned uh, of environmental problems to support their collective action towards environmental justice. So this is our case study. This is the Matanza Riachuelo River Basin. It's the most polluted basin in Argentina. And it's a clear example of environmental injustice the environmental justice approach in the project is, re is aligned with the citizen social science appro um, approach, as in both cases there is an emphasis in uh, public participation in environmental policy. So um, in this case, uh, the basin is a, a, a place where almost 12% of the total Argentina population lives and 40% of them live in um, extreme vulnerable conditions. Since 2008, the Supreme Court condemned the government, the national government, the subnational governments, and 14 municipalities to uh, implement a sanitation policy and participation of the population is mediated through FARN and other civil society organizations. Um, well, this is a COAX Global Project Research Cycle, and in this case, we are going to focus on the Knowledge Coalition Building Moment, the, co the research co-design, and also the implementation of informed consent procedures. In COAX proposal, informed consent goes beyond a formal agreement, and it also includes an ethical approach and a reflection on research practices. In our case, our main challenge that was that uh, there is a lack of um, tradition in social sciences in Argentina of informed consent procedures, and none of the institutions had ethics committees. So um, as, as the restrictions, uh, the, the lockdown um, went along in, tw in, tw in 2020 and 2021, we could not be able to meet face to face with people and explain them on what it consists. And there was a great variety of participants, some of them lacked connectivity and uh, didn't have digital skills. So the, the question was how to design an ethical approach that is respectful to COAX requirements, but also suitable for all participants in a context where informed consent is not the rule. And we had a, a strategy that was, um, on the one side, rigorous to accomplish the requirements of the global project, but also flexible, flexible enough to um, adapt to the different participants and the different types of activities. So, um, in a general way, we, we have used plain language, we have think of other formats for um, giving consent, such an oral format, and also to provide information to the participants. For example, we have developed a short video with the most important information in the, docu in, in the document. And for people who had bad connectivity or no digital training, we have used the communication channels that they usually use as WhatsApp, and we have tried with asynchronous methods so they can listen or read to the messages when, whenever they had connectivity. And another central aspect of, the, of our research and innovation action was the creation of collaborative spaces in order to engage co-researchers to co-design the digital platform. And 
uh, this is uh, the public participation in science is a, a, a trending topic in uh, in literature of citizen uh, of the studies of of science, but in our case, we have um, reviewed some typologies that identify different forms of participation. And for our case study, we started with institutions such as civil society organizations that have what, is, what could be called an institutionalized participation in the trial in the judiciary process. Um, and then thought of getting those who participate at the margin or the amateurs, their vocational amateurs, researchers that express feelings for, of love for their subjects and for their neighborhoods. But we uh, find out that for um, getting to those uh, amateurs, we needed some other actors or stakeholders that that we are calling here a hybrid because they are both institutions but also community actors who are linked to, to local networks in a at a neighborhood scale. And they act as, as our ambassadors to reach to uh, amateurs and neighbors. So uh, the main challenges were again due to the, the restrictions uh, during the pandemic that in Argentina um, uh, lasted till end of tw uh, tw uh, 2021. And it was very difficult to explain the engagement that we expected from them because there is no tradition of citizen science in Argentina. And also because uh, there is a general feeling of disappointment and distrust regarding the possibility of the river to be sanitated um, the river is seen as a sacrifice zone where um, no better future is possible. So the question was how to engage these distrustful actors so they, so they can become co-researchers and co-design the platform. And we had mainly two strategies. The first, the first one was to recognize and learn from other experiences of co-creation uh, or co-production of knowledge in the basin. At first, uh, during the knowledge coalition building, we, we contacted institutions, mainly civil society organizations that are med mediators within the, um, um, uh, between the Supreme Court and a population that want to participate in the public policy definition. But we also contacted professional researchers who were involved in citizen science projects in the basin uh, to identify the benefits and the constraints of the approach and the potential uses uh, of um, citizen social, citizen science tools. And during the co-design co process, we uh, tried, um, we get to this hybrid actors that I've mentioned before, uh, to get to the amateurs and the neighbors. These community organizations, mainly community libraries or neighborhood associations were our ambassadors in the territory and um, with our local connections, we have managed to get more and more people. And uh, through this process, we realized that there was a, a big interest in uh, environmental education. So that's why in the last phase, the implementation and dissemination phase, we have also reached institutions that are, that are interested in uh, developing this environmental education. And another strategy to engage this disappointed and distrustful actors is to consider their, their, the emotional aspects involved in the, in the subject and the proximity factor. So we have appealed to their emotions. Um, we have uh, considered the proximity to the river and um, try to imagine with them some possible futures. We appeal to the, their memories, their image of the city and and they, re, they remember uh, moments when the river was, wasn't as polluted and with this image they could be able to uh, think of a future where next generations could enjoy the riverside. And also with uh, vocational amateurs that were interested in protecting natural areas, we find that they express feelings of love for the biodiversity and the natural spaces, and they really appreciate patrimony. So we have included those aspects in the platform. So to sum up, 
um, we can say that uh, in our research and innovation action, we needed to be flexible enough in our methods to adapt to the circumstances and recognize the need to relate to previous collective experience of community organization and knowledge production. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that there are also other projects um, which felt that this hybrid or mediating organizations are extremely important. Can you give us an example which was perhaps one of the most helpful ones and what makes them so successful? Yes, but um, because what I haven't said is that uh, we first thought that individuals might be interested in being citizen science uh, easily, but then realized that there were some uh, community libraries or other neighborhood associations who really know, knew their publics, uh, their, their, their neighbors, and they gave us uh, examples on how to communicate with them, which activities they, they might be interested in. We learned uh, which ad agendas they had. We, we took part in their activities, so we got to know this their, their publics, and, and we also uh, presented the project in their activities so people got engaged in that way. Um, so they were really, uh, really important for us. No more questions, thank you again. Thank you. Then we move back. <laughs> back to Europe. To presentation by two persons, Pia and Kim. Perhaps you will, you will be presented and it's dealing with heat again. Um, hello everyone. Happy to see still some faces here Friday evening. My name is Pia. I have a startup for citizen science and science communication in Switzerland called Kata. Hello everyone. Also, <clears throat> I'm pretty happy to, to see you guys here. Um, I'm Kim, uh, and I'm working uh, to HEDU, which is also an organization that supports in developing uh, softwares and hardwares to citizen science and projects. And today we're going to talk about a project called uh, 321 Heiß, or 321 uh, Hot. It's a project about heat islands in settlement areas uh, because they're com becoming hotter and hotter and longer and longer. And uh, we wanted to do citizen science about that. And whenever we do citizen science, we try to find a name and, and a visual that is somehow appealing to everyone. So not only people already interested in science or, or interested in climate change take part, but also other people who may think seeing this and reading this, it might be fun being part of this project. And so, um, how, how was it set up, this whole project? It was an idea that we had in our team um, that we wanted to do a project like that. We had the name already, but of course we couldn't do it alone. There's only six of us, um, and we, we don't know people in different municipalities, um, so we needed a partner. So we proposed the project to the canton of Argau. It's like the state where, where our company is located and told them, look, we have an idea for a project. Wouldn't you want to do this? And fortunately, they were really happy that we contacted them because they have, of course, they have a climate strategy and they had the word participation in there, but they had no idea to do anything participatory. Um, so um, we had our main partner for the project. Um, but then, of course, we needed sensors um, that were easy to use for the citizen scientists. Um, we found Reedu. Kim is going to talk some more about the sensors later. Um, and the most important partners were, of course, the local partners, where, where we actually measured um, in, in cities and also one tiny little village in Switzerland. And um, there we had the canton of Argau helping us and finding the right municipalities to start with, because this was the first time we were doing this project. And we chose them by because the canton knew there were people sitting in there who want to do something um, 
but they were alone by now and they didn't have like the, the, the basics for, for um, starting change. So they contacted them um, and they became our local partners in the project. And then, of course, um, we also had a lots of communication partners that were in really important for recruiting citizen scientists. We had the um, Cantonal Natural History Museum in the project. We had media, local and regional media. Um, we had local associations and really important for that kind of project, um, local parties, especially the Green Party, who recruited lots of people to take part in this project. And uh, here yeah, you see the different municipalities that took part in the project. Our goals, um, there were different goals. Um, one was to inform locally about heat in settlement areas and, and what to do against it. So people actually knew that this was going on because many say it's just that it was hot, but, but that, yeah, that was all. Then we wanted to define the most important heat hotspot in certain municipalities and important means important for the people living there so they could choose where, where am I and where do I want something to change. Um, then, uh, of course, residents in school classes measured, um, should measure their heat hotspots themselves. And um, we didn't only want data, but we also wanted change to happen. Um, so we wanted municipalities and the residents working together to develop a basis for action to reduce heat in the most important uh, places. And this is um, how we did it. And the first thing we did was sitting together with the re responsible people from the municipalities and telling them what we want to do and what they had to do. So we prepared a very detailed checklist for them um, so they could prepare because normally these municipalities don't have time and don't have money. And it worked in a way that the canton paid us. So it was kind of a, this project was kind of a gift to the municipalities and the only thing they had to pay was, was their work. Um, but we did, did a lot of work in coordinating everything. Um, we then started the project um, with a, a climate walk in each municipality that we measured that was um, uh, organized by the Nat Natural History Museum and also communicated through their channels. So people knew a bit more about why, why they should take part um, and what is it about heat in settlement areas. We also visited school classes and gave one school lecture about climate change and heat to prepare um, teachers and school classes for measuring. And then we had a kickoff workshop. Uh, where is it? Oh, here. With all the participating um, citizens, we went to each municipalities and sat together with the citizens and at um, everywhere there was always a responsible person from the canton and one or even at, in some municipality even three people who were um, from administration, from the local administration. We decided where, where to measure and how to measure. People measured their way to work or their way, their way to school or back so they didn't have to make too much extra effort. Um, and then there was a measurement period of three weeks and we always told them some day before when to measure at the hottest days and there were two measurement windows, one in the morning during two hours and one in the evening during two hours where in all the five municipalities the people went out at the same time. Um, and then in the end there was another workshop um, where people came together again and we then decided which spots in each municipality do we analyze in more detail. So they had to decide which are the hottest spots and also which are the coolest spots and, and they want to have exact data on these spots. And there was ice cream in the end, that's the, the, the picture here. Um, with the kids just to say a, a, a little bit of thank you uh, for participating in this project. There are no results yet because these final workshops were in the beginning of September and we are analyzing the data right now but one interesting thing that we see is that um, sometimes the, the, the cool spots that people defined as cool spots are warmer than some of the hot spots. Um, and we are now going to find out a bit more of why they have the feeling that these some spots are cooler than others. And now, yeah. please. 
Yeah, uh, as a partner, we develop the hardware and, and uh, the software as well. So this SenseBox, we developed to be portable and can be carried for everyone. So I think the first challenge was <clears throat> designing uh, a portable device that could be easily uh, uh, managed by, managed by uh, everyone, so a, a wide, broad um, audience. So, and, and here, uh, uh, regarding the data currency, uh, we did some uh, airflow simulation to taking out the uh, air from inside the, the case to not, uh, um, not leave the, the device um, taking the data from in inside the case, but outside from the environmental. And also we did some um, comparison data with this uh, meteorological station with uh, our partner in the University of Münster. So the sense box, the device is over there in the, in the orange circle. And uh, for the, the comparison, you, we can see the graph and an average is uh, one uh, degree of difference, but uh, is the following the graph of the meteorological station. And all the data that was collected during these three weeks um, was uploaded in the OpenSense map, which is a, a open source platform, and where we, uh, we already uh, upload all the, the, the environmental data that our sensors uh, collect. In, 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 in the world. Um, and just some, some learnings uh, for, for us, because there are already four municipalities that came up to us and said, we want to do this next year as well. Um, one learning, the main learning was um, to order the sensors early enough we had, because we had big problems. Um, because of um, delivery, and um, deliveries were late of certain parts, and then they had to put together these sensors, I don't know, in one week, 24 hours, <laughs> day and night, they put together um, all these sensors, and this had, of course, then came up lots of follow-up problems during the whole project. And we didn't have time to test the sensors and so on. Um, we were surprised how, how interested and involved school classes were, and we're going to involve them more in, in the smallest city. Um, the school classes even prepared posters of their experiences and, and the results um, of the project. They didn't have to, they, they just wanted to do it. Um, and um, municipalities, they wanted very detailed information on how much time they need and what exactly they have to do, and we're still going to work on that. And the ice cream in the end was very important, not just as a thank you, but also to come together again, not in a workshop setting, but, but in, a, in a like friendly setting and eating ice cream and talking about the project again. And many things came up during the, the ice cream eating. And of course, it was not only us who was involved in the project, but many more people. Um, I won't read all the names. They are here, and about 150 citizen scientists. Thanks to you. And, yeah. <laughs> Uh, great to see how the sense boxes make their way um, to the world. So are there questions? Please. Can you explain a little bit more about these kind of walks that you organize? So, because how they move around the, 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 the citizens, and, and there was some kind of protocol behind that, or it the, was their choice? Or? When when they measure? Yes. Um, there, the protocol was that they had to measure within this this time windows, all all at the same days, and with the sense box is very easy to use it turn it on when you start walking. And then we defined, they always, they always did walk the same way. So we defined in the, in, the, in the first workshop where everyone is walking. So we had as, as much of the, of the municipality covered. So they said, okay, I walk here and said, oh no, but you live here, so maybe I turn around here and then I go there. And they always did that same turn, so you can compare the data from the different days and they always walk the same way. And that, that was it, that was the whole protocol. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe two questions. Uh, one is if the municipalities is going to improve these hotspots 
okay, how, how is this going on? And then the second one, are those data even useful to calibrate uh, satellites that are already picking up high definition uh, pictures of heat in urban area that, or you can contrast these two informations. Or are you planning something in this direction too? Um, yes, um, there is also the Canton has climate maps where they also have models of how hot does it get where, but these are, this is data only. And what we did in the project is, is data. Um, this one thing is additional data to what there is already to, to check and compare the data, but also feelings. Um, where do people feel like it's hot or it's nice to be there? And, and what, can, what can we do to make other places, uh, make a feeling there that it, it is a cool place? And what they are, they're going to change, um, it's not in our hand. <laughs> Uh, it's the municipalities, but by taking part in this project, they had to promise that they, they take part in all the workshops, they measure themselves, and they're going to bring in the results um, from the project to all the discussion um, where this data could be relevant. But very often, they were not the people who could, because if there's a construction site and there's a people for environment who was part of our project, um, the environment person cannot do anything for construction, but he can only tell um, the other guy, the other person, look, we measured here and people said it's really important that we plant some more trees here. And it was interesting in, in the discussion in the final workshops where there were people um, and administrative people and citizen scientists and then we were discussing about certain points and then the people from administration said yeah yeah we are, we are sometimes they were already planning something and then we decided okay um, then maybe we're not going to measure this point but we're going to measure somewhere else where there's not yet um, planned that they they build trees or open up um, a little stream or stuff like that so they decided to do something else so for future construction site they they can take this data and say you have to do something here. But it's going to take some years to, <laughs> for things to happen, really. Last question, please. Um, yeah, very interesting in the uh, nature of what young people themselves feel as cool or hot. I mean, uh, what, what, how are you going to develop that idea that, you know, that their subjective feelings about um, hot and cold and warm and so on? Young people have a very different in uh, sensitivity and impression of, of heat, I, I reckon. So what, how are you going to develop the project to actually look at the subjective um, responses to what their data shows? Um, well, the idea, we still have to think about that in detail because it came up now that it, it really um, differs, the feeling from, from what we have measured. And I'm not sure how, how to develop the project, but for sure we're, we're going to look more at, at these places where people felt like it was cool, although it was warmer. And what is there? I think it would be really interesting to see. Um, what, is, it, is it similar in all the different municipalities where we have that phenomenon? Is it places where there are trees or where there are not many cars, where there's a lot of wind? Um, and I think we have to look at it in more detail but there's no detail planned yet, plans yet. Yeah, thank you very much. Not only heat is a problem, also drought. <laughs> and our next um, speaker is coming from Spain, Amaranta, please. Oh. How do I change the this? Yes, you can exactly. This one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Amaranta Heredia, and I'm here to present the Citizen Observatory of Drought. The project is based in the University Pablo de Olavide in Seville, and is led by Pilar Paneque, who unfortunately could not be here today. I think she's following us on YouTube though. Uh, we are a bigger team, interdisciplinary, Jesus and Regina are part of it, but also other people like Annabelle who's in the audience and here today. And uh, yes, so uh, the Citizen Observatory of Drought is a citizen science project whose main aim is basically to change 
the way we manage the risk of drought and to involve citizens in the decision-making process. So ultimately, we want to affect uh, policy making, but on the way, we really want to first inform the society because like drought is a very complex issue, especially in the context of climate change, and we believe there's not enough information in order to affect policy. The project has been funded by the FECIT, which is the Federation of Science and Technology in Spain, and it's like three years old. We had a first year of funding in 2020, and now since July, we will run until next September at least. But our goal is that it's a long-term project uh, in the upcoming years. So, first of all, I would like to talk about the rationale of this, of this project. So, as I have said, drought is a very complex risk and we feel the need to transmit the message that we have, well, drought and scarcity. So, drought has been measured very well, basically, how much it rains and uh, the different periods and, for example, like, Southern Europe and especially the Mediterranean and Spain are the space, like the spaces with the territories with the highest risk of drought. Like Spain is basically the, the driest country of Europe. But then we have, uh, and, and these droughts will increase in frequency and intensity. This we know for sure. But there's another element that is very, very important that is basically scarcity which is not the physical component, but the socio-institutional component. So what do, we do? what do we do with water? What do we, we use it for? How do we make those decisions and who, who makes those decisions? This is what mostly affects the vulnerability of the territory and of the community. Uh, so yes. Uh, these are the six sustainable development goals, basically, that our project uh, addresses. And as I have said, I think what we want is to include citizens in, in this process of policy making. Like traditionally, basically, there have been a lot of uh, different initiatives of discussions with uh, stakeholders, so basically governments and like water management offices and farmers but it has not been, um, like citizens or society at large has not been included. And we believe this is very important, not only, I mean, because it is the fair thing to do, I mean, water is a public good, but it's also a financial resource. And this makes it for a very, like, high conflict uh, issue that we believe will benefit from involving more parties. And also this would, um, create more institutional trust. And uh, so I will first uh, explain the first, like the first round of the funding, what we did, and then I will explain what we're doing now. So basically, uh, the first year, the thing that we focused on was on developing a vulner drought vulnerability index. So in 2017, before this project started, Paneke and uh, Jesus Vargas developed this index to measure vulnerability to drought. There are other indexes in, the, in science, it's not the first one, but what they tried to innovate was to include the, the socio-institutional factors. I will go in a minute with it. So they, this, this index basically has 16 indicators three of exposure, three of sensitivity, and 10 indicators of adaptive capacity. And of the 10 indicators of adaptive capacity, there are three indicators that for, for which we need the contribution of citizens in order to calculate, which are the perception of climate change, perception of the risk of drought, and institutional trust. These uh, factors, institutional factors, ha had been for a long time in the literature um, identified as very key, but no one had started to measure them because it's actually much more complex. You cannot just go to databases or maps and calculate them, but you actually need the input from people. And this is what we did through a, through a questionnaire that we had in our, in our website. We asked people on these issues and with their answers, we integrated this into the, the formula for the drought vulnerability index, and we applied it to the territory, basically, of just southern Spain, 
southern Spain, Andalusia, and we calculated the different vulnerability to drought of the different, uh, different sectors of every river basin. Uh, this gave some, some preliminary results and it also allowed us to test the methodology. And uh, we did, I mean, all these maps were available uh, in our website and we also had some extra information that uh, hydrological information is usually available online, but it's very difficult to access because at least in Spain, we have different like a national government and regional government and the, and the information is all spread around. And one of our main goals was to concentrate it and make it more accessible in only one place. Um, and yes, so in the second funding round, what we're doing now, we're now going from Andalusia, like from the regional level to national level, and we have started to publish different geoviewers. So far we have done uh, only two, one for under, uh, the state of underground water, another one for the state of su surface water. And again, uh, we're talking about 25 river basins and seven different public organisms. And the main difficulty as well is that some of the information that should be available by law and should be public is not even public, so we do all the work of contacting the organism, requesting the information, and then gathering it. And also, publishing these maps puts a bit of public pressure because sometimes we publish it without the data of some region if it's not available, and then, of course, the organism says, okay, this is missing, and then they feel the pressure to provide this information, hopefully. And then the other action that we will do in November is a national survey with 1,600 respondents. So what we want to have is a representative sample of the whole of Spain with different factors, just not gender and age, but for example, we will also include a factor of whether the territory was affected in the last drought, because this also affects drought perception. Um, with this sample, we will again apply the formula of the drought uh, vulnerability index for the whole of Spain and also for every different region. And the last and, in my opinion, the most exciting part of our uh, project this year, well, it will happen next year, it's a civic lottery and a public assembly that we will do basically in, in one municipality, in Baeza, and we will take 25 residents of the, of the town from different socio-demographic uh, strata to uh, like select it randomly and uh, bring them all together to discuss. And uh, hopefully this also has, this method already has some legitimacy because recently there was this climate assembly in Spain and also in other countries that has used a similar method. Uh, and just to say a bit more about this topic, Baeza is in the south of Spain, in Andalusia, and is a, in an agriculture uh, region where there's a lot of uh, olive production. Like olive groves have traditionally not been irrigated, they just use whatever rain, but in the last four decades, they have been started to be watered more and more. Something that we have found very important is even though 80% of the water in Spain is used for agriculture, most people still believe that it's for household consumption and more campaigns to save water have focused on what a person can save at their home when this actually has a very little impact proportionally to overall water consumption. So in this town, even though we will be selecting just residents, let's say common citizens, most of the people are involved directly or indirectly in agriculture. And they, I mean, the stakes are high because most of the income of the, of the, of the town comes from this. So what we want to do is to meet with them. As I said, normally you would only meet with the stakeholders and now we meet with the a representation of the general population to present them with different scenarios of climate change and drought and discuss different measures. What can be done and what would you want to see done in your town taking into account all these factors. We will have experts, of course, present some of the information and help them moderate the discussion. And after this, we will produce a document of recommendations that we will help gather to bring to the public authorities to hopefully eventually enact some, some change or at least give them the opportunity to uh, have a more informed policy. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. On the map which you showed us, the adaptive capacity on the municipalities at the coastline had been lower than the others provided. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So basically, well, the, the adaptive, the, the purple is adaptive capacity. So the, the darker it is, the higher it is. And then the vulnerability is down. So as you see, the higher the adaptive capacity is, the less vulnerable a place is. So it's basically the, the coast in Malaga that has the highest risk of drought because they have the, the least adaptive capacity. And basically what came from the analysis of the data is that the adaptive capacity is key in determining how, so, so you can uh, calculate the exposure. Yeah. And why, why is it so low at the coast or lower at in the rest of the... Well, because there's less institutional trust and there's less perception of the risk and basically there's just more distrust because of the management that has happened. There's a, like the coast of, of Malaga is basically, there's a lot of urbanization, there's a lot of agriculture as well and there has been a lot of conflict with that. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Please, again. Yeah, sorry to ask a second one, um, Catherine, but um, I love the idea of you developing this citizen's jury or the citizens' assembly as an extension of the citizen res science research project. And I just wanted to commend you for, the, for, for taking that on. I think it's a great model that many other citizen science projects could adopt or, uh, 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 yeah, explore. <laughs> You're censoring me. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question regarding the availability of the maps that you gather to put in online. Mm -hmm. uh, have you considered anything else in terms of accessibility of that information for the citizens, or is it just putting the data available? Because for some people, it's not very accessible, the data by itself, and they may need some help interpreting them, or... Have you considered activities in terms of that to engage more the citizens? Yeah, it is true that, I mean, uh, one good change we have done, we have made the maps of this new uh, cycle easier to use because the previous one, I mean, it's a geo viewer, so of course you need some information. But uh, not in term, terms of maps, but we also have a lot of media presence, like there has because the observatory, um, Citizen Observatory of Drought is gaining a bigger, bigger name, so we give a lot of interviews about the state of things. So that's, I would say, is the information from the maps and from the research made a bit more accessible for like TV or interviews or things. But I don't know if you have some suggestions of a more accessible type of maps. It would be very interesting to hear if you know no, some. Just, just wondering because okay. we have tried the same in terms of we, we are also working with data that is available from public sources and it, and it is not so findable, but also it's not very easy to interpret it by citizens, by themselves. So we're considering how to do that online without requiring like a group of scientists directly interpreting mm -hmm. it for the citizens. So if you have any experience on that. I mean, I think more and more there's in media also more like infographies and yeah. some newspapers using more and more maps that are more visual and different, so, but still, is what's the level of accessibility, but yeah, okay. that's something to think about, thanks. Please. Um, thank you. I may be building on the colleague comments on civic assemblies. Um, civic assemblies generally are very structured according to indeed pre-legitimized principles. In which phase of the civic assembly do you think, um, let's say, citizen gathered data from the observatory could uh, be useful, be used in the kind of, uh, in, let's say, preliminary phase, in the deliberation, in checking the results? Because we are particularly interested because we are trying to merge civic monitoring with civic assemblies, with the observatory of civic assemblies mm -hmm. in based in Milan. But we still, let's say, are hesitant on in which phase it could really contribute. So if you have good experiences, or at least a plan 
for mm. where to merge them, that would be helpful. Yeah. Thank I you. mean, we have not even started really. And what I feel, I mean, of course, everyone will be provided with access to the observatory. But what the plan is now is that we will prepare a specific information because it's going to be based on the municipality. So here we have maps for Andalusia or for the whole of Spain. And what we want to do is gather more specific relevant data and prepare different like documents and things. So uh, I don't think there's a specific specific plan. And also, it's a very small project. It's going to be a two-day deliberation. So it's also not going to be like, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Our next speaker, unfortunately, did not um, show up, so we are now really coming to the very last, last talk. And then if you look at the title, Citizen um, Science, so still Science for Action, I think it, on uh, one hand, it summarizes what you already heard in this session, and on the other hand, um, it also shows that the relationship between the different disciplines, the natural scientists and the social scientists, became a bit um, yeah. tighter during the last year. So I'm very curious what we will present, Mayan, please. Thank you very much. I hope you still all have the energy for this last talk and I will try to keep it short and that we can discuss a bit after it. So um, actually we'll talk uh, today about the uh, project uh, Terrifica and uh, some of you maybe heard of this project before because it's kind of coming to its end this year and uh, it is a Horizon 2020 project that stands for Territorial Responsible Research Innovation Fostering Climate Action. And this project actually set out on the kind of foundings that were actually built in, uh, on, in the city of Bonn here in Germany, uh, like several years ago, where when there were um, huge floods occurring and um, the local initiative actually uh, tried to um, ask citizens to help them and to uh, build kind of a map of the places where uh, floods uh, severely hit the, the city. So um, not only um, city and the government benefited from them because they actually knew where to um, uh, help and what to do with uh, certain parts of the city, but citizens um, became aware uh, of their neighborhoods and tried to connect the, um, uh, the events that are happening there with uh, actually climate change and started thinking about it. So on top of it, um, this uh, European project uh, was built and uh, in this project we have six pilot regions and all these pilot regions were gathered for um, different uh, issues that are facing related to climate change. So um, when we began uh, and when we were writing this proposal we all had some kind of different ideas what kind of issues we will be tackling in this project. So for Belgrade and for whole southeastern Europe we thought that we will um, deal with uh, water issues as well as flooding because in 2014 we had those huge floods in Southeast Europe that really um, affected a lot of lives and um, in Barcelona they wanted also to tackle water issues then um, in Brittany and um, actually in France and in uh, Oldenburg in Germany they wanted to tackle uh, drought problems while in Poznan and Minsk they wanted to, to deal more with the air quality. So we came together and what we did for the beginning was that we uh, made a crowd mapping tool where actually all the citizens of these pilot regions uh, could uh, pin on the map their, as you said, subjective feelings that they feel with um, different uh, topics related to climate change. And these topics were either temperature, water, wind, um, air, quality, and soil. And they could pin both positive examples and negative examples on the map. So it's, it was completely subjective. They could uh, say, here I feel uh, well, here in, uh, on this particular spot I feel well because uh, there is a lot of um, a green um, trees or there is, a, there is a park I like here because I see a fountain, I can drink water here um, during um, warm uh, summer months or I feel here there is a um, um, quite, uh, the, their quality is really bad and so on. But not only that, but they could uh, directly on this pin, they could propose themselves um, different kind of innovative solutions. So um, 
we, we asked them to, uh, to pin it there and we then, I will tell you in a minute what we did with all this. But before that, um, I wanted to say how did we ask them to, to uh, put the pins on the map. So we made a huge uh, campaign in newspapers, in digital media, but uh, when we started with it, we realized that in Serbia at that moment, there were only four uh, citizen science projects. So nobody even knew what citizen science was. So first we had to translate the term citizen science and to try to explain what it is and what it would bring to the people to even join this kind of uh, uh, project. And when we talked with our partners in France and in um, Barcelona, we had quite uh, the opposite problems at that moment because um, they, uh, we said that our people are willing to participate, but um, sometimes they don't know how or they lack ICT skills to do so, while in Paris and Barcelona they were saying that they have quite a problem to recruit people because there are so many initiatives that are asking similar things of them, like to, to um, pin something on the map or to help them, I don't know, um, just to, 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 to do what, whatever kind of citizen science. So, so we had much more pins actually and much more citizen scientists involved in the project that they did, which, which I found really um, strange. And what we realized that we had to do was that we had to go really on the terrain. As I said, to explain to people what science, citizen science is. And we um, constructed some, as you see on this picture, like physical objects that are representing our mapping and we were, we were explaining the problems that are related to climate change, how they can participate, what they see in their surrounding, what they can think about every day while they are going to the work or even as they're, if they're tourists in Belgrade. So we had this kind of category, you don't have to be like a resident, you can be a tourist or you can be there just passing by or visiting somebody. So. Um, what we did is also that we um, um, provided them uh, like on-site tablets, so uh, they didn't even have to have um, their own phones because we, we specifically went to uh, regions where there are people who are underrepresented, who are actually kind of marginalized because they're, as you know, mostly uh, even severely hit uh, related to, to uh, climate change than the people who are like in the city center and who are um, kind Kind of more aware of uh, all of these um, these um, potential like use of ICT in 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 citizen science. So um, this is what we did, and this is our um, kind of result. So these are all the pins that we got on the map. So they are in all these different categories. But what we actually wanted to do with these pins is that um, we uh, bring together all stakeholders. So policymakers, um, researchers, then um, pre uh, CSOs and um, um, uh, business representatives, and that we all sit together and look through these maps and think about where and why are these pins here and agree on what can we all do um, about it. So find a topic that will be of mutual interest. And that's what I said that when we began this project, we had one idea, but it turned out almost in all pilot regions that we are kind of, kind of not able to work on these issues because not all the stakeholders want to agree that they want to work on uh, problems related to air quality because it's kind of a really sensitive issue in our country. And they didn't want to even agree that they want to work on the water issues also in Serbia and in Spain, because in Spain they said that it's also kind of really sensitive issue. So we had to really spend a few workshops all together um, and to go through some even fights that we had to kind of mediate between stakeholders because it was really um, hard to find a subject and uh, exact locations that we all want to work um, on. And in Belgrade we managed to realize that um, actually um, heat, um, um, uh, heat islands are the ones that we want to tackle so that we, we all agree that there are certain bus stops that lack um, kind of shading during the summer that we all lack um, on, on some places like fountains that we can get easy uh, like uh, access to water during summer. So we in the end we, we found some um, some some issues that we uh, all want to uh, work on, and um, uh, afterwards 
our idea was not to exactly solve these specific issues, but to try to make action plans all together and to see what would be the way uh, and how to empower citizens themselves in future to, so they are able to, um, uh, to solve the issues in their neighborhoods. Who, so who to contact, how to contact, what, what are the exact steps if they want to um, uh, plant a tree or get a fountain in their neighborhood. So um, basically this is it, I didn't translate it, but these are some comments that we got and for example, as I said, for this bus stop, they even proposed, for example, this, this what we all agreed on, this bus stop, they proposed that they want some kind of um, innovative artistic solution that can be the, the fade or they said that um, there, are, um, there are a lot of places that look like, um, like really um, uh, like poisonous air or, po or the ways that are, there is like really really, really, really hot parts of the, the land, so I can't even translate it. It's so um, that's basically it, and, and thank you, and I hope that I summarized how important <laughs> this is to, for citizens to participate and to get to understand um, in this way how are uh, climate change uh, uh, affecting their neighborhoods and what they can do to better adapt to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's interesting um, to learn not only from your talk that um, a lot of people would like to come to action, but it's so difficult to um, have the same problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, please. Thanks a lot for, for the presentation. Um, who were the partners in Minsk and did they ch face the similar challenges that you did in Belgrade with explaining what citizen science is, having to translate the term in Russian and Belarusian and, and so on and so forth? Thanks. Yes, um, actually Minsk had many problems. In the end, they had to be even excluded in the way from the project because of their um, local governmental issues. And there was a kind of an, um, an NGO that was um, related mostly to um, high schools and uh, comprised from uh, actually secondary school teachers. And they had a lot of different type of problems, but I would say that we in Barcelona and Minsk, we were like facing the same issues, but just even to try to bring together all these stakeholders and to try to mediate these, these talks was really, really um, complicated and tiring. Yeah. Um, you worked with many different stakeholders like residents um, and companies and stakeholders and I was wondering who was most open to actually change something and do something. Can you tell something about yeah. which group is maybe more or less open? Yeah, actually I would say that um, first I was really surprised to see that the governmental representatives were quite open and uh, as you said in your talk they always say we can do something but we don't have the money for that. So um, they were willing to, to understand, to try to find the ways to, to help but without the money. I would say the most reluctant were the people from the industry sectors who see the direct um, benefit from um, certain um, issues that are unresolved. <laughs> <laughs> One more, sorry. <laughs> uh, so coming back to the challenges you mentioned about the workshops and having to mediate uh, different stakeholders and their attitudes and coming together w with problems, would you recommend an approach that works, worked best in bringing them together and also an approach to mediate those issues so that everybody finally came up with, uh, with an idea they could work on together? Yeah, we tried several approaches, but um, I found this um, idea of the workshop where we um, kind of have this scenario workshop where they're thinking uh, like about resolving some issue without any kind of boundaries. So no financial boundaries, uh, no um, law boundaries or any, any other boundaries. Then they come down all and then they try to um, find some solution, but Whenever you come to reality back, then that and to exact uh, to find to find exact solutions for exact problems, that's where again things start to be um, a little bit tricky. But I think that it's the point that we, we worked with the same people over time, and then I think that this mutual trust that starts building during the time is the one that opens most of the gates. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. You. For the final words, I now hand over to Dorte. Yeah. Um, very shortly. So um, this session ended a bit early. Um, that means we have a little bit of time. I would like to say, get yourself a drink and make yourself comfortable, but this is not allowed, of course, in this room, so sorry for that. Um, we will start with uh, wrapping up and closing of the conference uh, um, 5.50 or 10 to 6. And um, yeah, please stay or come back at this time. And it's worth staying because there will be a wrap up from Johannes Vogel. Um, and also we will release the long kept secret and uh, celebrate it as well. So stay tuned.
Okay. So welcome again. This is a bit of a different setting. <laughs> Probably only just one dinosaur in this hall, and that's me. So welcome um, to uh, yeah this fantastic conference. It's absolutely amazing, and it's absolutely timely that um, you have tried and succeeded to link science, bottom-up civic democratic engagement, and really big global challenges um, in such a very, very forward-looking and exciting way. I think there are a number of issues for all of us that we need to um, address ideally together. I would argue that you are more in tune with the times and with the challenges than many of our peers and colleagues in scientific institutes. However, they are still the people that command the heights of funding and political power. And I think we really, really need to step up our lobbying in our regional, national, and at European level with policy to see how you all intuitively and with lots and lots of energy and ambition link society to policy and help policy to come up with decisions that really make a difference. I think COVID has shown us all how, in some countries, you shouldn't do it. Um, can citizen science do it better? I have no idea. Um, but it would, worth, it would be worthwhile attempting to bring more of a bottom-up approach into the whole, whole realm of public health. And perhaps even consider and ask politicians to consider diverting funding. As you know, in the entire medical field, um, lots of money is spent on dealing with the consequences of bad health instead of doing prevention and um, engaging people in their own um, health management. So there's huge things that can be done, and I think you are leading here the way to do it. And I would really encourage all of us to think a little bit harder how we can bring this to bear in the political realm. So um, how to do that is, of course, through the wonderful, wonderful services of EXA. And as you all know, there are nearly twice as many people here in this room and in this conference than there are members of EXA. So, you may want to consider, if you really enjoyed all of this, whether or not the 50-odd euros wouldn't be spent well to swell the coffers of EXA so that we can put on more of these wonderful conferences. It is there for you and through you, and I think the through you, you certainly have delivered, and I hope that it was really, really fruitful for all of you to connect to find so many like-minded people that have different ideas, but similar ambitions and a similar mindset. And I think there are many, many more of us out there, and we need to engage more and more on these topics. So congratulations to all of you for coming here to Berlin. We think at least more than 20 different countries are represented here, not just from Europe, but also from Africa, South America, and North America. So um, I think the community is growing. Martin Brocklehurst, today he is, um, together with colleagues in Austria, now leads a global um, initiative on, on bringing, bringing together the various associations on the five continents. So there's a lot to strive for, a lot to go for, and it all depends on your engagement. So, first of all, before you consider what to do next scientifically, consider to join EXA. Daughter is here happily receiving the membership certificates. Um, sorry, you won't get out of here before you haven't signed. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we need you, so uh, be warned. Um, very, very much. Um, looking forward to meeting you again at various conferences. 
and this has really demonstrated how vibrant, how energetic this whole community is. It has grown enormously, lots more to do, and I'm really looking forward all of us achieving more together. So thank you very much, and I hand over to Dorte. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Johannes. And um, you have left an honorable um, task to me to say thank you. And first of all, I would like to thank the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin and also Johannes Vogel and Susanne Hecker for having the bravery of uh, offering to host the conference two years ago without knowing how the pandemic would play out and if this conference could even happen at all. So thank you for that. You're a lot of... And a special thank uh, you goes out to you, so to everyone um, who made this conference possible, um, our guests, our participants, the speakers, the presenters, um, the session chairs, and um, as well um, the walk and talkers, and of course also as well the working um, groups that met yesterday and also will meet tomorrow. And um, yeah, you are the reason that we had all a very inspiring conference. And last but not least, I want to thank, um, in the name of EXA and also the EXA headquarters, um, first of all, Silke Voigt Heuke as uh, head of the organizing team of the Museum für Naturkunde. And we have a little something for you. And of course, this job can't be done alone. So there is also um, Emma, Sibella, Julia Rostin, Laura Friedrich, and the organizer of the welcome reception, Moritz Müller, and also many other people. And I would like you to um, come on stage. In our conference um, organizing WhatsApp group are 31 people. So, and please, the EXA team, come on stage. As a present, we try to find something for you that you all can enjoy. This is a sustainable present, so it's made of sustainable regional food. And uh, the basket, I need to have it back. It's very sustainably, sustainably borrowed from a neighbor. Thank you very much. It was an amazing, amazing conference, amazing organization. And now, the end of uh, one conference is the beginning of the planning of the next conference. And I'm very thrilled to hand over to now to longtime advocates of citizen science. And they will talk about the next conference. 
Katrin Vohland and the Natural History Museum Vienna, Daniel Dörler and Florian Heigel. Florian will not be here today, but Daniel is. Um, with the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences. And they will tell us more about what will happen in two years' time when EXA will have its 10th anniversary. So, Dani, I, I heard we have now the work for um, 20. 24. So what's the headline? Yeah, uh, thank you, Katrin, for this really surprising question. I wish <laughs> I could have prepared something. Um, yeah, the motto of next year's conference will be change. I mean, we talked um, this, this whole um, two days now about uh, planetary health, which is also um, something to react to change. Um, we, um, planetary health is an approach to mitigate this change uh, that we as humanity brought upon us uh, ourselves. And um, there's also positive change if we empower vulnerable uh, groups of people, if people can learn how to use science and research to mitigate problems, to change legislative or to adapt to adverse um, yeah, circumstances. Citizen science can be in the heart of this change and um, it itself is a method to change existing structures and frameworks. And this is um, what we want to talk about, um, these changes that are facilitated or started by citizen science um, in all realms and in all, in all practices. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are doing it in Vienna, which is quite an old city, and yeah. quite traditional. So why then Vienna when we talk about change? Yeah, <laughs> Vienna, <laughs> Vienna <laughs> went through a lot of changes in the recent years um, and recent decades. Uh, and um, yeah, it is a city in the heart of Europe. And um, also traditionally, it's a portal to Eastern Europe, to Southeastern Europe. At least we Viennese see as, uh, ourselves or our city as a portal to these areas of Europe. Um, it's also a home to, uh, to a plethora of cultures and also research institutions. Uh, it is also, of course, the home of the Citizen Science Network Austria, which has been uh, very active, which has a very active community and has also been very active on a European level. Um, and and also, of course, of the members of the Citizen Science Network Austria. We have NGOs, we have museums, we have universities, associations, um, public authorities uh, in our network. Um, and also, Vienna hosts the United Nations, and since Monday, it hosts the Citizen Science Global Partnership. Um, and um, another information that might be interesting for you, it has been most, uh, voted the most livable city in the world for several times, and therefore we are very excited to invite you all to Vienna 2024. <laughs> but now, Katrin, you, you've been living in Vienna now for several years. Um, two. Two, yeah. <laughs> um, where in Vienna will this conference take place exactly? Shit, that's a good question. Um, I think we should take your university. So we will make the scientific part in your great rooms. I think you have a big rooms like this for the plenaries. You have some seminar rooms. So we have the scientific part of the conference in your place. Mm -hmm. uh, we will also have some kind of party place. Because we discovered we have to make a big party. Um, it's <laughs> 10 years of EXA, then 2024. Mm -hmm. And we will have also a public event, and that will take place at the museum and around the Museum of Natural History. And perhaps you also can plan some excursions. Definitely, definitely. Sounds interesting, Katrin. Um, but um, what? <laughs> <laughs> But are there already first plans? What can people expect? What? Uh... <laughs> Just a quick question, the surprising question for you, maybe. I already answered everything. So Vienna is um, great. And with change, um, with everything what Dani explored, I think we will have a lot of ideas. And uh, something else, we can announce it, that the Austrian government, or specifically the Ministry of Science and Education, already gave us a um, bit of resources that we can hire a person to support us now setting up the call and all these nice things. And if you know anybody, 
um, they can check our webpage, so the call um, is already online and it was a bit secretly, so it's to organize the, the conference. Yeah, I think we don't have anything more to say so other we than... Say, yeah, yeah. Uh, a warm, warm welcome, welcome to, to Vienna. Vienna. <laughs>